Rook. Hey, Rook. You've heard of the hub, right? If we could make it to the hub, we could really make a name for ourselves. What are you doing here, Drifter? Oh, are you gonna buy us the next round? Oh, uh, no, not, not really. I'm actually looking for men. Men like you, as a matter of fact. What's a guy like you need men like us for? Well, I'm sure you've heard of me before. I'm the legendary bounty hunter and the founder of the outpost New Raleigh, south of Squin. The name's Rook. Doesn't ring a bell. Never heard of you. Really? I'm Rook. I've traversed the mist in the Foglands and survived the Fogmen. I snuck into the cannibal capital, captured and collected the bounty on the cannibal Grand Wizard. I fought a great white gorilla that was trapped in the city of Morn in solo combat and defeated it without a scratch. I've come face to face with the Bugmaster and survived my encounter. I've traveled through the Ashlands and survived. I freed slaves and traveled most of the world. Maybe you recognize me now? Nope. Not even remotely. That all sounds made up. We don't really care. Right. Well, like I said before, I'm looking for men to join me. I have a base where I can offer food, protection, and a community. All are welcome, even the weak. We can equip you with the finest weapons and armor and train you to become stronger. But really, I need men because I'm building an army. And with that army, I'm going to destroy the holy nation. I'm actually pretty busy. Yeah, I'm really booked up right now. Oh. Well, sh Hey guys, this is Eric with Pixar Rookie, and this is the entire Kenshi series of the Chronicles of Rook condensed into a single movie, making it the best way to experience this epic story. This story follows Rook, a wanderer who starts with nothing and tries to build his fortune and fame to make a name for himself. And here's Rook, your basic wanderer. All he has are some rags for pants, a small pipe to defend himself, and a thousand cats. Rook found himself at the hub. He was planning on meeting a friend who arrived a couple of weeks before him, and they were going to work together to make a name for themselves. He took in the sights of the hub briefly and realized that his friend was nowhere to be found. The city was mostly run down. He decided he would need to make some money, and he wanted to do it the honest way. By mining away at a copper deposit, of course. He made his way out of the hub and began toiling away at the mineral deposit. It was slow, grueling work, but copper sold for a good price. Rook was a smart man, though, and he knew that he had to be alert in case bandits were nearby. Only a fool would be looking over their map and not paying attention while mining. Through the valley, a group of starving bandits approached him. Rook knew he had to leave now. He tried to ignore them, but they decided to chase him down. He ran, but they were closing in on him. He decided to drop his copper into a pile and leave it. It was slowing him down too much, and they were going to catch him otherwise. That's much better. Rook was able to outrun these violent thugs now. They followed him as he entered the gate into the hub. This was a big mistake on their part. Rook knew the bar would have bodyguards and he could lure the bandits in there to fight them. He rounded the corner and ran inside. In no time, the ninja guards attacked the bandits. The bar was filled with chaos. Rook tried to keep back though. He's weak and he knows it. One wrong move is all it takes and he could be knocked out cold, and who knows what would happen then. The last bandit was taken out and Rook was barely wounded. It was time to start looting the men and sell their belongings for a few extra cats. He filled his inventory with the rags and poles. Ah, but the hungry bandit leader was fancy. He had shoes for Rook to, uh, borrow. Indefinitely. And a horse chopper for him to equip. Rook was already in a good position with his gear. Now it's time to sell the junk. Well, where's the barman at? Oh, there he is. Knocked out on the ground in a recovery coma. Great. He can't help wake him up, but he can't take that nice leather shirt he has for himself. The good old shirt switcheroo. Hopefully nobody notices. Now Rook just had to wait for him to get up so he could sell some stuff. The barman's back up and recovered, so it's time to earn some cats. He'll sell all this junk. And he'll get some bandages and food. Now he can patch himself up. Back to looting everything. Steal this and that. 
Sell it. Steal some more. Sell that. So much for, uh, the honest way. Ooh, and what's this? Someone's trying to escape. What better way to train his new weapon? The poor bandit tried to crawl away, but Rook kept beating on him until he was knocked back out. Enough of this, though. It was time to get back his copper that he left outside of the hub while fleeing from the bandits. And we're back to mining. Looking over Rook's skills, he's still really lacking in almost every area. Starting off in Kenshi, it's good to labor like this and slowly build up some skills and sell the copper for extra money. As they say, slow and steady wins the race. Slow and steady. Later that morning, Rook mined enough to completely fill his inventory with copper. Time to earn some money. Outside of the bar, Rook saw what was left of the bandits that attacked him on the first day. It was like a little bone dog buffet. Rook spoke to the barman and sold him the copper. And he's back to mining again. After mining the entire night, Rook had another full inventory of copper. Though instead of selling this load, he was going to sneak around and haul it to build up his strength. He decided this would be a good opportunity to visit the city south of the hub, Squin. Sneaking around while being overburdened is a slow process, but it'll make him faster and stronger in the long run. That night, he arrived at Squin and there must have been a rotation at the front gate because it was unguarded. Rook snuck into the city and used this opportunity to break into one of the nearby towers. He picked the lock and crept inside. Echoes of his footsteps reverberated all around him. He held his breath as he listened for other signs of life. It was empty. He found some chests in a safe upstairs and decided to loot them. The first chest creaked and groaned as he lifted the lid. It had some different maps of the continent. This would be really helpful. He transferred some of the copper into the chest and took the maps. He copied the locations onto his map. He checked out the next chest and found some more maps. More importantly, he found a nice backpack for extra inventory space. This allowed him to grab a sleeping bag, a random blueprint, and some other maps. He rummaged through other areas while the townsfolk were in bed and found some new armor to equip. The life of pillaging was starting to become more and more profitable for him. He checked and updated his map as he was leaving Squin. For now, it was time to go back to the hub. Rook was much better equipped at this point with all the new gear he acquired. His morale was really high. He finally crept his way back to the hub and made his way into the bar again. He had lots to sell this time. His stash of cats was growing, but he needed more money. Which means more mining. After mining for another day, he filled his inventory and decided to travel some more to build his stealth and strength skills. Rook was going to travel north of the hub this time and see what he could find. Well, that ended quickly enough. Another group of starving bandits saw him on the path and quickly approached. Rook knew he had to make a run for it. He thought it was best to drop the copper weighing him down and he made his way into the small bar nearby. He ignored their heckles as he ran past them and went straight into the bar. Even with the new equipment, he was really unskilled and could easily be taken down. There are guards posted here too. Good. The bandits flowed through the doorway and he knew they were about to start trouble. The fighting broke out right then. Rook blitzed past the men and ran outside. Most of the other bandits were fighting the ninja guards inside. This let Rook fight a bandit one on one. He was still very inexperienced with melee combat and took a few hits. Fortunately, his new armor helped protect him. He was getting pummeled though. He groaned as more and more bruises dented his armor and weakened him with every hit. One of the ninja guards was outside cleaning up the other bandits and easily took out Rook's opponent. Rook ran back inside to help the guards finish the rest of them off. He was really helpful. The brawl was over and Rook healed himself up. He grabbed his copper, sold all of it to the shopkeeper, then bailed out of there. As he was leaving, he noticed something. The wounded bandits were taken outside of the bar and left for dead. A group of slavers were nearby though, and they were taking him in. Rook couldn't help but to pity those men. Slavers made his blood boil. He considered stepping in, but he decided not to. He was too weak, and the best he could do is probably get enslaved with them. He scowled and he knew their time would come soon enough. At least the bandits won't die today. That night, he decided to test out his new sleeping bag and rest up to heal his wounds. He laid it out and got everything set up. It was time to sleep. The next morning, he ventured back into the hub again and he noticed a small, unoccupied shack. He snuck inside and found a chest and two beds. He picked the lock on the chest and frowned as he opened the lid. He didn't find much in it, but this could work as a small base of operations in the meantime. The next logical step was, of course, to mine even more copper. 
After mining for another full day, Rook returned to the bar in the hub to sell what he collected. He also sold some of his excess medical supplies. This got him exactly to the amount of cats he was trying to earn, 10,000. He heard about the Shinobi Thieves Guild in the corner of the city and he wanted to join them so he could train and become stronger. The cost to join though? 10,000 cats. He approached the thief boss and told him he'd like to join. After a quick conversation, he became a member. This was the first major achievement for Rook to become more powerful and start his real journey in Kenshi. This is where Rook really began his training. Rook anxiously entered the Thieves Guild Tower. He knew there'd be a lot of opportunity in there. He soaked in the view of the ground level and then he did what he thought any shinobi thief would do. Go into stealth and start looting for treasure. It didn't take Rook long at all to realize this place was not a kind one to honest people. You had to break a few rules to survive. He successfully picked the lock on the nearby chest and found a small thieves backpack. This one was better suited for him since he didn't suffer penalties from wearing it. He equipped it and continued exploring the tower. Rook found a training area where he spent time honing his skills. He wanted to become strong and make a name for himself after all. He spent a full day training in the tower and decided it was time to leave and work on building his other skills. He grew bored of the long hours hacking at a training dummy. He was ready for other challenges. That's right, he spent more time mining until he had a full load of copper. He loaded everything into his bag and saw a way station on his map that was quite a ways away. He could sneak there with his load of copper, which would help him improve his stealth, strength, and athletic skills, despite it being an arduous journey. Rook began his travels there. He checked out the way station shop, but it didn't really have too much to offer him. Disappointed, he chose a different path. Rook had so many unexplored locations discovered from all the maps he looted that night in Squin, and he wanted to explore the entire world sometime to see all these places for himself. Looking over his map, he noticed a nearby city called Mongrel. He really didn't know about all the gray areas surrounding the city, but after reviewing the other locations on the map, he figured that'd be a good place to explore. He was traveling down the main road and crossed a Shek patrol. He kept his head down and continued on his way. He didn't want any trouble from the Shek. Rook didn't know much about the Shek other than they were fighters, and they definitely looked like strong warriors to him. That evening, he entered Bane. Rain cascaded down in sheets through the jungle. This almost felt refreshing to him after spending 10 days around the arid mountains where the hub is located. While traveling through Vane, he encountered a hive village. It was late at night and it looked like most of the villagers were sleeping, so Rook took this opportunity to, um, hone his skills. He picked the lock of a chest in a closed shop. Inside, he found skeleton armor repair kits and robotic components. He could tell that these were quite valuable, so he took as much as he could fit in his bag. He left some of his spare copper ore behind and took all the goods from the shop. Change of plans now. Rook could explore any time he wanted to. For now, he was going to detour back to the hub so he could cash in on his new loot. Rook smiled to himself as he made his way. Things were looking up. He was thinking about what he could spend all of his cats home while sneaking out of Vane back into the border zone. He wasn't paying attention and snuck right into a group of hungry bandits that spotted him. Rook panicked and started to run. He was too slow though. He was weighed down by all the stolen loot he acquired. Well, he knew he either had to dump all of his gear and make a run for it, or he'd have to fight them. Rook was still too weak to fight off a group of bandits. He reluctantly dropped his stash and was light enough that he could outrun the bandits. He glanced at his map to remember where he left his treasure and made his way towards the hub. He came in through the rear entrance. The bandits were right behind him. He used the classic, run into the bar and let the guards deal with the bandits technique. It worked like a charm. The guards were outside dealing with the men and Rook decided to help once it was safe. This was a good way to build up his combat skills. The fighting was over before he knew it. Rook sold what little bit of the loot he was able to take with him. He grumbled as he thought of everything he had to abandon to stay safe. He needed to go back to find his remaining stash. He looked at his map and saw where he marked the remaining treasure and began making his way to it. He left out the back entrance again and made his way down the dry hill. It didn't take long until he found his pile of goods. Well, it sure is easy to find when you stack it perfectly into a little treasure tower. He gathered it all up and took off back towards the hub to sell the rest of his goods. It was risky to haul that much at once, and even riskier to leave it behind in the desert, but his gamble paid off this time. As he made his way into the bar, he saw that the slavers were already cleaning up what was left of the bandits and taking them in as slaves. Ooh, he really hated the slavers, taking advantage of the weak like that. He ignored them as he spoke to the barkeep and sold the rest of his loot. Well, he sold as much of it as he could. The shop ran out of money. There was another bar just north of the hub, so he went there to sell the rest of his goods. He passed the slavers again. He heard them conversing as he ran by and he swore he heard mention of his friend and something about a huge bounty on his head. He thought that couldn't be right. There's no way his friend could have gotten himself in that kind of trouble. If any of that were true, Rook would try and find him and help rescue him. 
He couldn't worry about rumors and hearsay right now, though. He got a tip from the barkeep that a group of dust bandits set up camp just south of the hub. He decided that he was going to check it out. He had to train his fighting skills if he ever wanted to get anywhere. There was a group of bandits camping nearby. As he approached, one of them noticed Rook and yelled at him. He told him not to run, so Rook decided to hear him out. Well, he threatened Rook if he wouldn't give up his money, and there was no way Rook was going to just hand over what he worked so hard to earn. From stealing. He laughed in the bandit's face and was immediately attacked. Rook took off running because this happened to make more of the bandits upset and they began chasing him too. As he got closer to the hub, the shinobi thieves boss actually came out to Rook's aid. Only two of the bandits followed Rook that far so he could easily fend them off with the help of his allies. Rook thought of how clever he was to join them and smiled to himself as he joined in the fighting. The first bandit fell without much of a fight. The men approached the other bandit and took him out immediately. Rook realized that he could fight these men off if he managed to isolate them into groups of one or two away from their camp. He approached them again and taunted the men. They got up and took chase after Rook. By the time he got back to the entrance of the hub, only three bandits were on his tail, but an entire army of shinobi thieves were there to back Rook up. The first two men were cut down like butter. The group surrounded the last bandit and took him out without any issues. Now Rook realized that while this was a good way to take out the bandits, he really needed to work on becoming a stronger fighter himself. Relying on the shinobi thieves to fight his fights wasn't helping him get much stronger. But Rook had an idea. He stripped down one of the bandits and began tending to all of his wounds. Once he finished healing the bandit, he picked him up and went to an isolated area north of the hub. On his way there, they passed a group of starving bandits that hadn't noticed them. Rook set his new, uh, friend down and used the darkness as his cover while practicing sneaking up on men and taking them out silently. He crept up behind the men and successfully knocked one out. His first victim was a success. Well, that was until the rest of the men turned and saw what Rook did and began to chase him down. They were nearby the small bar outside of the hub. Rook ran there and let the men come to him. With the help of the guards at the bar, they easily fought the men off. Rook was able to get some free shots in on the wounded men while the guards did all the hard work. He healed up after the fight and went back out to get his captive, uh, I mean his friend. Now, where'd he go? Uh, okay then. Rook found a new friend in the group of unconscious bandits and picked up one of the men. He took him outside of the bar and stripped him of his clothes and weapon. Rook bandaged him up and set him in a bed to rest. Before his new friend could wake up and run away, Rook scooped him back up and went a little ways down from the bar. He laid the bandit down and waited for him to wake up. As the bandit began to come to, Rook immediately started punching him before he was even up on his feet. It was training time, baby. Rook's new friend was going to spar with him, whether he liked it or not. After fighting for a while, Rook knocked him out cold. Well, he wasn't just going to stand there and wait for him to wake up, so he dug through his gear and laid out his sleeping bag. He set it up and laid his training buddy down to rest up. He immediately got up to his feet and they began fighting again. The fighting continued. Rook was going to focus on martial arts combat first and then focus on other areas after he trained more. Anytime he knocked his friend out, he would patch him up and let him recover in his sleeping bag. After training martial arts for a few days straight, it was time for them to use blunt weapons and start over again. He gave one to each of them and they continued fighting. The bandit knew if he tried to run, Rook would just catch up to him and beat him down, but he had to at least try. He attempted to knock Rook out and make an escape. Unfortunately for him, that never happened. Hot Dog sparred with this bandit for six days straight until he decided he would let him go. He bought Assassin's Rags from the Shinobi Thieves to help his stealth skills, and Rook was already a much more formidable fighter. His first order of business, finishing off what he started with the Dust Bandits camp. Rook knew he still wasn't strong enough to take them all on at once, so he got the attention of a few men and lured them away from the camp. He managed to isolate one of them and began to attack. He was faster with his katana and was able to completely hold his own one-on-one. -on -one. After a few more swift blows, the bandit fell. He made his way to the others. He took down another one with ease and approached the third bandit. He didn't stand much of a chance either. Rook went to a small shack in the hub to rest up after suffering a lot of wounds. He healed up and continued to pick off the dust bandits one by one until they were completely wiped out. He was becoming more confident and skilled with the sword. He encountered an entire group of starving bandits again. This time, he fought instead of running. Rook never fought this many men at once before. 
They were weak, but he had to be careful not to make any mistakes and get blindsided. He carefully parried incoming attacks and tried to whittle the bandits down one by one. One final swing, and the last bandit fell. Rook was slightly injured after the fighting was over, but he still stood while the rest were laying in the dirt. Though he felt stronger, he still had a long ways to go and he wanted to get even more powerful. He went back to the waystation near Squin and he learned that there was a tribe of Shek warriors called the Band of Bones nearby. These fighters were much stronger than regular bandits. Rook decided he would try to lure them away from their camp one by one and take them out. For the most part, this worked quite well. Rook was able to slowly beat them down. These guys were tough though and Rook had his fair share of defeats. When that happened, he would slowly get up and patch up his wounds. After that, he'd go back to the waystation and pay a small fee to rest up in a bed until his wounds were healed. He eventually tricked the camp's leader to chase him to the waystation where he had help taking her down. She was overwhelmed and no match for this group of men. She was beaten down in no time. Her name was Tora the Fearless and Rook saw that she had a bounty on her head. Rook patched her up while she was unconscious and scooped her up over his shoulder. He wanted to cash in on his new prize. She was wanted by the shack, and Squin was a short trip northeast from the way station. He ran all the way through the night until he saw the gates of Squin nearby as the sun was rising for a new dawn. When he approached the gates, the guards stopped him. They were just checking for smuggled goods. Rook didn't have anything incriminating on him. At the moment, at least. They cleared him and he continued down the streets of Squin until he found the police station at the other side of the city. He showed his captive to the guard at the front desk and turned her in. Tora the Fearless was carried up the stairs to the second floor where she was bound and held captive. Rook stood there, 10,000 cats richer. He stood there counting his cats and thought he deserved to celebrate for collecting his first bounty. He went to the local weapon shop and spoke to the shopkeeper. Rook wanted to wield something bigger that hit harder. He bought a plank, which was considered a heavy weapon. He could see why. That's quite big. Impressive. It was 28 days into Rook's journey and he was starting to become a formidable fighter. It was time for him to start exploring the land and seeing what adventures he could find. Rook left Squin and headed south. He didn't really have any particular destination in mind, but he wanted to see what was out there. While strolling down the path, a group of Shek Berserkers noticed Rook and apparently they weren't too friendly. Adrenaline pumping, Rook's feet pounded the dirt as they chased after him. Rook ran towards what looked like the ruins of an abandoned town. He was hoping they'd lose his trail through the collapsed buildings, especially because he was slightly faster than their group. By the time Rook made it to the outskirts of the abandoned town, it looked like they gave up on chasing him. He breathed a sigh of relief after getting away unscathed, and he started sneaking to make sure they don't see him again. He wanted to check this place out before moving on, so he snuck into one of the collapsed towers. There wasn't really much of anything here, so he looked over his map and took in all the uncharted territory. He looked further south and thought this mountainous crater area looked interesting. Rook figured, what the heck, let's check this place out and see what happens. He took off and made his way there. Well, it turns out that most of the crater was just abandoned laboratories and bad weather. This was pretty disappointing. But no matter. Rook wanted to find something more exciting to explore and he saw a nearby city on his map called Clown Study. He snuck out of the wet ruins of the ancient lab and carefully started towards the new city. On his way out of this wet crater, he found some vicious creatures that were quite aggressive towards him. They were called beak things, and they were nasty beasts. Rook knew he had to be careful when fighting it. One wrong move and he could become a beak thing's dinner. He kept his composure, and one final hit killed it. Fortunately, it was just one and not a herd. He looked at his map and continued towards Clown Steady. A few hours later, he saw the city's walls down in a valley surrounded by a river. It was an impressive sight to see, at least from the outside. He was anxious to see it from the inside but a guard stopped him at the gate. And he started questioning Rook. Before letting a new face pass through the city, he had to inspect Rook's gear. Rook hadn't found any empty shops to loot recently, so he was in the clear. So this guy has the audacity to plant some drugs on Rook and accuse him of smuggling them into the city? What? What the f Rook was caught off guard by this, but he should have known that most people don't play by the rules in this land. The guard threatened to arrest him unless he paid a uh, small donation of 2,000 cats. Rook wasn't prepared for this, and he did have plenty of money to spare. It pained him to simply hand over 2,000 of his hard-earned cats, but he needed to get out of the situation in one piece, so he paid the uh, fine. 
This was not a great first impression of Clown Steady, but at least he was able to check it out now. And there was absolutely nothing of interest for him there. He left disappointed, but went south towards the city of Drifter's Last. He arrived before the sun rose. He stopped in front of the gate guard for a moment and realized that this guy wasn't going to try any funny business, so he entered the city. This one was also a bust. He followed the trailing river west until he found the ruins of a lost library. There wasn't too much of interest amongst the dust except a map with the location of a lost armory which was said to have some nice loot in it. He looked at his map and realized that it was right off the northern coast. Now this was the kind of adventure Rook was looking for. He took off on what felt like his first real quest. Adrenaline coursed through his veins in anticipation of what lay in store for him. Previously, Rook was planning to visit Mongrel and it was in his path towards the outpost. He found out that all the markings on his map surrounding Mongrel were the Fog Islands and the valleys were covered in this fog. This seemed... ominous. But no matter, Rook didn't care, in fact he was proud of his progress with his combat skills. He welcomed any challenge that awaited him. And just like that, out of nowhere he was surrounded by little fogmen with pipes trying to ambush him. There were lots of these guys here. A swing of his plank could take them down in one hit. They were fragile little things. He tried to be careful and block incoming attacks from all angles and take them out. There were too many of them. He started to panic as he realized he was outnumbered. He was defending himself from most of their swings, but they kept slipping through and landing a few shots on him. It was far too much for Rook and more of them kept appearing. He was wounded and tired from the fighting and one final hit knocked him out. They tied his limp body to a pole hidden in the shrubbery and they seemed to lose interest in him, at least for now. Rook regained consciousness and knew he had to get out of there. He cautiously picked the lock that had his hands and legs bound, staying alert in case anyone checked on him. He was free and decided to make a break for it right away and saw that Mongrel wasn't too far off. He knew that he could make it there if he sprinted. Well, it turned out there were a lot more of the Fogmen than he realized and they were chasing Rook down. These little turds were fast. He turned to fight off the few that caught up to him. He managed to get one swing in, but got the wind knocked out of him in one hit. He was pretty beat up from the first fight. They hauled him right back to where they left him the first time and tied Rook back up. Rook got a really bad feeling all of a sudden. The Fogman didn't walk away this time. In fact, they started gnawing on his left leg. He screamed as the Fogman began eating him alive. These little monsters were going to eat Rook. He had to regain his composure and think fast because you can't get away if you have no legs. He frantically started picking the lock. More Fogmen were coming. He broke free and he knew he was in trouble. He took off and couldn't stop to try and fend them off this time. These guys were persistent. They trailed right behind Rook as he continued running to Mongrel. By the time he was close to the city, only one of them were still chasing him. They were weak when they're alone. It was when there were hordes of them that Rook needed to be worried. He effortlessly took this one out and began to patch himself up. Rook was lucky to make it out of that bind in one piece. He needed to rest up in the city. He ran past the gate guards and took a look at the place. He found the closest bar and rented a bed to heal up in. He slept peacefully and felt as good as new once he woke up. He checked out the local shop to see if they had any good gear for sale. Rook found a sweet hat and goggles that he just couldn't pass up. Sneaking around and stealing was a tricky business. This would help cover up his identity if he was ever to be seen. After this, Rook traveled north through the night until he came into the Cannibal Plains. He was immediately greeted by a large group of scrawny cannibals that attacked him immediately. Just like the Fog Islands, there were large groups of things that just wanted to eat Rook. They were small and weak though. He thought that he might be able to hone his skills with the heavy plank on these guys. The fighting lasted over an hour and even though he took most of them out, he knew another blow to his gut would take him down and there were just too many of them still standing. He decided it was best to run away from these guys and lay low while he recovered. Not looking at his blind spot, he ran straight into a group of much bigger cannibals that intercepted him and easily knocked him out. They tied him up to a stake and left him there, for now. This felt way too familiar for Rook, and he was pretty sure he knew what was coming next unless he got out of there right away. He easily freed his hands and feet, he was getting pretty good at that by now, and he began to sneak away while nobody was looking. He bandaged himself up and saw that there was a nearby village on his map, this could be a good place to seek refuge. He was already injured, so he was extra cautious as he snuck towards the village. Rook was at the outskirts of the settlement and he realized this wasn't what he was expecting. It was a cannibal village and they had lots of little homes for Rook to stay at for dinner. He didn't think it would be a good idea to make his presence known, so he looked over his map and found the abandoned armory. This was his true destination after all. 
Rook's luck seemed to be running out the past few days because two bigger beak things found him sneaking about and beat him down immediately. One of them took a bite down on Rook, and then they turned and walked away while he played dead. Maybe he still had a little luck left, it seemed. He slowly got back up and tended to his wounds. That's when he spotted another beak thing sprinting straight towards him. He closed his eyes and awaited his fate. Well, it just knocked him out of its way and ran by. Rook had to get out of there. He saw a city nearby called Dead Cat and figured there might be a bed he could rest at so he's not so vulnerable. He carefully snuck past the other beak things and got close to the city. He saw human flesh cooking in the fire pit and he knew this too was hostile territory. Nobody was nearby though, and he had to take his chances to rest up in the bedroll by the fire. There were lots of cannibals here. But all of a sudden, they got up and surrounded a fighter that entered the city. There was a skeleton tech hunter named Jin Sei who was completely swarmed by an army of cannibals. These men were afraid to engage him though. Jin Sei wielded a fragmented axe, which was one of the heaviest weapons out there, and he was swinging it with ease. These men were dropping like flies. Standing in the pool of blood from the corpses of his fallen enemies, Jin Sei was still fighting with vigor. In the group of surrounding men, there was a man, a cannibal grand wizard, and he had a very hefty bounty on his head from multiple factions. He made the mistake of engaging the cannibal slayer, and after one hit, he stumbled and fell to the ground. Now this is the kind of warrior that Rook aspired to become, fearless and deadly, but he was still far away from that dream. Because of that, Rook had to settle as being an opportunist, and right now, there was a 40,000 cats opportunity crawling at his feet. He just needed to sneak in, knock the Grand Wizard out, and bring him back to claim his bounty. Rook managed to sneak up to him without anyone noticing. Now was his chance. Well, he managed to screw it up and the Grand Wizard cried out for help. Panic set in again as Rook realized his mistake could be costly. A large group of men diverted from Jinsei and ganged up on Rook. He had to take these men out if he wanted another shot at getting the Grand Wizard. More men kept closing in on Rook and they weren't like the scrawny cannibals that fell in one hit. He had to escape for the time being or he'd definitely be captured. For what felt like the seventh time. In the span of like two days. He ran out of the city and up a hill. There was chaos and fighting everywhere. This worked to his advantage as his opponents spread out to deal with the skirmishes happening all around them. This gave Rook an opportunity to recover and sneak back into the city. Some men chased him back into the city, but it looked like Jinsei dealt with all the rest of the cannibals. It was a massacre, and though he was pretty banged up, he still stood. Rook grabbed who he thought was the Grand Wizard and ran towards the skeleton, hoping he would help him out. Well, it worked. Sort of. Rook got knocked out and put on another stake, and then the men were foolish enough to attack the skeleton. While Rook stood there, bound and knocked out, Jinsei fought the remaining cannibals that were still standing. After a few more powerful blows, all of the men fell, and Jinsei limped away from the pile of corpses he just created. Rook finally regained consciousness, and there was just one cannibal by him. Rook thought he could take him out, so he freed himself and attacked. Another one got up, but didn't last long. This caused the other cannibal to flee. Rook chased after him. No, 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 no. <laughs> he got one final swing in on him, and he toppled over. He had to bandage himself up, again, and then try to find out where the Grand Wizard went. He grabbed another cannibal that he thought looked like the Grand Wizard and snuck through the base. It was a lot easier when almost all the cannibals were dead. He found a couple of chests in a hut and checked to see if there was anything of value inside. He found a masterwork skeleton arm that was quite valuable. He could sell that for a lot of cats. He also found a nice leather shirt that would provide slightly better cover while not hindering his stealth ability, and a chained hood that he tried on. Inspecting his hostage, Rook realized that he grabbed a cannibal chief, which was of no value to him. Rook tossed his limp body to the ground. Rook was in luck. He found the Grand Wizard patrolling the outskirts of the city. This was his chance. With darkness as his cover, he snuck up to the Grand Wizard and tried to knock him out again. He failed his attempt, but the Grand Wizard was so distracted that he didn't notice. Rook tried one last time and knocked him straight out. He stripped him of his armor and weapon and hoisted him over his shoulder. It was a success. Pleased with his victory, Rook scrutinized his map again. He realized that he was in the middle of the cannibal capital, in the cannibal plains, and somehow needed to make it all the way down to the city of Blister Hill where he could turn his bounty into the Holy Nation. This was going to be a long run southeast, but the payoff would definitely be worth it. Rook continued using the darkness as his cover and started to sneak out of this chaos. Rook was fortunate enough to escape the cannibal plains without being detected and traveled the entire day. He made his way through the mountain trails until he stumbled upon a Holy Nation establishment. Rebirth. It looked like a massive quarry where they were constructing a giant monument. Rook was passing through and he realized how they were able to perform such tedious work. Slaves. He was certain that this is where all the slavers were taking the men he saw around the hub earlier. The Holy Nation men did no work. They only watched the slaves and beat any men that defied orders. It made him sick to his stomach. As he passed the massive statue, he couldn't help but to feel impressed by their work. There wasn't anything he could do right now other than keep his head down and claim his bounty. He was out of the truly dangerous territory and almost to Blister Hill. 
A few hours later, he saw the city in the distance. Rook entered the front gate and took it all in. This was a massive fortress indeed. It was very heavily guarded. He saw where the police station was and he began making his way there. Rook realized that it was only him and Jin Sei that left the cannibal capital in one piece and he knew that being a skeleton, he would avoid the holy nation. Only Rook could share the story of how he ended up capturing the cannibal grand wizard. Rook found an inquisitor by the entrance of the police station and spoke to him. He explained to the men in the room that he snuck into the cannibal capital, took out the grand wizard, and fought off his guards while escaping a one piece. All by himself. Rook thought his version of what happened sounded a lot better. People might even tell stories of this one day. The Inquisitor seemed unimpressed and took the captive off Rook's hands. At least the other men looked up to Rook while he explained his heroic quest. He paid him 40,000 cats and Rook couldn't have felt better. This is when one of the Holy Nation paladins confirmed a story with Rook. The paladin told him that he should have been at Blister Hill a while back when a man escaped and had a bounty on his head that was almost as much as the Grand Wizard's. 36,000 cats for a man by the name of Hot Dog. This was Rook's friend that he planned to meet up with at the hub, but he never showed. He tried to hide his composure under his mask and asked what happened to Hot Dog. The paladin explained that he was found outside of the hub and was beaten to death and left to rot. Rook was silent as he tried to mask his grief. He looked at his map and decided he needed to return to the hub for now. These men mutilated and murdered his friend. He had a newfound hatred for the Holy Nation now. Hot Dog was probably trying to make it back to the hub so Rook could help patch him up when he arrived. He was just too late though. There wasn't anything he could do about it right now. He just had to continue biding his time and becoming stronger. It was a long night of traveling, but the next morning he arrived back at the hub. He passed the entrance and stopped for a moment while he took it all in. There was a bittersweet feeling to being back at the hub. This is where it all began and he considered it his home for the time being. Rook went into the small shack that he considered his temporary HQ and unloaded his loot from his travels. After that, he laid in the bed and rested up. He had a mixture of thoughts about the hordes of cats he just acquired and Hot Dog's unjust death, but he couldn't let these things distract him for now. After all, he still had to explore that stupid abandoned armory that he never made it to off the northern coast. Rook woke up from his sleep feeling rejuvenated and ready to continue on his quest to the abandoned armory. He whipped out his map and looked north of the hub. He hadn't been to World's End yet and it was on his way towards the northern coast. Rook has already detoured enough from finding out what's at the outpost on his map, but since World's End was on the way, he figured he'd make a quick stop there before heading to his true destination. He set course and was on his way. While traveling down the path, a high paladin and his group of soldiers from the Holy Nation stopped Rook and began speaking with him. Nervous, Rook played along since he was completely outnumbered. The paladin was rambling off about some Holy Nation mumbo jumbo. Blessings upon you brother. Welcome to the hollow domain, homeland and asylum to all humans pure of blood. Rook thought carefully for a moment and responded in the most Holy Nation way he could think of. Blessings from the Lord of Light, brother. The paladin seemed very pleased by this response. In fact, he gave him a rations pack and sent him on his way. Rook got out of there quickly before they could smell the BS on him. It didn't take long until Rook arrived at World's End. He stopped at the entrance for a moment and took it in. Maybe he could find some nice loot here. He found a weapon shop and decided to take a look around. There it was. He's heard of the falling sun, but he's never actually seen one until now. He had to have it. This thing was expensive, but after cashing in on the Cannibal Grand Wizard, he could most certainly afford it. He traded in his plank and equipped his unwieldy new beast of a weapon. Nothing boosted Rook's morale like finding a powerful new weapon like this. It looks like detouring here was a good idea after all. There wasn't much else at World's End that interested him, so he peered over his map again and charted his way north towards the outpost. He journeyed through the valley until he was back at the Cannibal Plains. He chatted with a traveling nomad for a few minutes before he decided to check out a nearby village on his map. He was in dangerous territory now, so Rook had to tread carefully. This definitely wasn't a cannibal village. He approached the gate and the spotlights blinded him. He heard a voice calling out from the wall telling him to freeze. He was summoned to speak with this person in private. She was threatening him. Rook didn't like being in these kind of situations, so he explained he was just passing through. She didn't seem to care. He tried taking it a step further and offered some of his supplies. She still wasn't buying it. She demanded that he swears on the phoenix that he's telling the truth. Sure, that's easy enough. Fortunately, that seemed to calm her down some. She wasn't very forthcoming with additional information though. Rook wasn't sure how he felt about these floatsome ninjas yet, but he didn't want to stick around much longer either. Okay, enough with the detours. It was time to get to that darn abandoned armory. Ooh, look at this. Rook discovered a building. Let's check it out. Rook saw the building off in the distance and decided to sneak towards it in case they were unfriendly. It was another floatsome ninja outpost. 
They didn't attack him before, so he figured he would try his luck here too. He saw a person named Manny taking a nap, so he decided to wake him up and find out what they were up to out here. So our boy Manny was a lot nicer than the other person he spoke with. He explained that they were stationed here to keep the cannibals at bay so they wouldn't spread. He was stationed there for one reason, to hunt cannibals. He warned Rook of the dangers in the valley, like he needed to be warned of that. Their conversation ended and he saw Rook off. It was time to finally head to, ooh, look, another unexplored building. Sneaking there, he realized it was just another Floatsome Ninja Scout post. There wasn't anything here, so Rook finally decided it was time to head north. It took him all evening to finally arrive at the coast. He took a moment to soak in the view of the ocean at dusk. It really was a beautiful sight. Rook continued on his way until he entered the Leviathan Coast. He very quickly realized why it had this name. This was his first time seeing these Leviathans, massive creatures that were fortunately peaceful towards humans. It really was a grand thing to see groups of them grazing the coastland and he could see the outpost just beyond them. After many, many detours, he finally arrived. He anxiously opened the door and stepped inside. Rook was immediately greeted by robotic security spiders that attacked on sight. They inflicted massive damage to Rook before he even had time to react. Already heavily wounded, he had to retreat before they killed him. All of a sudden, Rook had an idea. The mindless spiders chased him out towards one of the Leviathans, but he had an unexpected visitor, a tech hunter that engaged the threat. Rook was no match for them, so he stayed back. Uh, apparently the tech hunter wasn't either. He was taken down in no time. The robots went towards the Leviathan next. This was exactly what Rook was hoping for. In the midst of the fighting, Rook was bandaging himself up. Another group of tech hunters showed up to rescue their fallen man. One of the security spiders broke from the Leviathan and went to intercept the men. Rook let the men do all the work and he decided he would help once it was almost destroyed. He followed the charge with the rest of the tech hunters towards the two remaining enemies. The Leviathan crushed the second one. It shoved Rook and the other men out of its way as it engaged the final spider. They were no match for this hulking beast. Thanks to the tech hunters and the leviathan, the coast was clear. Rook was looking at all the chests with potential loot until he saw two more of these things. This place was very heavily guarded. The leviathan didn't seem to like these things and it took them down with relative ease. Rook would let it take care of the rest of them. There were two of them right outside now and the spiders mindlessly engaged regardless. Rook went to help fight off the final one while it was distracted, but again, it was taken out before he even got a swing in. The coast should be clear now for Rook to explore his long-awaited, not-so-abandoned armory. He started picking the locks of the chests. The first one had a desert saber in it. Not the best weapon, but it looked quite exotic. He took it just in case. He found a rusted chain shirt, but it was actually very well made and he greedily packed it into his backpack. He checked upstairs and even though there wasn't much to look through, he did see a weapon cabinet. He went over to inspect it. Inside, there was a masterwork crossbow called a spring bat. Rook wasn't a big fan of using ranged weapons, but at the very least he could sell it for a hefty amount of cats. He loaded it into his inventory knowing he couldn't carry too much more. He didn't find anything too amazing here, but he did make it out with some extra gear that could come in handy down the road. Rook was very pleased with himself, but as he left the armory, he saw one of his tech hunter buddies getting attacked by two beak things. It was time to finally test out his falling sun. He joined in the fighting and tried to catch it off guard. The fighting continued a while longer until the Garu was critically wounded. Rook was doing a good job fending off the vicious beak thing, but the tech hunter limped his way over to Rook to back him up. Together, they brought the beast down. The other one was taken out too. Even though it was more unruly, Rook was getting used to the falling sun. Rook saw this as a good opportunity to lay down his camp bed and rest up for the journey home. He set everything up, closed his eyes, and fell into a deep sleep. He awoke that evening and began the long trip back to the hub. Fortunately, he had no issues and after a full day of travel, he arrived back to his sanctuary. He entered his small shack and began unloading his treasures into his chest. Rook went to the shop and sold the rest of the materials he salvaged along the way too. He really didn't have any other need for them. Now at this point, he accomplished his goal that he set out to do many days prior and he didn't know where to go from here. He peered over his map again and realized there were still so many unexplored cities on his map. Rook looked further east and saw a city called Morn. This would be his next destination. He began making his way there. As he left the hub, he was assaulted by a group of starving bandits. It was time to test his fighting skills again. Overall, things went pretty well in that fight. At least for Rook. He resumed his travels to his new destination. Half a day later, Rook saw a massive rusted structure off in the distance. It looked like a giant hollowed out cylinder of some old ancient technology. 
As he got closer, he realized that the city of Morn was built inside of these ruins. No guards were posted at the gate, so he went in and entered the bar. He spoke with the barman and found out that Morn used to be a mining town, but now it looked like a rundown place where people come to lay low. Then he tells Rook to stay away from the old HQ and leave the gates locked. The barman called it a pest control measure. Rook was intrigued, to say the least. He felt reasonably confident with his combat skills now, and he offered his assistance to remove this pest that was locked away. The barman was insistent in letting it be. It was apparently too much of a threat for the town. It sounded really dangerous to snoop around and investigate. So Rook immediately snuck towards the HQ's locked gate and proceeded to pick it open. The gate slowly creeped open. Clearly it's been closed off for a long time. Rook crept into the first floor and looked around. There wasn't much of anything there except for trash. Why would they have sealed this off? That's when he heard a deep growling noise from the second floor. Okay, so there was a giant great white gorilla up there. That makes more sense. Rook snuck upstairs and looked at it. It really wasn't moving much. Rook got closer to it and it looked at him. It definitely looked hostile, but it also looked like some debris from the room collapsed on top of it. The gorilla was trapped there. Rook used this opportunity to attack it. He got a swing on it before the gorilla turned on him. Rook dodged its attack and realized that the poor creature was pinned down there. He could slowly wear it down and avoid its attacks. He'd have to be careful and patient, but he could definitely take this thing out without getting harmed. Surely the people of Morn didn't realize it was stuck like this. If he killed this giant beast, they would think it was in straight combat. That would definitely be a story to share. This went on until late into the night. The gorilla was severely wounded and very tired. At this point, Rook was able to land multiple blows before it would even react. A couple more hits and it was finished. Rook collected the great white gorilla skin off of it. It would sell for a good price. He wanted to show off his kill to the townsfolk. These are the kind of things you do to make a name for yourself after all. It was big, but Rook was able to hoist its corpse over his shoulder and take it with him. He hauled it outside of the abandoned HQ where people could see it. Rook smiled as he heard people gasp at what they saw. He took it into the bar and spoke with the barman again. Rook shared his story of how he fought the gorilla in a glorious battle, but his fighting skills greatly outmatched the gorilla. Everyone cheered as the barman gave drinks on the house for Rook's achievement. He took its corpse outside and laid it on the ground. Hey, what happened? He looked it over and checked out the rest of Morn. There wasn't really anything else here, so he left towards the nearby city, Cantoon. He stopped at the front gate and saw there was another. This place had good defenses. He stopped at the second gate and greeted the guards. He looked over the city and briefly checked it out. There wasn't anything of interest for Rook here, so he looked at his map for the next closest city, Brink. He set this as his next destination and took off. See, this is what Rook was looking for, traveling the world and finding adventures. He entered a region called Venge. This era is a bit more bleak than what he was used to seeing. All of a sudden, he sees a massive beam of light fall from the sky. He realized that was directly where he needed to go to. Well, Rook enjoyed a little bit of danger in his travels. He took a deep breath and pressed forward. Multiple more beams of light were falling from the sky around Rook. Maybe this wasn't a good idea after all. Regardless of it being a good idea or not, he was already in the thick of it and he had to be careful not to get hit by one of these death rays. Fortunately, he made it through unscathed, and he continued traveling until that night where he could see Brink off in the distance. It was quite a beautiful view with the night sky above him and the city on the horizon. He made his way into the city and looked it over briefly. To Rook, it was just another boring city with no adventures to be found. He reviewed his map again and saw the city of Black Scratch nearby. That was his next destination. The city was built around a massive old-looking structure. He was curious to see what was there. Rook came to the entrance and stopped to take it all in. He found a travel shop and decided to take a browse at their inventory. He found a high quality dust coat that offered good protection and it didn't hinder his stealthiness. Rook really wanted this, so he purchased the coat and put it on. Good protection and he thought it looked pretty cool too. It was a good purchase. Other than the dust coat, he didn't find anything else of interest here. He saw there was a small village nearby. He wanted to check it out while traveling north to the other cities on his map. He made his way out of the city towards his next destination. Rook arrived at the village and ran through the gate. He looked it over and saw that it was a small, quaint village. 
it didn't really have anything to offer for Rook. He started to plot his way to the next city, but there was a place that caught his eye. It was a market and it wasn't too far away. He wanted to take a look and see what was there, so he left the village. He could see the market in the distance surrounded by arid land. He went through the gate and realized that this wasn't an ordinary marketplace. It was a slave market. If you didn't already realize this, Rook did not like slavers at all. Knowing that slavers captured his friend Hot Dog and caused his ultimate demise through the Holy Nation only fueled his disdain for them even more. The slaver boss bragged about how Rook could purchase one to do all of his hard labor and he would never have to break a sweat. Rook kept his composure but was very annoyed. In fact, it made him change his plans and do something rash. The rain was pouring over Rook as the slaver boss droned on and on about his slaves and his fair prices. Rook stopped listening to him and he noticed a slave shop further down the market. He decided to go in and investigate it. There was one guard and another slaver boss. They were busy talking amongst themselves and not paying much attention to him at all. They were so focused on their own business that they didn't notice Rook sneak upstairs to check out their inventory. Nobody was up there with him except a few slaves that were bound and caged. Rook was disgusted at their physical state. They were hardly fed from the looks of it. This is when Rook realized that his time traveling the world on his own was over. He became a very competent fighter and he could help these slaves escape. Sure, he could purchase them, but he hated the slavers about as much as he hated the Holy Nation. He didn't want to give any cats to their cause. He realized that he could help these men and maybe even train them to become strong fighters like himself. For now, he focused on laying low and picking the lock of this cage. He managed to pick the lock. The shackles that bound his legs were easy enough to unlock as well. The first slave was freed. He waited patiently as Rook unlocked another cage and unbound the shackles of another newly freed slave. He freed one last slave until he heard the men downstairs rustling around. He ran out of time and had to make an escape with the men he managed to free. He frantically looked over his map and the next nearest city was called Heng. He wasn't familiar with this part of the land, but if he could get his newly freed slaves out of the market, they could figure out a better plan then. Rook began to sneak out and the men followed him. He realized that he had to just run and have them catch up to him. He was acting on his emotions and was being rash. This plan wasn't well thought out and he was worried it would go terribly wrong. Some luck was on his side though. There was fighting out by the entrance of the market and it was causing a good diversion for Rook. Two of the three slaves were able to make it outside of the walls. The slaver boss was hot on their trail and in just a couple of swings, he took one of them down. He then began patching his merchandise up to place back into a cage. Rook wouldn't let this stand. He engaged on the slaver and in confusion, the slaver rushed towards Rook to accept his challenge. As Rook sprinted towards his new enemy, the Hiver slave fled. He saw that Rook was attacking the slaver and he decided he would join his new savior's group and fight with him. Rook's falling son was a massive weapon. It was still a little unwieldy and he took a hit from the slaver. Rook landed his second blow and it was enough to take his opponent out. The man crumbled to the ground as Rook immediately began to loot his body. His new friend had no equipment and needed a weapon and some clothes. He looted the medicine and cats from him. He ran to the aid of the second freed slave that was knocked unconscious. All the while, the new Hiver member named Beanhop took the slaver's clothes and put them on. Rook gave him a katana and his assassin's rags. This was a better look on him. He needed the katana too because more slavers saw them in the distance and attacked. The two men were locked in combat and outnumbered 4-2 to two, with two additional bowmen in the back. Beanhop had virtually no combat experience and was taking heavy damage while Rook tried to defend both him and the unconscious slave over his shoulder. Rook did what he could do to protect the two slaves. One of his swings hit hard enough to make a slaver collapse, but Beanhop was still taking too many hits. Rook yelled out and told him to head north and he would catch up with him later. Beanhop reluctantly fled the scene and left Rook to fight off the rest of the men. He was outnumbered, but his focus was fierce. He was no longer fighting for renown or cats. He was now fighting for his life and the lives of two more men. While blocking most of the incoming attacks, he was still taking some hits. He calculated his counterattacks well though and took one of the men out. Two fighters were much more manageable than three. He dropped the other man and with one final swing, the third also fell. Rook was hurting and more men were coming after him. He thought it was best to run and as he looked forward, he saw that Beanhop came back to help Rook out. He wasn't much of a fighter, but he could help Rook by distracting the men. It was too much for Beanhop though, and he had to fall back again while Rook fended the men off. They made it far enough from the market that no more backup should come after them. While Rook tried to dodge incoming arrows from the bowmen while fighting another man, he saw that Beanhop circled back again to help. He was so caught up in the fighting that he almost didn't notice that one of Beanhop's arms were missing. It was completely severed during the chaos of the fighting. This didn't stop him from helping Rook KO the slaver though. They came up to the bowmen and engaged. Rook was beating on the one man while poor Beanhop was getting hit by a barrage of bolts. All the while, a wild bone dog smelled the blood from the fighting and attacked Rook too. Beanhop lost too much blood and was in a daze. He suddenly collapsed and was completely out. Rook was fighting off the two remaining men and the bone dog. 
He was still taking a lot of damage, but one well-placed swing hurt one of the men enough to cause him to flee and killed the bone dog. One more attack and the last man fell. Rook had to tend to bean hop immediately or he would die of blood loss. The final slaver was foolish enough to get back up and limp towards Rook and try and stop him. Rook turned around and took him down once again with ease. He continued patching up bean hop and he came back too. As Rook was tending to his own wounds, another slaver came out of nowhere and began patching his men up. Obviously Rook couldn't let him do this and attack the man. It took some back and forth with exchange blows, but eventually Rook bested him and he was knocked out. The fighting was finally over, at least for now. Rook placed the other freed slave named Horus on the ground and began bandaging him up too. One of the slaver guards woke up and Rook made sure he would stay down this time. It was finally night. After a full evening of bloody combat, they finally seemed to be in the clear. Rook managed to fend off the slavers and guards, and they were far away enough from the market to not draw more attention their way. He surveyed their map to see what their next step should be. He was unfamiliar with this section of the continent, and he wasn't sure if there would be more hostile areas. Beanhop lost an arm and couldn't do much with just one. Rook knew that World's End sold robotic limbs that could remedy his loss. He charted World's End as his destination, and they began their travels. Beanhop was so hurt that he could barely walk, and Rook couldn't leave him behind. He decided that they needed to rest up at the base of the desert so that they could travel together at full speed. He laid out his camp bed and set a small fire to cook some dog bone meat for the new members of his group. He laid Horace down on the bed to rest up first. Rook and Beanhop chatted for a while while they waited for Horace to recover. The next morning, an escaped slave saw Rook's party and asked if he could join them. His name was Takao and he saw Rook guarding the two other escaped slaves. He asked if he could team up with them. He was stranded and had no food. He was desperate. Rook gladly welcomed him to their party. Shortly after, Horace regained consciousness and he told Rook that he wanted to join his party as well. It was Beanhop's turn to rest up. While he was recovering, Rook looked over the three new men. He told the other two that the plan was to travel west through the desert until they reached World's End, and then they would travel south to the hub. Once everyone was fully healed up, Rook packed up his camp bed. Rook paused for a moment and felt a bit of regret leaving one of the freed slaves behind. He should have planned a better escape for them. Regardless, he had three new members on his team and he had to help get them back to the hub. The first order of business though, World's End. They set off and started traversing through the vast desert. Horus was wearing heavier armor and it was slowing them all down. It was too slow of a pace and they could easily get ambushed. Rook scooped him up and they decided to carry him for the time being. Skim Sands was a dangerous desert. Fortunately, they were fast enough to outrun their dangers. They traveled all day and most of the night until they escaped the desert and entered the arm of Okran. Rook was distracted with his three new friends and he ran right into a Holy Nation patrol. Things seemed fine until they saw Beanhop. Rook forgot that the Holy Nation was notorious for being racist and sexist. The patrol leader told Rook to halt and speak with them. Rook didn't have time for this and decided to ignore him. They chased after them for over an hour until he gave up. Their trip to World's End was a struggle, but they finally arrived. Rook gave Beanhop a supply of cats and had him go into the traveler's shop. Beanhop wasn't used to this kind of treatment. He was a slave since he could remember. He found a robotic arm in their inventory and purchased it. It took no time to attach it to his body as it connected to his nerves. There was some pain initially, but it went away quickly, and just like that, Beanhop was back in business. Now that their detour was finished, they had to prepare for their travels to the hub. There was a lot of Holy Nation ground to cover, and Rook knew that they would be hostile towards him if they saw Beanhop. This could be a treacherous run. Regardless, they began their next trip and took off out of World's End as quickly as they arrived. They were low on food supplies. Rook was used to feeding just himself. Fortunately for them, there was a Holy Nation farm nearby. Rook snuck into their storage shack and shut the door behind him. He picked the lock of the chest with ease and smiled as he quietly opened it. It was filled with ration packs and other food supplies to sustain them for the rest of their journey. He packed up all the food in his bag and snuck out of the farm before anyone noticed anything suspicious. The group continued to travel south. So maybe traveling on the main road was a bad idea because they ran right into a hostile group of escaped servants. They started attacking Beanhop and Rook knew that they couldn't run so they all turned to face their attackers. The melee fighters were focusing on the freed slaves while Rook went straight for the bowmen. Rook's three new friends were very inexperienced in combat. He had to do whatever he could to fend these guys off. Most of the men focused on Rook while the others were being knocked out one by one. Beanhop tried to help even though he couldn't stand. Rook was skillfully fighting off the other men. The metal pipes didn't stand a chance against his falling sun. Each hit he landed would take another enemy down. As the last one tried to crawl away, Rook severed her leg in one last vicious swing. The aftermath wasn't great. Rook treated his own wounds first. 
The other three men were heavily wounded. Rook tended to Beanhop next. They healed each other up, and they needed to rest since they could barely walk. Rook decided that they would pay another visit to the holy farm that was nearby. On their slow walk back north, they were ambushed again. Rook was able to defeat them, but the cost was all of his allies getting severely wounded. Again. As he finished off the last bandit, Rook realized that watching after weaker men was not an easy task. He had to do everything he could to help protect them and train them to become stronger. He made another rash decision at that moment. He needed beds for his men to rest, and the Holy Nation farmers had some. Rook saw their attempt to chase down Beanhop as the first offense towards them, and he retaliated because of that, and killed the farmers in their small shack. As he was finishing the men off, he felt slightly bad for them. They were weak, but they were feeding the Holy Nation army, which meant they were his enemy. After he took out the last of them, he went back and fetched Beanhop. He carried him back to the shack to lay him down to rest up in the bed. This isn't mine. Wait, what? This isn't mine. Okay, isn't so Rook mine. murdered an entire farmer mine. village and caused the Holy Nation to become hostile towards him, specifically so his men could heal up there. Apparently the game wouldn't allow that though. Okay then. Rook looted the scavenger's basket off one of the fallen farmers. They could definitely use more storage space, so he laid Beanhop on the ground and equipped it on him. There wasn't really anything else of value here, so he picked Beanhop back up. He laid out his camp bed away from the road so patrols wouldn't notice them. He tucked Beanhop in so he could rest up again. The Holy Nation patrol was moving closer towards them. Rook tried to be stealthy so he wouldn't be noticed. The patrol was leaving and Rook had only one camp bed. This would take way too long for all of them to take turns resting in it. While Beanhop rested in the camp bed, Rook would take the others back to World's End to an inn. Of course, while Rook was gone, a group of starving bandits saw poor Beanhop off on the side of the road. He tried to escape, but was too wounded to get far. He tried to defend himself, but was taken out in one hit. They didn't want to kill him, they were just hungry. The bandits stole the rations that Beanhop was carrying and left him where he lay. Rook dropped to cow off at World's End, and around that time, Beanhop regained consciousness. He patched himself up and laid back down. Horus also got back up around the same time and began traveling back to World's End 2. He was moving slowly, so Rook ran to him and carried him back to the inn. Finally, Rook went back for Beanhop, scooped him up over his shoulder, and packed his camp bed. He ran another bed for Beanhop and himself. It was a grueling process, but they were all able to rest up and fully recover. They woke up around midnight. They could use the darkness as their cover while they moved south towards the hub. Things were going smoothly until daybreak when they saw another Holy Nation patrol nearby. They had to be careful, so they all snuck off the path to go around them. Once they were in the clear, they continued their travels back to the hub. Of course, another group of starving bandits found them and tried to chase them down. The men were tired of fighting, and Rook didn't want to have to juggle three men back and forth to save places to heal up if he could help it. These guys were persistent though, and they wouldn't let up. They were tired of being chased, so Rook put Horus down, and they turned to face the group of bandits. Rook had no problem fighting weak bandits like this. He would take multiple men down in a single swing. This was much more beneficial to his three newly freed slaves. They could use the practice to become slightly more competent fighters. Rook cut most of the men down while the others tried to land their own hits. The last man crumbled to Rook's falling sun. Everyone left the fight relatively unscathed. They continued pressing south. Unfortunately, this land was full of Holy Nation patrols and one found them. Now that the Holy Nation was hostile towards Rook, he could retaliate towards their advances on him and his men. He led a short charge into the two paladins that were pursuing them. These paladins were strong, far stronger than the newly freed slaves, but Rook could also handle them. Even though they were just two men, they did enough damage to Rook's allies so they had to set up camp to heal. Takao and Beanhop could barely walk. Rook built a campfire too to cook up some dogbone meat that they hunted along their travels. Beanhop would rest up first and the rest of the men would keep watch. After they were healed up, Rook packed up his camp bed and put in his in- Wait, wait a second. Why won't it let me pick up his camp bed? It's literally right there! Okay, so first they can't sleep in the farmer's beds, and now they don't have a camp bed to rest at for emergencies. I guess they would just have to risk it and make a mad dash for the hub. So it took them almost another entire grueling day of travel until they were back at the hub, and as you can see, they didn't make it there without some conflict. These bandits wouldn't let up. Rook could easily defeat them, but he wanted to lead them inside the walls of the hub where the other soldiers could help them fight off these pests. The slower two of the group were carried back. Now that they finally arrived, they eagerly joined Rook in the fighting. <laughs> Quickly enough, the bandits were beaten. Rook took the men to a small HQ that was tucked away in the hub so the men could properly rest. Wait, did Horus just grow hair? 
It looks like being freed let him grow the Sonic the Hedgehog look in just five days. Anyways, that night, everyone was rested up, healed, equipped with Rook's spare gear, and ready to start training the simple way. That's right, they're gonna mine some copper. While Beanhop, Takao, and Horus mined under the safety of the hub's territory, Rook traveled south back towards the abandoned Berserker village. It was a nice area for settlement, and he thought that maybe he could rebuild it and they could make it their home. He got there and it looked like he couldn't purchase the buildings or land for himself. He wasn't even permitted to build in the area. He traveled slightly east right at the border of the Swamplands. There was a major road running right through some nice looking land. Rook prospected the area and it looked like there was enough water and fertility that they could grow crops. Even though it was lacking in copper and iron, there were nodes nearby. At that moment, Rook knew. This would be their new home. He planned out the first building to claim the territory. Rook thought for a moment and he knew what he would call their new home. New Raleigh. South of Squin and west of the Swamplands, New Raleigh would begin its construction soon. Rook and his new friends had a lot of work cut out for them, more than they knew. Now that Rook laid the foundation for the first building of New Raleigh, he knew that they were lacking building materials. He reviewed his map and saw that there was a way station not too far north from their new settlement. He plotted it on his map and began running there to purchase as many supplies as he could carry. He worked into the night building their first small shack. It wasn't much, but they had to start somewhere. The next thing they needed was a research bench. Rook had a lot of cats saved up, but unless they figured out how to build their own materials and grow their own food, they'd run out really quickly. Rook mapped his way back to the way station where he told the others to meet him. Beanhop and Takao were faster than Horus, and they got their way before him. Beanhop sold his load of copper ore to the barkeep. At the same time, Rook filled his inventory back up with building materials. Takao sold his load of copper and filled his stash with as many research books and building materials as he could. Horus finally arrived and he noticed a plastic surgeon in the bar. Horus was a slave name that was given to him long ago. Thanks to Rook, that life was behind him. He spoke to the plastic surgeon and asked to have some work done. Now a while ago, my longtime viewer, Fravatar, who is a valuable member of New Raleigh 2.0 in RimWorld, asked to be a character in my Kenshi series if I ever made one, and he even sent me the information on his character's body and facial build. Well, good news, Fravatar. Once again, you'll be joining me in this journey. Welcome aboard. Horse was gone. He felt much better being called Fravatar and felt closure to the cruel life he used to live. Beanhop wished for the same change. He'd be named after one of my Discord friends and moderator, Tao, who also happened to be a member of New Raleigh 2.0 in RimWorld. Finally, Takao joined the bandwagon and spoke to the plastic surgeon as well. He'll be named after my Discord moderator, Wansnot. Welcome to the party. Everyone that joins Rook's cause gets a new name. He escorted the three men back to New Raleigh to make sure they made it there safely. As they approached their new territory, they saw the humble little shack that was their first step towards their settlement. Now that they had all their building supplies, Rook constructed a small research bench. The next order of business was to construct a well and start plotting out farmland. They worked together to build the well and start harvesting water. They also found a good area to mine stone and plotted a stone processor so they could begin manufacturing their own building supplies. They barely slept. They were determined to continue working. Now that they finished the mine, next was the stone processor. I don't have any building materials. Hmm? I don't have any building materials. Iron plates? Dang. Rook and his men only stocked up on building materials and research books. This meant that Rook needed to return back to the way station and load up on more supplies. He got back to their small market and filled his bag with as many iron plates as he could. All the while, Tao was working hard on a huge queue of items to be researched. This would definitely keep him busy for some time. Rook finally returned from his quick trip to the way station and began constructing their stone processor. Fravatar began working away at crafting some building mati- What's going on here? Okay, so let me tell you about these skin spiders. Everyone always complains about beak things, but Rook never heard of people complaining about these terrifying abominations that plagued the spider planes where New Raleigh was built. I guess the name makes sense. Uh, anyways, building the base was hard when you had all these obnoxious creepy skin spiders wandering the area in clusters looking for delicious flesh to feed on, and right now they had their eyes on Wan's knot. In a panic, he took off towards their small shack looking for cover. Fortunately, these things weren't too fast. Wan's knot ran as quickly as he could and made his way into the shack and slammed the door behind him. As soon as he entered the building, they lost interest in him. Rook didn't account for this kind of nuisance while they established their new home. One little shack wasn't going to be enough space for the four of them, so they laid the plans down for a small storm house next. Rook already bought most of the supplies from the way station, so he made his way back up to the hub for more. He filled his stash back up with crafting materials, but on his way out the door, a man called Rook over to speak with him. 
This man went by the name of Hobbs, and he asked Rook if he heard of the story of the Wailing Phantom. Rook figured he'd humor the man and asked for more details. Hobbs tells him some absurd story about the Phantom, and it was so bizarre that Rook asked for more details of how he could find this legendary Phantom. Hobbs told him that nobody knows where it exists, but he'd gladly join Rook's cause and help his men find this bizarre creature to claim its fortune. Just like that, Rook found himself with the fifth member of New Raleigh. Like all who joined Rook's team, Hobbs visited a plastic surgeon to change his name and appearance. His name was changed to Chris, after my Discord member, Lame Chops Bot. Now that Chris was prepared to leave the hub, they routed New Raleigh on their map and began their travels. So While running through the swamp, the Rook struck up a conversation with Chris asking about more information legend? about his legend that started in their Some earlier discussion. Please subscribe to my channel. You might Chris seemed at a loss of what he was talking about. Rook tried to elaborate, but Chris had no idea what Rook was referring to. Rook felt a mixture of annoyance, amusement, and confusion by their conversation, but he left it be and they continued their trip back to the settlement. Rook returned to the base with his newest recruit and introduced him to Tao and brought him some food from the trip. They quickly realized that green fruit didn't really grow in this arid landscape, and they knew how to grow cactuses now. This would be a much better crop to focus on here. Rook and Tao worked together to finish constructing the storm house. The men weren't paying attention while they were working the stone mine and got jumped by another skin spider. They were far too weak to fight it off. Rook ran to their aid and attacked this disgusting creature. Man, I hate these things. Fravitar and Wands not were fine, but Chris was in bad shape. Rook quickly realized another issue. They had no beds at their base to rest at. All they could do right now is to use the way stations in temporarily until they had beds of their own where they could recover from fighting. See, I don't think you understand just how annoying these things are and they are EVERYWHERE! The entire cluster was chasing after Tao and he wasn't in the mood to become a snack for these things. He was able to flee back into the shed safely, but it looked like one of the skin spiders stayed behind. It walked past Fravitar's unconscious body and started to slowly gnaw on Wan's knot. They basically had to provoke the spider and herd it away from the unconscious men while Rook swooped in and snagged them. They survived another surprise attack from these things, at least for now. They quickly researched and built a better research bench and immediately focused on building their own beds. In no time, they were able to plan them atop of their newly built storm house. The men didn't have any fabric to build beds yet, but they could pick some up at the way station on their next visit. They were also finally able to begin their first plot of cactus plants to farm. Chris loaded it up with water and all they had to do was wait for them to grow. Oh, did you know when you begin building a base, everyone in the area will start raiding it? Here we have the stone rats demanding food and payment, which they're not willing to hand over. So what do they do? While they beat Rook unconscious, the other men are hiding in the storm house that's getting raided and follow them upstairs where they're trying to lay low. Rook underestimated what they were doing here. His new recruits were too weak and they were getting bombarded with skin spider clusters and raids from various factions. He was frustrated as he hid watching the stone rats leave their base while everyone else was beaten unconscious. He couldn't do anything else other than watch from afar. Once they left, he patched his men up and they finished building the first few beds. At least they'd be able to rest up at their own base now. Oh great, the Holy Nation's gonna pay him a visit too! They arrived and immediately began raiding the buildings searching for the men. Rook and his team were all hiding on the roof of the storm house and he was really surprised that they didn't seem to know where they were. In fact, the wandering skin spiders were attacking the Holy Nation raid. Though they didn't stand a chance against this many men, it was nice to see them do at least some kind of harm to the Holy Nation. After that, they continued running around like fools searching for Rook's men until they finally gave up and their assault ended. The enemy patched themselves up and began their march back north. Rook snuck out to buy food supplies since they were completely out and his men were growing very hungry. While he was gone, some of the Holy Nation men stayed behind and ambushed the rest of them. There was intense fighting in their storm house. Tao was knocked to the ground, and in one massive swing, the paladin severed one of his legs completely off. He screamed out in pain, and before he blacked out, he saw the rest of his men get beaten down as well. The Holy Nation was sending a message to Rook. They were not safe, and they wanted him and his men to suffer. Fravitar woke up first and healed the other men the best he could, and then laid them in their beds to rest up. Rook knew that they wouldn't survive if they didn't have better protection. They researched defensive walls and began to plot out their perimeter. He wanted to make sure they had enough room for growth and planned a huge wall. They'd have a gate leading into each end of the path and a side entrance that would lead out north towards the way station. It was an ambitious project, but it was necessary for them to be safe. They'd also need to be able to build their own iron plates, so they began the construction of a refinery. Did I mention how when you're building a base you get raided like twice a day? These jerk-offs come into Rook's base demanding protection money? 
Protection from what? Rook was fed up with this garbage. He went into the group of men and began attacking them. Wands not and Fravatar were knocked out, but Chris helped Rook stand their ground as they defeated the bandit party that invaded New Raleigh. During all this, Tao was still missing a leg. He wouldn't be very productive unless they did something about it. Rook scooped his friend up and reminded him that he promised to help take care of him after he freed him. He plotted his way to a hive village that wasn't too far away from their base. It's been a while since he was last in Bane. He found the hive village and spoke to the robotics trader. They didn't have anything fancy, but he purchased a replacement leg for Tao. He helped attach it to where he once had his real leg, and for the most part, Tao was ready to get back into action at New Raleigh. Rook was fast enough just carrying Tao back over his shoulder, so he left it back for New Raleigh. On their way, he stopped at a way station to pick up more supplies for their developing home. Just like that, Rook's fortune was completely spent. There was definitely a cost to building a base, and the upkeep for feeding four other men was quite expensive. Regardless, their base was slowly growing, which meant they would need to power their base soon. Since their new home was flat and windy, they planned a wind turbine in the corner of the base. The construction was finished, and they now had a source of electricity for New Raleigh. Man, I hate these skin spiders! Ugh! Anyways, they upgraded their stone processor to pump out building materials more quickly, and Rook finally finished building their iron refinery as well. Oh, you gotta be kidding me. Get out of here, you stupid pest! The perimeter wall was coming along nicely, and they wanted to generate more electricity for their machines. They planned another wind turbine on the other side of the base. They built it up in no time, and the turbine immediately started working with the wind. Oh man, they really need to finish that wall. It's been a constant struggle since Rook built their first shack with the raids and skin spiders. At this point, Rook didn't know who he hated more. The slavers, the holy nation, or these darn bugs. The men were ambushed again and Tao was jumped while he was by himself at their farm. Upon further inspection, they saw that the poor Hiver had his other leg gnawed completely off. Rook needed him to be able to help grow more food for their base. It was expensive to buy it at the way station, so he scooped Tao up and began heading towards the Hiver village again. He arrived with Tao over his shoulder and the robotics trader knew exactly what happened. He helped them pick out another leg to get Tao back on his feet. They installed his third robotic limb and Tao thanked Rook for helping him out. He apologized for getting himself into these situations, but Rook assured him that it was fine. He was helping them build and sustain New Raleigh after all. They made their way back to their new home once again. Rook was working late into the night trying to finish the construction of their wall. This would go much, much more smoothly if they could prevent skin spiders from getting into their base. Slowly but surely, New Raleigh was growing. Finally, 23 days after beginning this grueling process of building a permanent home for Rook's men, he finally finished constructing the perimeter wall. In hindsight, Rook knew he should have started smaller, but he was more of a learn-as-you-go kind of guy. What mattered now, though, is the fact that they had protection to farm and mine stone without having to worry about skin spiders. There was an iron deposit right outside of their base, so they could easily let someone through the gate to mine and close it off until they were ready to return. This definitely came in handy, and everyone felt much more secure now. Tao became their dedicated farmer since he had a passion for it. They were erecting more buildings to house more storage and technology. Morale was high while Chris and Wansnot worked the stone mine and iron refinery. Tao harvested a surplus of crops, and Fravatar worked as their chef while mining in between jobs with Rook. Days passed without conflict. They were mostly ignored by other factions now that they were barricaded out, at least for now. Rook finally felt like they were safe and secure. He also felt a burning desire to go back out in the world and become even stronger. He had a mission after all, and he wasn't going to stop until New Raleigh and his men were powerful enough to take on the Holy Nation head to head. He pulled Chris and Wansnot into their newly furnished stormhouse and told them the news. They were going with Rook to quest and explore the world with him. The three men would be adventurers while Fravatar and Tao kept the base safe and continued building their food supplies. They anxiously stood by the gate and waited for it to open, and for the first time in what felt like an eternity, Rook began new adventures with his friends. The men just exited the gates of New Raleigh, but they weren't entirely sure of where they were going to go yet. Rook pulled out his map and the men looked over it. Part of the west was completely unexplored by the coast and they decided to head there and see what they could uncover on their way. Neither Chris nor Wansnot have ever seen the coast before. They were excited at the idea of traveling to the ends of the world with Rook. The men set off on their brave new expedition sharing stories of what they'd hoped to find along their way. Their spirits were high. Well, that was until they found a hostile group of Shek called Kraus Chosen. Rook thought he could protect the men, but instead, they were all beaten to a pulp. <gasps> the enemy healed themselves up and left the unconscious adventurers to lay in the dirt. A few hours passed and the men came to and bandaged themselves up. No more than a few hundred yards from their home and they were already severely wounded. Morale slightly lower than just a few hours ago, and the men were limping back to New Raleigh to heal up. 
Okay, so now that they are fully recovered, they bid their farewells to Tao and Fravatar again while enduring jokes at their expense. Wow, that must have been some expedition, they said mockingly with big grins on their faces. Let's uh, pretend that never happened, Rook told the men as they prepared for their uh, first expedition uh, again. The gate closed behind them once again and they plotted their way towards the coast on their map. Even though their first attempt was a failure, the two men were excited to go on adventures with Rook like the ones he told him about when he was solo. And while Rook enjoyed traveling alone, he really did prefer the company of his men. Of course the trade-off was that they were far weaker than him and he'd have to help protect them in the face of danger. Where one stealthy man can sneak by trouble, add two men who can't sneak to save their lives to the mix and things get a little more… complicated. They were pressing onwards towards the coast until they saw something interesting nearby. They decided to investigate it. What they found was a bounty hunter camp with a group of men going about their business. The adventurers were curious of what they were doing there and approached one of the bounty hunters. She told them that they were looking for the Bugmaster. They never heard of the Bugmaster before, but she said that while not much is known about him, he supposedly has incredible loot but is incredibly dangerous as well. Maybe seeing the coast can wait. Like most of Rook's adventures in the past, they stumbled upon something with a lot of potential, so they decided to scour the surrounding area for this Bugmaster themselves. They traveled a little further until they stumbled upon another bounty hunter camp. They realized that they were actually traveling around the outside of a giant crater. And let's be real, where would a powerful and ominous being be found if not in the center of a massive crater? As the men drew closer to the lake in the middle of the crater, they discovered an outpost that wasn't too far from them. Could this be it? They could see the water from here. Nani? And out of nowhere, a skin spider came barreling towards them. They froze and noticed there was an entire cluster of them by the water. Time to change plans. They fell back, but the spider didn't pursue them. It was almost like it was guarding the area. Rook was going to sneak by them and continue on his own, but Wansnot and Chris both insisted they join him. They didn't want to miss out on finding the Bugmaster's treasure. They slowly crept down to the water, but one of the skin spiders noticed them and came into attack. Rook yelled to stand their ground. The three of them could take one out. That was until a second one flanked Rook and he had to focus his attention on it. These ugly creatures were massive and every hit they landed inflicted tons of damage. Rook wasn't sure they could hold the two of them off. About that time, the skin spider crashed its sharp limb into Rook and he blacked out. The other two fell immediately after as well. Wansnot was the last to go down and as soon as he hit the ground, the spiders wandered off. Fortunately for the men, their behavior was quite strange here. Cool rain began falling over them. This helped wake them up from their forced slumber and they scrambled to patch each other up. Chris was hurt pretty badly. Rook looked at Wansnot and without having to say anything, he agreed that he would take Chris back to the bounty hunter camp to heal up while Rook continued on his own. Remember what I said about one sneaky boy compared to two clunky boys? Regardless of being clunky or not, Wansnot tried to be as stealthy as possible as he made his way out of this dangerous spider crater. Rook wished him luck and started swimming towards the unknown object in the lake. Wansnot ran into some trouble on his way out of the crater. No, 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 no. <laughs> they chased him to the edge of a steep drop off and watched as he crept away. Wansnot was happy Chris was unconscious and didn't hear the squeals of terror that he let out moments earlier. Even though he had some close calls, he got them back to safety and they laid down to rest, hoping that Rook returns in one piece. Meanwhile, Rook finally swam over to the unknown object. It was just an empty fallen tower that had nothing of interest in it. Rook was determined to find more though, and he went further south towards the other outpost. The rain helped his presence remain unknown as he stealthily ran past clusters of skin spiders patrolling the crater. In no time, he saw an ominous dark tower rising up above the crater. Lots of spiders were by it too. For the first time in a long time, Rook was nervous as he ran up the ramp to see what was inside. He made it into the top and entered the building. It was infested with spiders everywhere. They remained unaware of him, but that's when Rook felt an uneasy presence himself. He knew that this is where the Bugmaster was. This was a very dangerous situation to be in. At that moment, Rook did what any sane human wouldn't do and started sprinting past the dangerous spiders and up to the next floor. It was an almost completely empty room, but he glanced at an individual that was staring off in the corner by a chest. He ran up to the next floor and all he saw when he peeked into the opening were cages and another skin spider. Other than that, it was a dead end. Rook only had a split second to think and his mind was on one thing only, the treasure chest that the Bugmaster was standing over. Rook was fast, really fast. Before the massive cluster of spiders broke into the second floor, he ran over and opened up the chest. Rook only had a moment to look and what he found was terrifying. A giant chest filled to the brim with human teeth. Then he noticed there was an old piece of paper sticking out. It was some kind of map that the Bugmaster kept. He immediately grabbed it and stuffed it into his pocket. At this point, the spiders were pouring into the room and as Rook began to run to the back wall for space, the Bugmaster broke out of his trance and without any emotion, he started towards Rook. 
he had no other options. He lowered his shoulder and ran as fast as he could into the cluster of spiders and skillfully slid through their masses down the ramp into the first floor. As he broke free from the horde, he sprinted out the door and down the ramp. As he circled the spire, he laughed out loud in disbelief of what just happened. He came face to face with this fabled bug master and lived with proof. He found a safe place to hide and he tore the map out of his pocket to see what he actually took from there. It was a map and it was pointing to one location on the far end of the opposite corner of the world, the Ashlands. Most of what was included on the paper was gibberish, but he thought that he understood the meaning of this paper. The Bugmaster was amassing an army of spiders to go to this location and kill whoever was there. This was the rumored treasure that the bounty hunters were speaking of. Nothing of upfront value, but this was still a great treasure to find. Rook didn't know much about the Ashlands other than the fact that it was considered the most dangerous place in the entire land and virtually nobody who goes there comes back. He only knew one thing, a place like that had to have some amazing treasures to be found. He marked the location to his own map and plotted his way back to the camp where the other men were resting at. He had a lot to discuss with them. Rook made it back with no issue and was exhausted from what just happened. He laid down to rest up with the men and told them about the Bugmaster and his discovery on the map. He tried to emphasize the dangers and risks of going to the Ashlands, but they were both inspired by Rook and didn't want to let him do this alone. At that point, things were settled. They left early in the morning straight towards the Ashlands, feeling a mixture of excitement and nervousness. As they traveled, the men talked about what they hoped to find at their destination while admiring the beautiful vistas of cities and mountains off in the distance. But like all their travels, they found empty ruins in the swamp just east of their home, so they detoured off to investigate what goodies they could find. While it was completely empty, they did notice another outpost not too far from there. It was a small outpost, and it looked like a hideout for a group of men called the Red Sabers. As they swam to the shore, they quickly learned that the Red Sabers weren't exactly the friendliest of folks as they attacked Rook and his men on sight. Wansnot and Chris were trying to fight the man off, but were still unskilled in combat. Rook was slowly coming to help the men. Slowly. Hurry up, dude. There we go. Finally. <gasps> Wansnot looted the bandages off the unconscious body, and he liked the rattan hat that he was wearing, so he decided to take it for himself. At that moment, more men were coming out of the swamp waters towards their group. They engaged them for another fight. Thanks to Rook's mighty falling sun, their men didn't stand a chance. After the fighting was finished, Rook told the other men to stay back while he checks out this hideout. He walked in and the place was crawling with Red Saber men. They didn't really seem to notice him until he stepped forward to introduce himself. He was immediately cut off by a really big guy in the back of the room. His face was a mixture of confusion and anger, but Rook could tell that he wasn't happy to see an outsider here. At his word, all the men got up to attack. Rook knew he was the boss here. In fact, he was a wanted man for 10,000 cats by the Sheks. Rook could escape now and most likely outrun the men, but instead he yelled out for his allies to join him. He was going to take them on and capture the Red Saber boss to collect another bounty. It was a personal thing, but Rook found great satisfaction adding notches to the number of bounties he collected. He was completely surrounded but kept his cool. This was nothing compared to the Bugmaster's lair and he knew he could take them on. Chris and Wands not weren't in the same situation. They were slowly getting whittled down. Even though they were helping take some of the men off Rook, he knew they were in danger here. He called out and ordered them to run back to their home and wait for him there. He'd handle the rest. They looked at each other and gave Rook a nod as they took off out the door and started running away. Rook was quick with his katana. It was more wieldy indoors and he flew from one man to another, blocking most of their blows and striking them in passing. As he was hoping, the Red Saber boss got frustrated watching him beat on his men and stepped into the fight. This was his chance. One of his blows knocked the wind out of the boss and he could see the concern on his face while he struggled to catch his breath and get back up. He focused his attention on the boss and tried landing as many hits on him while blocking the incoming swings from his men in between strikes. He beat him back into a wall and continued his aggressive assault on him. A few more hits landed and the big man fell. His men seemed extra angry at this but Rook didn't really care about that. In one swift motion, Rook kicked the boss's weapon off the ground into his hands and stuffed it into his bag, ducked down and scooped up the huge man up over his shoulder. It was time to get out of here. He plodded towards New Raleigh and as he ran out the door, a swarm of men followed close behind cursing at him as they tried to stop him. Rook had the biggest grin as he navigated through the swamp's uneven grounds with such finesse. He knew that they just bagged another 10,000 cats with this random visit to the Red Saber hideout. It didn't take long for Rook to lose the men and meet up with Chris and Wansnot. He told them about what happened as they stripped the wanted boss down and Chris stuffed his clothing into his backpack. Rook told them to head back to New Raleigh while he'd claim the bounty and meet back up with them. Well, Wansnot and Chris ran into some trouble on their way back home. There were swamp ninjas sneaking around the swamplands and they jumped them. At least they made it back in one piece, even if Wansnot had to carry Chris to the last leg of the trip. 
There was a big sigh of relief as Wansnot walked through the front gate. They were back home and safe again. In the meantime, Rook was moving as quickly as he could to Squin to turn in his bounty. Running through the city brought flashbacks of his first bounty he caught, which felt like an eternity ago. He saw the police station ahead and entered. He looked like a proud child, showing off his catch to the Shek Guardian who couldn't care less about the bounty. He simply tossed Rook a bag filled with 10,000 cats and hoisted the large man over his shoulders and ran upstairs to where they held the prisoners. Speaking of cherished memories of days long past, there she was, Tora the Fearless, still alive and well and being held prisoner. Hey, at least now she had someone to keep her company for the duration of their stay. Rook had no other reason to be in town, and he took off running back towards New Raleigh. Back at home base, the adventurers were healing up from their travels while Tao and Fravatar continued maintaining New Raleigh. Tao was not only keeping the men's food supplies fully stocked, but his farming skills were becoming quite high. Fravatar was taking those food supplies and cooking it into edible food for the men. He was becoming quite the chef. These two were the foundation of their base of operations, which allowed the rest of the men to go on their expeditions. Rook returned, and the adventurers were fully recovered. Wansnot equipped the Red Saber boss's armor, and Rook gave him his weapon too. It was a much finer quality than his current weapon. Chris went to their food storage and stocked up on more supplies for their upcoming travels. He wanted to make sure that they were fully stocked. They didn't know how long it would take to go to the dreaded Ashlands. The men bid their farewells and met outside of the East Gate. It slowly closed behind them as they exited New Raleigh for an unknown amount of time. They gathered around Rook's map and plotted the ominous place as their final destination again and began their expedition through the Swamplands. They exchanged stories of the excitement of the raid on the Red Sabres with Rook and complimented him on his great fighting skills that led him to taking on their boss while being completely surrounded and still managed to take him out and capture him. Rook just laughed and told them that if they continued questing with him, they would learn to fight like this too. During their conversation, Rook realized that the city of Shark was directly in their path and the men agreed that it would be good to stop there briefly and see what they could find. But of course, in classic Rook Expedition fashion, they discovered ruins nearby and they decided to detour from their detour and check out the ruins quickly. It was dark and quiet. It looked like some kind of old library that was long forgotten. Rook had the men wait outside while he would work on this old lock that kept him out of whatever riches that might be inside. It was a tricky lock, but he eventually bested it. The door slowly creeped open. Clearly it hasn't been opened in ages. Rook stepped inside and there were mostly old ruined books but Rook saw a chest in the corner of the room. There was still hope for some real treasure. His lockpicking skills were quite refined now, and he had no trouble picking the lock. Inside, he found old maps. This seemed to be the trend of their recent treasures as of late. No matter though, Rook carefully folded them up and put them in his pocket. Treasure maps led to better riches, just for another day. While this old library didn't have anything else of value, Rook carefully looked over the maps and began noting down the destinations on his map. These locations were spread all across the land and they'd have to plan separate expeditions later on to see what goodies they had locked away. The one that interested him the most was an Ashlands dome that was not far from their final destination. They could most likely explore there while visiting the Ashlands. Rook returned to the others and shared his findings with them. It was late and they wanted to get to Shark now. They were heading their way, pleased with new locations to eventually explore. That was, until they were ambushed by more swamp ninjas. They hid in the overgrowth of the swamplands and caught the men completely off guard. Rook told the men to attack, but these guys were quick. They caught the men off guard and they were really hurting them. Rook tried to lure most of the men away from Wansnot and Chris. He was inflicting massive damage with each swing, but a swamp ninja skillfully landed a blow that knocked Rook out. The other men panicked and Chris was taken down in no time. Wansnot tried being defensive, hoping Rook would wake up soon and help. He wasn't so fortunate though and was taken down. The swamp ninjas took off and left the men for dead. Rook was a tenacious man though, and when he regained consciousness, he mended himself and everyone up. Chris was hurt pretty badly, but Wansnot was able to walk. Rook gathered Chris up and they made it to Shark shortly after. They immediately found the closest bar and stepped inside. They took a moment to soak in the hustle and bustle of the bar, but Rook found the beds in the back and paid for a bed for Chris. Wansnot laid down next to him. Rook was about to lay down to rest too, but he saw a man at one of the tables looking at him like he wanted to speak, so Rook approached him. His name was Hammett, and he thought Rook looked like a seasoned adventurer. He asked Rook what his thoughts were on slavery. By now, we all know that Rook is pretty anti-slavery, and he expressed his sentiments to Hammett. Hammett smiled a sad smile and told him that the slavers took someone he loved from him, branded her, and forced her into the cruel life of a slave. He wanted vengeance, but he couldn't do it alone. Rook explained what his group was doing here and how they were trying to find better loot, train his men, fund New Raleigh with their expeditions, and overthrow the Holy Nation. He struck a deal with this man. If he joined Rook's men in their cause, he would lead them to the destruction of the slavers as well. Hammett was moved by Rook's offer and he joined their group. Rook's head was still throbbing from the beating they took from the Swamp Ninjas, so he told Hammett to wait there while they rested up and he would introduce him to the others when they woke up. Late that night, the men recovered and got out of bed. 
Rook made quick introductions and suggested they speak more on the road while they used the cover of night to their advantage. The next nearest city on the way to the Ashlands was Morn. They could use that as their next checkpoint and began heading east. They left Shark and the men were taking this time to get to know their new recruit. They traveled through the swamp and then through the desert while learning about Hammett's past. He owned a small farm but slavers attacked and while he escaped, his wife didn't. He was laying low in Shark while plotting revenge and that's when he met Rook. He was definitely filled with determination. The men were happy to have him join the team. Before they knew it, they found themselves walking through the gates of Morn. Of course Rook had to brag about his accomplishments here as soon as they stepped into the city but they enjoyed his tales. As Rook recalled, there wasn't really anything of interest to Morn, and they just passed through and continued traveling east. They were lucky and avoided any dangers until they arrived right outside of the territory known as the Ashlands. Rook felt uneasy about what was ahead. He could see from the looks of the other men that they felt it too. He made a decision and began sifting through his backpack. He gave all of his spare loot that they found along the way to Hammett to hold on for safe keepings. He was going to traverse the Ashlands alone. The men didn't argue. They were hungry for adventure, but everyone sensed that they were in over their heads. There was a hill nearby where they could hide out and they had good visibility of the surrounding area. They should be able to see trouble before it sees them. Rook sighed a heavy breath and gave them one final nod. He usually felt calm when he was alone, but this was different. For the first time since the Bugmaster's lair, Rook felt fear in the pit of his stomach, but also a wave of excitement about going into the unknown as he began running into the Ashlands to see what the Bugmaster was plotting against. As he said farewell to his men, Rook was filled with a mixture of excitement and nervousness. He wasn't quite in the Ashlands yet, but he was so close he could almost taste it. He entered the Sniper Valley and he was on the lookout for anything suspicious. He was only met with howling winds and bad vibes as he peered over his map quickly to mark an unexplored outpost nearby. He could see the large structure from a distance, but he was caught off guard by someone, rather, something that greeted him. Flesh brother. It called out in a dull robotic voice, but you could sense the excitement in its tone at the same time. What? were these things. Rook got a really bad feeling from these… skin bandits? That's definitely skin that they're wearing. He tried to sneak past while running even though he was already detected. They watched him from a distance but continued their patrol. Rook used this opportunity to gain distance from them until he was out of their sight. At least that's what he was hoping for. Rook was thankful he was so quick on his feet and he was able to outrun their pursuit. Already painfully aware that he shouldn't investigate this outpost, he couldn't fight off his curiosity of what was inside these structures. I like your skin. Rook quietly opened the door and he peeked inside. It was more of these disturbing things. And a peeler machine. And a clothing bench right beside it. These skeletons were harvesting flesh from helpless victims and sewing them on themselves. Rook could only imagine what might have caused them to behave this way, but all he knew was that he didn't want to be turned into some insane skeleton's hat and plotted his way to the Ashlands. It looked like one still had its attention on Rook's valuable flesh and, well, one thing led to another and somehow a small army of skin bandits were in hot pursuit of Rook. He actually thought about how much happier he'd be to be surrounded by skin spiders instead of being chased by these relentless skin bandits. They did not let up until Rook finally entered the desolate ruins of the Ashlands. The tension of the chase immediately let up and Rook was left with a very unnerving calm as ash fell from the sky as far ahead as he could see like a heavy snowstorm. He felt isolated here. Well, that was until he saw a skeleton patrol heading up the hill. He immediately began to sneak and find some cover to hide. The last thing he wanted to do was get caught here. This was a large patrol and they looked tough. Rook definitely couldn't handle that on his own. He successfully evaded their patrols and saw some kind of large outpost nearby. From afar, it looked like a large hive of some sort. When he walked inside, it looked like some sort of lab. Of course, Rook's eyes were drawn to the locked safe nearby. He quickly worked the lock open, and inside was some random junk. He quietly scoffed as he closed it up, but noticed an even more secure looking safe behind him. Rook was working on this lock, and he realized that he wasn't alone in here. He managed to pick the lock, but he had to fall back briefly as a skeleton patrol was wandering through. He realized they were spreading out and he'd be caught if he didn't move fast. It might not be the best idea, but Rook turned around and went for the safe. A smile appeared on his face as he was met with some real treasure. An Edge Type 1 fragmented axe. Yeah, boy. There were still plenty more of the Ashlands to explore, and he already found some good loot. He loaded it into his... Oh, wait. This weapon was too big to fit in his bag. This would complicate things. He didn't have time to think. Rook heard a skeleton guard right by him, and he panicked. He equipped the fragmented axe and dropped his falling sun. He had to get out of there before he got caught, so he planned his quick escape through the back of the strange structure. Rook was very quiet when sneaking. The skeletons were going about their business and had no idea Rook was ever there. As he escaped through the ramp into the Ashlands, he quickly plodded back towards his ultimate destination. 
It pained Rook greatly to leave behind his beloved falling son, but maybe he could come back for it later. He grew quite attached to his trusty weapon after all. As he got closer to the ominous place, he discovered another dome nearby. Another dome might mean more treasure, so he had to take a detour over to it. This one did not seem so promising though. Empty and almost completely toppled over. This one had nothing of interest in it. He took a deep breath and realized he was about to step into the place that the Bugmaster was planning on invading one day. He finally arrived and what he found was a deep crater and two more dome structures. Not sure of what to expect inside, he tried to be as stealthy as possible and made his way towards the inside of the first dome. As he crept in, there was debris all over the ground. Glancing up at the floors above him, he noticed some very securely locked safes. It looked like the coast was clear so he made his way up to the third floor. But what was this? He was so focused on the potential treasure that he completely overlooked this throne in the middle of the rubble. Sitting on the throne was a skeleton that looked more powerful than any other individual Rook's ever seen. The Mad Cat Lawn. He knew nothing of Cat Lawn other than the fact that he did not want to get caught by him. Actually, let's try something real quick. We'll save the game first. Let's, uh, attack him real quick. <laughs> okay, yeah, let's pretend that never happened. Anyways, back to the story. Nobody else was in the dome and the coast was clear. Rook began working the safe. It took a few attempts, but he finally pried it open. Inside was a beautifully crafted nadachi, some blueprints, and other less important items. Rook gathered what he could and fit it into his bags. The fragmented axe was a magnificent weapon indeed, but it was so heavy and unwieldy the Nadachi felt more comfortable to him, and he decided to swap weapons. Unfortunately, he just didn't have a big enough bag to haul the larger weapons with him. Anyways, he already had a plan for this, so he closed up the safe and he began working on the next lock safe. This one was mildly disappointing, to say the least. There wasn't anything else that caught Rook's eye, so he decided to sneak into the other dome and see what treasures he might find there. He snuck into the entrance and looked down the ramp. Rook froze and saw what looked like an entire army of skeletons patrolling the structure. He had to get out of there. He looked at his map and realized it was time to leave the Ashlands and reunite with his friends. Rook decided to take the quick route through the masses of skeletons and fortunately he passed through undetected. On his way out, he discovered another nearby dome. It was another quick detour as this dome was completely destroyed and abandoned. He continued traversing back to his men. On his way out of the Ashlands, Rook saw another patrol of the horrifying skin bandits. He snuck by unnoticed. Rook noticed the main structure of the Skin Bandit's home actually looked like one of the abandoned domes that he explored in the Ashlands. What happened here? He finally made it to the ruined structure that his men were hiding in, but it looked like he was being tailed by a lone skeleton. It was time to put this Nadachi to the test. It felt good in his hands as he began attacking the skeleton. This would definitely be an easy fight. So there was actually an entire patrol that caught up with Rook, so he immediately booked it away from his allies. Keeping them safe was his highest priority. It took some time, but he managed to lose a patrol minus this one determined skeleton. They re-engaged and it only took Rook a couple skillful swings to defeat it. Now that he wasn't being followed, he returned to his men. They lit up when Rook came in to greet them. The men were filled with questions about the Ashlands, but Rook just told them, There's no time to talk yet. Hand me your bag. And he tossed Chris his backpack while asking for him to hand his over. They were taken aback slightly and Rook just looked at them and said, Hold tight. I'm getting my falling son back. The rest of the men looked mildly annoyed, but they knew it didn't make sense to object. Rook began making his way back to the Ashlands Dome. This bag was awkward. It slowed him down and he wasn't nearly as stealthy, so he had to be extra careful. It was time to return to the Ashlands. He got back to the first dome and it didn't look like his falling son was there, so he went to the safe to see if it was inside. It wasn't there. Not only that, but they saw Rook and were closing in on him. He never actually put it in the safe. They must have confiscated it. Rook let out a disappointed sigh and began running for his life. Even with this heavier bag, he was able to escape and make it back to Catlon's lair. He was going to try and get the fragmented axe back. He turned the corner into the dome and he realized he made a big mistake. This wasn't the dome with the isolated skeleton sitting on a throne. This was the dome that had an entire army of skeletons in it. Rook was too late to realize his mistake. He took off running in the opposite direction. He was circling the crater, but there were at least a dozen angry skeletons on hot pursuit. At this point, he figured he would sprint into the other dome, snag the fragmented axe, and get out of here for good. Rook got some distance from the enemy, but they weren't letting up. He entered the correct dome this time, and there was the ominous skeleton sitting upon his throne. That didn't matter right now, though. The safe was on the third floor, and he wasn't going to go through all this trouble for nothing. He wasn't trying to sneak this time, and Catlon noticed him. He began rambling off, declaring things of treason and other nonsense. Oh, thank goodness. At least the fragmented axe was still there. He quickly placed it into his bag and started making his way out of there. 
As he rounded down the spiral stairway, the other skeletons caught up to him. He got tangled in a group of them but slid through while only taking a minor hit on his right arm. He started running for the exit and ran into the other hive again. He realized what he was doing and turned to go the long way around the crater again. <laughs> what the heck? Out of nowhere, Catlon and all of his minions started screeching to the point that it felt like the ground was trembling. Rook really needed to get out of there. What seemed like the entire force of the Ashlands was chasing after him in cold blood. Rook really needed to get out of there. Fortunately, he was still faster than the entire mass, and after running through most of the Ashlands, they finally realized they wouldn't catch him and stop chasing after him. Rook thought he was strong, but he realized this place was far too dangerous for him to explore. As he left, he walked by this hulking machine called a cleanser unit. Yeah, let's just go around that. He used the darkness of the night to his advantage to sneak back to the other men undetected. As he crept through the ruined doorway, the others noticed him and anxiously asked him what happened and if he was alright. Rook rested with them for a few hours and talked about the events he witnessed with the skin bandits, the domes, and how he lost his treasured falling sun in Cat Lawn. The sun started to rise and they all knew that they overstayed their visit. It was time to head back home. They would stop at Mornigan as a checkpoint and continue to New Raleigh. Rook felt relieved to be back with his men. They seemed relieved to have him back with them too. While making their way to Morn, they were attacked by a large beak thing. It was time for them to test out their new weapons. Rook kept the fragmented axe. No one else would be strong enough to use it, and Wan's not equipped in Nodachi. Rook barked orders on formation while the men worked together to take the beast on. Every swing of its head inflicted massive damage to Chris, Hammett, and Wan's not. Rook was flanking it while trying to do as much harm to it as he could. The fighting continued for a while longer, but they eventually killed the beast. They carved the good meat from its body and lit a campfire. They could use the fresh meals since their food supplies were running quite low. They patiently waited while their meat cooked and talked about how they were looking forward to returning home. It didn't take much longer for them to travel until they saw the massive iron structure across the horizon. This meant Morn was nearby. The men were hurt and tired from their travels. They were looking forward to having a bed to rest in. As they entered the gate, they went straight towards the inn. They paid a few cats and then began to... Uh, rest? And, uh... heal up? That's a little creepy, not gonna lie. After the men slept, they felt rejuvenated and continued their journey back to New Raleigh. Things were going well until a bunch of pesky blood spiders ambushed them in the swamp at night. Rook tried to fend them off, but they were too much for him. The men ended up making it out in one piece, but both Rook and Wansnot were pretty banged up from the spider attack. Chris and Hammett were able to carry them the rest of the way home. They felt relieved as they were back in familiar territory and safe. They put Rook and Wansnot down to rest up in the beds to fully recover. Once Wansnot felt better, he got up and both him and Hammett packed up their bags with sellable goods and left New Raleigh to go to the nearby way station. It was a short run to the store, and while Wansnot was selling some of their stuff, Hammett found his way over to the plastic surgeon to change his name and appearance to my friend Mac, who has his own YouTube channel that you should totally check out. While his name changed from Hammett to Mac, he still shared the same passion to be rid of the slavers and fight for Rook's cause. They arrived back to their base that evening and they celebrated the night with Fravatar and Tao while exchanging stories of their adventure to the Ashlands and Rook's encounters. Early the next morning, the adventurers said their goodbyes and left again for another expedition. Before the whole Bugmaster debacle, they were quite interested in seeing what was at the coast. Rook thought it was about time that they go that way. Things were going well and when they looked at their map, they were almost there. They finally arrived but the views weren't quite what they were hoping for. A raging dust storm was obstructing their vision and they were just following the coast in hopes to find something interesting. When the storm cleared, Rook took a minute for the others to soak in the view of the water while he plotted their way to some nearby ruins that he discovered on one of his maps. As they got closer, they could see it at the top of the steep hill. Rook wanted to play it safe so the men hid away from the structure while Rook snuck his way over. He ran up the ramp and encountered a locked gate preventing him from entering the building. Rook was so used to picking locks that he unlocked the door almost instantly. Excited to see what was inside, he crept into the opening as quietly as he could. Upon entering the lab, he realized that not only was this place not abandoned, but it was completely crawling with security spiders. Oh, but it also had some potential loot on the third floor. This place was way too heavily guarded to simply sneak in though. Rook had a different plan to mind and decided to do a madman's dash to the top of the lab while alerting as many security spiders as he could and once he had everything's attention, he would lure them outside of the lab to clear out the area. He got caught up in the ramp on his way down, and he definitely took some nasty blows, but he evaded the rest of their attacks. For the most part, his plan seemed to work as they chased him down the ramp outside of the lab. Rook was much faster than them, and once he got them far enough away, he took off back into the lab and began sneaking as soon as he broke their line of sight. 
The plan worked exactly how he was hoping and the safe was left completely exposed. The safe creaked open and inside, it had some items of interest. Most notably was an AI core that they could definitely use so he quickly packed that into his bag. He didn't have much time so he moved to the next locked box and picked it open too. Not much inside but there was more to check. He almost finished picking open the last safe while the security spider was returning. It noticed him right as he picked the lock and started to attack. The timing was bad but Rook was still able to see all the goodies inside the ancient safe. He pocketed everything he could fit and he knew he had to get out of there now. He took a couple more blows while exiting the room but he broke free and made a mad dash out towards the exit again. He escaped and found his men again and they decided to go back to New Raleigh to plan where to explore next. It was a short trip but the other men were glad to see the adventurers return. Rook deposited their recent findings to the research bench. They had lots of goodies for unlocking new technology and immediately started using it to construct an ore drill. This would allow them to harvest iron within the safety of New Raleigh's walls and they could continue building up their base. The men discussed that Chris and Mac should remain at New Raleigh with Tao and Fravatar, while Wansnot and Rook remained together to go out for other expeditions. This way they could maximize building up their resources back home. The two of them were going to travel northeast and see what this unexplored way station had to offer them. That night, they saw a large campground of men nearby. Upon further inspection, it was a large group of dust bandits, which would be a great way to train their new weapons. The fragmented axe was much heavier than Rook's falling sun, and Wansnot could definitely use more practice with his Nadachi. A lone dust bandit saw the two men and was foolish enough to approach them without calling for backup. Before Wansnot could even land a hit, Rook hit him twice and the bandit crumbled to the ground. Filled with confidence, Rook led a charge into the rest of the bandits and they went into a full assault. Wansnot quickly realized that he wasn't skilled enough to take on this many men at once. Rook quickly realized that the fragmented axe was still too heavy for him to use against a large group of men. He was getting swarmed with hits before he could even try to swing his weapon. And while Wansnot was getting some good hits in during the fight, he wasn't doing enough damage and Rook was getting overwhelmed. Rook yelled out at Wansnot to escape right before getting knocked out. Wansnot escaped and was able to sneak back in and rescue Rook. There were some unused camp beds right by the bandits and they were sneaky enough to use the bandits own camp to rest up. Wansnot traded weapons with Rook. The fragmented axe was extremely powerful, but equally as heavy and wasn't useful for either of them right now. When Rook healed up, he came back at the bandits with a vengeance. The Nadachi was crafted with such great quality and was much lighter than his falling sun. It felt much more natural to him as he was cutting through the men. After Rook had their attention, Wansnot came in to try and help. He wasn't able to do much with the heavy fragmented axe, but at least he would train up his strength. All the while, Rook made quick work of the other men. They healed up and in almost no time, they found another group of dust bandits. Time to train some more. Rook was lightning fast with the Nadachi and was inflicting massive damage to the men. Wansnot was trying to focus on the bowmen and was taking a lot of hits and not doing too much else. At least he was helping cover Rook while he took care of the other men. After taking out the first group of bandits, Rook went over to back Wansnot up. When Rook got the bowmen into melee combat, they were practically worthless and he cut them down like paper. After the battle was over, Rook noticed that Wansnot got pretty banged up that fight. Oh man, are you okay, Wansnot? Rook pulled the arrows out of his armor and tended to his wounds. They needed to get Wansnot a better weapon if the two of them were going to travel together. Wansnot wasn't much help when he had a weapon that was unusable. He scooped Wansnot up and took him straight back to New Raleigh to recover and equip new gear. When they returned, Rook laid Wansnot down in a bed to rest up and he realized that if he wanted to get strong enough to use a fragmented axe, he would need to train up his strength. They had very high quality and very heavy Holy Nation armor and Rook decided that wearing this heavy equipment would help him build his strength and it would be kind of funny to be dressed up as his enemy. The armor fit him well and he told Wansnot he was ready to start building up his strength and become proficient with the fragmented axe. Well, it was definitely heavier and he was a little slower in this armor too. They decided they would try and make it towards the unexplored way station again and left New Raleigh. As they got closer to the way station, they entered a place called the Deadlands. As soon as they walked into this area, they were greeted with acid rain pouring down on them. They agreed that they could push through this area and find safety if they could move fast enough, so Rook picked up Wansnot and plotted towards a nearby outpost for coverage from the rain. Rook made it to the entrance and opened the door. He casually walked in and realized it was completely surrounded by security spiders. Again. The place was completely swarmed with these things, but he also noticed a safe right by him. He decided he was going to use the same tactic as he did earlier and lure the spiders away from the base and claim his treasure. It worked as they followed him outside of the outpost. He circled back around and entered it again. He snuck in and began picking the lock. What they didn't realize was that there was another security spider that remained inside and it saw him. It rushed Rook while he was trying to pick the lock and immediately started hitting him hard. Wansnot got down and they began fighting off the spider. It was relentless though. In a sudden flash, 
Rook felt excruciating pain in his left arm. At least, where his left arm used to be. The security spider hit him with such force that it completely severed Rook's left arm. Wansnot could see the panic in Rook's eyes. He was in shock of what just happened, so he called out to Rook for them to run. They'd be killed if they stayed any longer. All that for a stupid safe, he thought to himself as he was struggling to remain conscious. He tried to focus ahead on Wansnot as the burning rain was falling on them. He wasn't sure if he was going to make it out of here alive. Rook was fading in and out of consciousness. He finally came to and realized he was stripped out of the Holy Nation armor he was previously wearing and he was resting comfortably in a bed. He still felt a jolt of pain running through where his left arm used to be. It was a strange sensation feeling the phantom of a limb that no longer existed. But what happened? His memory started coming back. He remembered running away, hot acid rain pouring over his body and feeling panicked. Wansnot was ahead screaming at him to keep focused on him while they ran. That's when things went dark. He must have passed out from the blood loss then. He was lucky to have his friend Wansnot with him. He must have carried Rook back to New Raleigh and tended to his wounds there. Rook would have to thank him for saving his life when he bumped into him again. He was happy that they stripped off the heavy armor he was wearing. The whole idea of training his strength that way was a foolish decision in the first place. He felt well rested now and was able to get back up. Rook remembered something from long ago that would come in handy now. Back when he captured the Cannibal Grand Wizard, he remembered that he found a masterwork skeleton arm from their capital and he kept it in storage ever since. There it was in the chest, waiting for him all this time. Rook studied it for a minute until he finally attached it to where his real arm used to be. The masterwork limb gripped onto his shoulder and forced the connection of nerves to the wiring. The pain was immeasurable for a few seconds and then subsided once the automatic connection finished. Just like that, Rook was fully functional again with his newly equipped skeleton arm. It felt different but it was fully functional. He'd just need a little bit of time getting used to it. Now that he took care of that issue, he wanted to get dressed. He found his old outfit tucked away in the other building and he suited back up. It felt good being back in his old clothes. He thought the skeleton arm was a pretty good look for him too. He found Wansnot and thanked him for saving his life. Wansnot's response was that Rook saved his life first from miserable slavery. They can consider themselves even now. They both laughed as they left the gates of New Raleigh prepared for another expedition. This time, they were heading west where some ruins were marked off on an island off the coast. They arrived in no time and they began to make their way into the water to swim to their destination. They were very unpleasantly surprised when they dipped in and realized the shore was all acid. They both yelped in pain and then scurried back to shore. Rook saw that a little further out, the ocean turned back to regular water, so he told Wands not to wait at the shore while he made the painful swim across. It was an unpleasant swim, but he easily made it to the regular water and kept heading to the ruins. Wansnot wanted to play it safe and crept up to some high ground where he could remain hidden with a good vantage point. Rook made it to the abandoned ruins and found some chests. Inside one, he found a masterwork skeleton leg that might be useful in the future. He stuffed it into his bag and kept exploring. He found another locked box and inside were some very valuable engineering research documents. This could advance their technology significantly back home. He stuffed them and other valuables into his bag until he couldn't carry any more. Nothing else of interest was over there, so Rook made a quick swim back to Wansnot. The two men sat down and looked over their map for nearby points of interest. Wansnot asked what all the gray surrounding the city of Mongrel was, and he said he would like to explore that area. Rook was much stronger than his past self that explored the Fog Island solo, and he thought it might be a good idea to help train Wansnot, so they set their destination for Mongrel next. It's been a long time, but Rook finally returned to the dangerous Foggy Valley. The two men felt anxious as their vision slowly closed in from the thickening fog surrounding them. Suddenly, Rook stopped Wansnot. A silhouette through the mist was ahead of them. They got ready to attack the Fogman. Alone, these creatures were weak. They took it out without any issue. But in large groups, these things were quite dangerous and the two men just attracted a whole group of them. They got back to back and stayed close together while fending off the mindless Fogman. Rook was much more prepared this time and having Wansnot at his side made things much easier. It took some time, but they cleared out the entire camp. They wanted to play it safe, so they made their way back to Mongro to heal up. On their way back, they encountered another group. But these weren't the scrawny, weak fogmen that Rook was used to. These were fog heavies, which were much stronger than their regular counterparts. They were holding their own against them. That was until a full group of normal fogmen diverged onto the two men. Rook knew that this was too much for them and yelled out to Wans not to fall back. He started limping his way back to Mongrel, but more Fogmen were trying to prevent him from leaving in one piece. Rook yelled out, provoking the Fogmen to attack him instead. He hoped this would buy Wansnot enough time to escape safely. He held them long enough and retreated himself. He caught up to Wansnot and carried him back to Mongrel. 
He sighed with relief as they made it through the city's gate in one piece. He found the closest bar with available beds and paid for the two of them to rest. Wansnot was mostly healed up, and as he woke up, he spotted an interesting looking man from afar. Wansnot caught up to the man and began to speak with him. Hey there. The old man was barely able to stand and looked severely annoyed with Wansnot speaking to him. The only logical thing Wansnot knew what to do was to berate hey. him with back to back hey, questions. Uh, hey! Wait. Oh, hey. The hey. only logical hey. thing to do now was oh, to hey. continually badger him Hello. to join their cause hey. and go back with them to New Raleigh. Oh, hey. After enough pestering, the man got fed up and decided to join their party. Hey. Like all members of Rook's cause, he found his way to the Shinobi's Thieves Guild and spoke with the plastic surgeon. Before becoming a member of New Raleigh, he was almost crippled and went by the name Crumble John. But after joining the men, his name was changed to my good buddy Ryan, and he felt 30 years younger, and looked it too. He went to the other men and they gave him a new weapon that he could actually wield, and a much nicer fragmented axe, per his request. Now that they had a new recruit, they decided it was time to leave the Fog Islands and return home. As they were leaving, Wansnot was approached by another man who had a desperate look in his eyes. He confessed that he was an escaped slave from the Holy Nation and was almost killed during his getaway. Wansnot smiled and told him that he was in luck. He couldn't have run into a better group of men and offered him to join them. He simply went by the name Purple, after my friend Purple Cucumber from my Discord server. With a stroke of luck, they recruited a second man to Rook's cause. They grouped up and continued moving south. That was until they got jumped by another group of Fogmen. Normal men, like Ryan and Purple that weren't trained, were very vulnerable to a group of these things. Rook and Wands not tried their best to protect them. Purple was knocked out and one of the Fogmen picked him up to carry him away. Rook was trying to get them to focus on him while Wands not went to rescue Purple. Both Ryan and Purple were knocked unconscious, but Rook and Wands not managed to kill off the remaining Fogmen. After healing up, Ryan awoke and decided to carry Purple back to Mongrel to recover and try again once everyone was back in good shape. Once they returned to the city, a strange Hiver approached Ryan as he was heading to the bar to rest up. The Hiver kept shouting, Beep! After a brief conversation, the Hiver explained how he wanted to become a powerful warrior, but was banished for being worthless. Now, Ryan only knew Rook for a short period of time, but he knew misfits and people looking to better themselves were exactly who Rook was recruiting and offered the Hiver to join their squad. Ryan continued to the bar and both men began resting up. The Hiver went by the name Beep. Go figure. But like all that joined Rook, he saw the plastic surgeon and changed the name to Awinger, after my Discord member. Now before everyone comments about why I changed Beep's name, keep in mind that I didn't know about the Kenshi subreddit's weird fascination of memes about Beep when I played through this. Sorry, not sorry. But please keep watching my videos, I'm desperate for views. Anyways, Awinger went to the bar and met the other men. Rook woke up from his slumber and welcomed him to the group before laying back down. They had a long trip ahead of them after all. That night, the men were prepared to finally try and leave the Fog Islands. Rook never expected to recruit three new men in the span of a day, and he knew that it could be challenging to travel with three fresh recruits. They tried to take high ground outside of the fog and got by without encountering any Fogmen. In fact, they only ran into one encounter of starving bandits, and they were able to take them out in no time. This even gave the recruits a chance to hone their combat skills. And just like that, they arrived at the gates of New Raleigh. Hey, get out of here! Rook gathered everyone in New Raleigh together, and they took some time getting to know each other a little more. During their time breaking bread with one another, Rook kept Wansnot, Mac, and Purple with him as adventurers and tasked out jobs for the rest of the men to tend to their home while they went on their next expedition. This time, they would travel east again and see what this landmark on his map was. Tengu's Vault. It most certainly sounded promising. Rook wanted to take everyone with him, but he knew that too many untrained men in the group would be too overwhelming. He would continue taking them in smaller groups and help them train while they explored the land. The men were passing through the Deadlands again, and Rook felt a bit of PTSD while hot acid rain fell on him. They discovered a nearby location called the Scrap House right outside of the Black Desert City. It sounded like an interesting detour, so they set that location as a quick checkpoint. They realized a city that constantly had acid rain pouring on it was not really a great place for humans, and the Black Desert City had none. It was habited only by skeletons, but they stopped at the bar to get out of the burning rain for a bit. This is when Rook saw a lone skeleton sitting at a table. It felt like it was emitting a sad aura around it, so Rook decided to strike up a conversation with it. The skeleton went by the name Sad Neil and was indeed a pessimistic character. Bored by life, it just sat there sulking. Rook offered for it to join them and he would add some excitement in its life. He explained his cause to stand up against the Holy Nation. After some persuading, Sad Neil finally accepted his offer and joined their team as well. He was not terribly enthusiastic about it. I hate my life. Rook saw the scrap house not too far outside of the city and told the other men to wait for him while he checked it out. 
As he went into the upper room, he saw what looked like a large armory surrounded by lots of skeletons and security bots. He approached the shopkeeper and to his surprise, they had a massive stock of weapons available to purchase, including a... Oh, a falling sun. It was beautiful, but also way more expensive than he could afford. Disheartened, he walked off but noticed some weapon crates near the shadows. Rook did what Rook does best and he picked the lock while hiding in the corner. And there it was. Another falling sun that was ripe for the pickings. Wansnot was summoned and he made his way to the scrap house to meet Rook. He went upstairs and saw Rook motioning for him to act nonchalant. Wansnot was a little concerned but casually walked over. Rook handed him a bunch of weapons that were too big for him to store in his own bag and when Wansnot tried to ask what was going on, Rook simply shushed him and said to hold still. After Rook grabbed the falling sun, they left the scrap house acting like nothing ever happened. Rook felt like he was having a reunion with an old friend. It wasn't his falling sun, but it would be a fine replacement. After they met up with the other men, Rook and Wansnot distributed new and improved weapons to all of them. They might not be the best trained fighters, but at least they would have better than average weapons to give them a slight advantage. Their time at the Black Desert City was over, and they began making their way towards the vault marked on Rook's map. There it was. Off in the distance, they saw a structure up on a hill. Upon closer inspection, the entrance appeared to be heavily guarded though. Rook told the other men to wait back while he approached the soldiers himself. As he got closer, the guards told him that this was a secure area and if they did not leave immediately, it would be trouble for them. These guys were a bit stronger than Rook's group, so they decided it would be best to comply with their orders and went east towards the city of Hang located on their map. Rook began exploring this great desert before he rescued Tao, Wansnot, and Fravatar. He was excited to continue his exploration with the other men. They arrived to Hang quickly enough and Rook approached the front gate to make sure they were permitted to enter. The guard gave him a nod of approval and he proceeded to enter the city. There was a Shinobi Thieves Tower here and Sadnir went in for some changes. In a few minutes, he went by the name Rockius after one of my patrons. After Rockius was taken care of, the men were mingling at the bar while Rook went through the town and explored. He found an interesting looking trader's market and as he was looking around at their wares, he noticed a little nook in the corner of their building that had some locked away goods. Rook ran past the guard who seemed to be zoning out and snuck into where the safe was located. He picked open the lock and found some extremely valuable leviathan pearls inside. He was very pleased with his findings and took some time to see what else was there. Rook rummaged through the other chests and didn't find much else of interest outside of those pearls. He fit as many as he could in his bag. The United Cities weren't really any better than the Holy Nation anyways, and they could use that to help fund New Raleigh. Rook snuck out and found the Trader's Guild headquarters nearby. He decided to go in and see what he could find. On the third floor, he found a hiver by the name of Yamdu. Yamdu looked after his master's business and seemed to be very well educated around the topics of other factions. Rook figured it couldn't hurt to ask and told him about his mission to take down the Holy Nation. Yamdu lit up at Rook's claim and agreed that the Holy Nation was a good target to be removed. His reasons were slightly different from Rook's though. What Yamdu proposed was something Rook never considered, using the Shek to wage war on them directly and crush them while they did nothing. Rook continued listening and Yamdu explained that the Stone Golem was the only one holding the Shek back from going to war with the Holy Nation directly. If Rook was to assassinate her, he would unleash a great war between the two factions and greatly weaken, if not completely wipe out the Holy Nation. Yamdu looked at Rook and told him, to destroy the Holy Nation, you must kill the Stone Golem. Rook grew quiet and thanked Yamdu for his time. He left the HQ and went to meet with the others. He found himself lost deep in his thoughts. He could wage a war and destroy his enemy without having to endanger any of his men, but he would have to murder an innocent Shek woman and have countless Shek die for a cause he'd be responsible for. Was this price too high to pay? Brook returned to the other men. He didn't want to disclose this information with them yet. He discreetly handed Wansnot the four Leviathan pearls and told him not to ask any questions. Wansnot rolled his eyes and snuck them into his bag. Brook found Admag on his map, the Shek capital where Asada, the stone golem, resides. The men could tell Rook was lost in thought and all of a sudden, Rook told the men to gather their things. They were leaving. Rook had a lot to consider moving forward. Rook's thoughts were weighed down with the information that Yamdu shared with him. He didn't speak too much to the other men as they were leaving town. While the men sensed something was off, they were still in high spirits and tried to encourage Rook to cheer up a little. He smiled at them and engaged in conversation, pushing his deeper thoughts of future hard decisions to the back of his head for the time being. They left Heng to travel north to another city called Heft as they continued exploring the Great Desert. Rook's mood quickly lifted while he ran through the dry desert and chatted with the other four men about their goals as they continued growing New Raleigh. 
Even Rockius, who was naturally a pretty big downer, seemed like his spirit was higher by the company of their traveling party. After running for a short period of time, they could see Heftoff in the distance, another city to explore that was owned by the United Cities, looking to see what they could find. Rook's men found the bar to rest and relax for a bit while Rook checked out the city's HQ. It was open to the general public and while Rook was looking around, he realized that Emperor Tengu resided here. Was this a Tengu of Tengu's vault? Was Heft the capital of the United Cities? Rook was feeling ballsy and decided to approach Tengu and see if he would speak with him. As he got closer, Tengu lazily looked him over with extreme disinterest. Suddenly, he got an excited look on his face. He saw that Rook was a fighter and he said he was waiting for a swordsman like him and how an ancient grieve wraith was plaguing his land. He tasked Rook on a quest to slay this monster and he would give him anything he wants. It all sounded bizarre, but he thought he would humor Tengu and ask what he needed to do. He continued to ramble on with a lot of nonsense and while Rook was drifting off, Tengu handed him a gross sack that he was to present to some kind of skeleton wizard or something. It emitted an unpleasant smell, but he put it in his backpack as he didn't want to offend this lunatic. Tengu bid him his farewell and began hacking and shaking uncontrollably. As he began coughing and wheezing, all the guards ran towards him and knocked Rook out of the way while they were trying to get the royal seal. Rook was equally as confused as he was disgusted. This was the Emperor of the United Cities, the one who let slavery run rampant as a vast trade. Rook was at a loss of words for what he just witnessed. This put him in a bad mood and despite the insane Emperor Tengu, he decided he would steal his goods. It's not like he would need them anyways. He was out of sight and he opened the chest that was full of food. His group was low on supplies so he figured it would stock up. His robotic arm was a little less subtle than the fleshy human arm and it made enough noise that he was noticed. Tengu yelled for the guards to arrest Rook so he took off running down the HQ as quickly as he could. A whole group of men followed him out of the entrance as he tried to escape. Rook continued running to the exit of Heft but two guards continued to pursue him. He figured he would lose him in the desert and meet back up with the others later on. There was a city across the Great Desert that he could easily go to and eventually shake these annoying guards. Tengu's guards were extremely persistent. Rook ran for hours and they still didn't let up. He finally lost them through Shobatai, and since he was out of the way, he thought he would check out this Fort Mirage that he saw marked on his map close by. As Rook ran down a large sand dune, he saw a lone structure hidden by the desert sands. The barracks was locked up, but he was curious as to what was inside, so he picked the lock and made his entrance. There was a man by the door, and he didn't seem very happy to see Rook come in unannounced. He yelled at Rook, but he smiled at the stranger and kindly greeted him, asking who they were. The man didn't take that very well and responded to Rook by lunging at him with his weapon. Big mistake. Rook blocked the attack and in one swing, the man toppled to the ground. Four more men ran over and attacked Rook before he could explain that this was just a big misunderstanding. When Rook fought, it was like his falling son became an extension of himself as he would gracefully swing the giant blade down on his enemies, taking more than one person out in a single blow. These guys didn't really stand a chance against Rook. He kept trying to talk them down from attacking him, but they wouldn't let up. The final opponent lost his arm to Rook before he took him out. It was much quieter now in the hideout, and he checked out Lord Mirage's loot. He had rolls of cats in his pockets, and Rook figured he would take it as an inconvenience fee for attacking him on sight. Rook was examining the area until he heard more footsteps approaching him. Another man came running at him ready to strike. He let out another sigh and approached his opponent. He melted like butter under Rook's first swing. Another man came down to face him. Why were they coming at him one at a time? The other fighters got up to join him. They were able to land some blows on Rook during the fight, but they were attacking him with metal pipes. Rook's body was hardened and tough from all of his combat experience up to this point. These metal pipes hardly phased him. The last man fell to Rook's mighty fallen son. The United Heroes League were now hostile towards Rook. Go figure. He tended to his bruises and searched the building. There wasn't really anything of interest here, and he realized it was past due time for him to meet back up with the others now. He ran out the front door and began running through the Great Desert again. It was a desolate place, but it had a certain beauty to it, he thought to himself as he ran through the large sand dunes. He ran south until he met up with the other men outside of the city of Strote. This was the final city they were going to visit before heading back west towards New Raleigh. There was nothing of interest here, so they left right away. They continued moving west until they saw a small way station on their way and stopped for a brief visit. Rook met with Mac by the shopkeeper and told him to try and sell some of the Leviathan pearls. He was able to sell one, but these pearls fetched such a high price that they couldn't afford any more of them. They would just have to find another place to sell their goods, Mac told Rook with a smile. Rook told him that they would need to head back to New Raleigh and sell them at the way station there, but he wasn't going with them. Rook let the men know that he was going to continue exploring other areas while they went back home to further develop New Raleigh. They knew better than to object Rook's decision and they said their goodbyes and parted ways. As they were leaving, Rook found an unexplored outpost further east and marked that as his current destination. He wanted to use this time to clear his head and consider his plan moving forward. That was until he entered Venge and almost got obliterated by a beam of light falling from the sky. 
As he continued traveling, he saw a settlement nearby. He's never met any Reavers before. He immediately regretted his decision as he approached the gate and one of the guards ran up to him claiming that they were chaos and he began opening fire at him with a crossbow. Rook made a mental note. Reavers are bad. Good to know. He took off running and continued towards the outpost further into the unexplored land. He hoped he wasn't going to run into any more of those guys anytime soon. Instead, he saw something very interesting. Massive crabs fighting off men in the distance. Those things looked powerful and terrifying. He did his best to run past them unnoticed. The closer he got to the eastern coast, the more bizarre things were becoming. He discovered a nearby settlement and he detoured north to see what it was. As he got closer, he could see it looked like a small sea village, but there were more of those massive crabs. This was a town owned by the Crab Raiders. The name seemed fitting enough for them. He decided to risk approaching the crabs and ran into town. They seemed passive towards him, but the townsfolk kept criticizing him for not having his own crab. Rook wasn't sure if he was ready to crab up or not, but he thought he would explore the town and see what it had to offer. There was a crab smithy shop, so Rook ran in and checked it out. While browsing the store's wares, Rook saw that they carried something called crab armor. He recalled the men fighting with the giant crabs outside of town were wearing this armor and it looked incredible. Your entire body would be protected while wearing this thing, he thought to himself as he examined it. Rook smiled as he just had another one of his great ideas. The crab people seemed very uninterested in him and his lack of crab pets, so he used this opportunity to sneak into the corner of their shop and check out a safe. He casually picked the lock and slowly opened it to see what was inside. It was exactly what he was hoping for. There were blueprints for this amazing crab armor inside. The other men were still ignoring Rook, so he slowly pulled the blueprints out of the safe and into his bag before quietly shutting it back up. He saw that one of the pieces were missing, but he found it in another chest. He managed to steal it as well. He left the store and ran down the ramp. This was perfect. They could use these plans to manufacture their own armor for his men back in New Raleigh. In fact, it seemed like the perfect kind of armor to wear if you were to assault a force like the Holy Nation. Rook finally had a moment of clarity. This was the answer to his burning question. He began to make his way back west to New Raleigh to meet the other men. Wamsnot, Mac, Purple, and Rockius were almost back there themselves. They spent some time recovering from their travels at Shark before they risked traveling through the dangerous swamp back to New Raleigh. Back home, the other men were doing well. Tal was at peace when he worked the fields to yield crops to feed the men. He was teaching Awinger the tricks of working the land. Hivers normally had a natural talent at farming. They were becoming good friends bonding as the only two Hivers of New Raleigh. Fravatar was becoming an exceptional cook as he would prepare all the crops into meals for everyone to eat. The three of them would joke that they were the backbone of New Raleigh. Without them, everyone else would starve to death. As their funds were growing, so were their supplies that they were slowly building up. It was time to expand their base even further with a new construction. They planned to use this as their armory. It was a large space and they furnished it with armor chests, weapon racks, and other places for storage. As Rook made his way back home, he discovered more locations that potentially had more treasure. He found a lone tower in a desolate area. It definitely looked promising. He easily picked the lock and the door slowly creaked open. Rook snuck inside. There was a small security spider nearby. He had to sneak past it. He went around the other side and began unlocking chests and digging through them. This chest had a particularly complex lock. He was excited to open it and see what contents were inside. The lock finally let loose and he opened it up. Inside was a masterwork dust coat. It was sleeveless, but the quality was exceptional. He quietly swapped coats and put his back into his bag. He was carrying too much loot, so he left the armored rags in the chest and continued to loot. He was feeling ballsy and tried to pick the lock right by the spider. This went about as good as he expected and the spider turned to attack him immediately. For such a small robot, that thing sure did pack a punch. His time there was finished and he took off running back to his home. He felt at peace with himself. He didn't know if he would have even been able to go through with trying to assassinate Osada, even if he wanted to use the Shek to fight the Holy Nation for him. But this wasn't their fight, it was his, and with this ability to mass produce crab armor for his men, he felt confident that they would be able to become strong enough and better geared to go head to head against the Holy Nation. He progressed a little further and discovered that a strange town was nearby. What made this town so strange? He had to investigate to see what this strange town was all about. He arrived and found out this place was called Flats Lagoon. He stopped to look it over. It sure didn't seem that strange from here. He entered Flats Lagoon and looked around the town for a bit. When he entered the bar, a Scorchlander man called Rook over to speak to him. He could tell by Rook's gear that he was an adventurer. He told Rook that he was an adventurer himself. Harry tells me you're quite the same. Adventurer. You know, I'm something of a adventurer myself. Through the conversation, the man explained his skills in unarmed combat and tried to brag about how close he was to entering the Ashlands. 
Rook smiled and told him that he's been to the heart of the Ashlands and back, and lived to tell the tale. The man was very impressed, and Rook used this opportunity to explain his cause to bring down the Holy Nation. The man paused for a moment to consider his decision. After some contemplation, he agreed to join Rook's team if he paid him 9,000 cats. Their funds were higher than normal, and he liked the idea of a martial artist being part of his group, so he agreed and they shook on his offer. The Scorchlander named Chad joined Rook. Rook promised him that they would one day take him to the Ashlands with them so he could see it for himself. They hung out for a little while longer, but it was time for Rook to take Chad back to his home at New Raleigh. He set it as their destination and they began traveling northwest. They stopped at a way station briefly where Chad visited a plastic surgeon. Like everyone who joins Rook's cause, he changed his name to Sparta, a new beginning for him as his story was now intertwined with Rook's. Back home, the men continued to prepare their armory with their own armor smithy. To craft their own armor, they would need to make their own armor plating. This new building would be their workshop and storage for their production. They quickly constructed their workstations and Ryan designated himself as New Raleigh's armor smith. This was a passion he always had but never pursued. None of the men were skilled in this trade, so he took this as an opportunity to learn the craft and begin building armor plates. Late that evening, Rook returned with Sparta and brought him in to meet the rest of the men. It felt good being home again and even better since Rook had a better plan with what their strategy would be moving forward. Something he didn't expect though was that the Holy Nation sent a large force to New Raleigh to try and sack their settlement. There were beast traders outside too, patiently waiting for them to open their gates to invite them in so they could sell their wares. The men were scared of the Holy Nation's forces, but Rook kept us cool. They would most likely attempt their attack during the day. The last time the Holy Nation attacked, they didn't have their walls to protect them and they were caught off guard. This time, Rook had an idea. First of all, he had Sparta trade his equipment with Fravatar. He wanted him to be weighed down so he could go up to the hub and train his martial art combat skills. As Sparta snuck out of the back gate, Rook told his men to wait for him inside the walls while he went out alone to lure the Holy Nation to him. He left the east gate open just long enough that the forces would approach it and try to get in. The gate closed before they could enter, but little did they know that a Shek patrol was also trying to pass through the gate. This is when the men noticed Rook was left outside, vulnerable to their attack. Before they could make a decision, Rook shouted out to the Shek, Our enemy is amongst us, fight with me, as he charged into the men. The Shek warriors turned on the Holy Nation. Rook bluffed with his charge and stayed back, luring only a few of the men towards him while the Shek fighters took on the rest of the men. Purple and Mac heard the commotion and ran to mount their gate's defensive turrets to pick them off from the wall. Rook fought off the two men that engaged with them easily enough. He saw that the Shek warriors were taking the brunt of the fighting and witnessed how powerful they truly were. In the corner of his eye, he saw the other merchants coming closer to the gate. This is what Rook was hoping would happen. The Holy Nation had a bad reputation with the nomads. They were considered outcasts that didn't worship Okran. As Rook ran to engage with the rest of the enemy forces, the merchants used this opportunity to help reinforce the men. Not only that, but skin spiders were being drawn to the bloodshed too. It was chaos outside of the gates of New Raleigh. The Holy Nation forces expected to break their walls and pillage Rook's home. Instead, they were surrounded by multiple different groups that came together, overwhelmed their unit, and crushed them into submission. Rook was back to back with a Shek warrior, fighting off the remaining paladins. He could hear the sounds of bolts being fired from Mac and Purple who were still manning the turrets on the wall. Rook moved up the steps towards the gate and took down the remaining Holy Nation paladins that still stood. With the help of the other men, they crushed the Holy Nation assault with minimal damages received. He thanked the men and welcomed them to New Raleigh as the gates opened back up. Rook ran inside to rest and recover from the battle. To celebrate, they offered their newfound allies food and shelter for the day to show their gratitude. While all this was going on, Sparta was further north fighting a group of starving bandits he encountered. It didn't go that well. Once he regained consciousness, he walked to Squin and rented a bed for the day so he could rest. The idea of wearing armor that could increase his toughness at the expense of his combat skills sounded good for training in theory, but it was just too difficult for his current skill level. Meanwhile, Ryan was honing his skills and crafting equipment for the men, and he sewed Sparta a martial arts outfit. This would help improve his martial arts skills much more than Fravatar's armor did. He felt much more comfortable and confident in this outfit, so Rook escorted Sparta back out of the safety of the walls of New Raleigh to the hub so he could continue his training against starving bandits as he improved his fighting technique. Sparta knew that Rook was a powerful warrior. He wanted to become as strong as him one day. Until then, he had to keep training. Ryan had devoted all of his free time to mastering the art of armor smithing. He was excited by the crab armor plans that Rook brought back with him and was able to craft higher quality versions of it now. Fravatar was chosen as the first man to gear up in the first set of equipment. He was quite excited. Ryan worked hard on crafting the set of armor and after many hours of working in the smithy, it was finished. 
Fravitar anxiously put the last piece of the set on his legs and went back out to work. It was heavy armor, but it offered excellent protection and coverage. Rook parted ways with Sparta and continued north back to World's End. He entered the front gate with a specific goal in mind. Mac had a masterful ranged weapon that he found quite some time ago, but they had no bolts for ammunition. He thought he remembered them selling the blueprints on how to craft these bolts here at World's End. In order to build an army and properly equip them, they would need to be able to craft their own supplies. He found a specialty ranged weapon shop at the back of town. He entered and spoke with the vendor. They only had one research blueprint, and it was specifically for the heavy bolts that Mac's weapon required. He purchased it and thanked the man. This brought him one step closer to what they needed. They would be able to begin manufacturing ammunition immediately. Mac would be pleased. Rook looked over his map to return home, but he had a realization. The Holy Nation attacked them yet again, and he wouldn't let that stand. He saw a location on his map in their territory called Narco's Trap. Rook was going to take the fight to them and see what he could do on his own. He thanked the shopkeeper and left. His time at World's End was over for now. On his way there, he noticed another landmark on his map called Okren's Fist. This was closer than Narco's Trap, and Rook wanted to investigate these areas and see what was there. He set course to Okren's Fist and left the mountains where World's End sat. He arrived at his destination at midnight. It was a small fortress. It looked like it was well guarded, but Rook was a master of stealth. Maybe he could sabotage this outpost and slightly weaken the Holy Nation. He felt a little uneasy going in alone, but he was tired of sitting back idly and letting the Holy Nation try to bully his men into submission. Using the darkness of the night as his cover, he successfully snuck past the guards and the other soldiers patrolling the perimeter. There were more men here than he initially expected. Rook ran into a nearby building that was completely empty. He got through safely. After taking a moment to regain his composure, Rook began to stealthily move to the next building. He stepped inside unnoticed but paused. A whole group of men were sleeping past the entryway. He wanted to play it safe and explore his surroundings before doing anything too reckless, so he snuck back outside, weaving through the shadows and buildings until he entered what looked like a small weapon storage. Maybe he could snag some good loot, he thought to himself. But as he ran past the door, he realized a guard was stationed here, and he ran right into him. He sprinted past him into the end of the hall and engaged the Holy Sentinel. He blocked Rook's swing and yelled out in his counterattack. This raised the alarm and he heard more men running to his location. This wasn't good. Rook was locked in combat with him and he was certain that more men were coming from his only exit. He tried to bring the sentinel down before reinforcements arrived, but he couldn't do enough damage. Three more soldiers poured into the weapon storage and surrounded Rook. It was time to get serious. He was able to block most of their attacks, but they still landed blows on Rook. He continued to focus on the guard he already weakened. He had to take these guys out before more came. He kept his back against the wall so he couldn't get fully surrounded by the men. The arc of every swing from the falling sun was huge. He was able to hit three or even all of them in one attack. Half the men fell to the ground. The other two pushed him against a safe and got some good hits on him again. If he got knocked out, he was finished. He kept focusing on the final men. One more fell. Just one guy left and he was in the clear. Well, that was until a passing guard heard the commotion and ran in to investigate and join the combat. Rook was determined though. He was hurt, but it wasn't critical. He took another down. Hopefully this was the last guy. They locked swords in a brief duel before Rook slammed his weapon into the sentinel's side and he crumbled to the ground. Rook's adrenaline was pumping. For taking out five Holy Nation guards, he didn't suffer too much damage. He quickly patched up his wounds and prepared himself to see what else he could sabotage here. He snuck into another barracks where more paladins were sleeping. Rook had the bright idea of knocking each of the men out while they slept and stealing their equipment. He ran up to the first paladin and swung his arms as powerfully as he could. It was a dull thud and he knew he was knocked out cold. He did not think a high paladin would fall for the same ploy, so he went over to the next paladin. Rook swung his arms down, but he bumped his target's bed which caused him to wake up. The paladin yelled out and the rest of the men jumped to their feet. Rook knew that this was too much and it was time for him to make his exit. The men leapt out of bed and tried to surround Rook, but he was too fast. He sprinted towards the gate as the men were following closely behind, screaming at him. The men at the gate didn't notice him yet. He used this opportunity to his advantage as he braced his shoulder and ran through the group of them. He heard bolts being shot at him from the walls, but he was fortunate and escaped without getting harmed. He laughed to himself as he made it up to the hill beyond Okren's fist. He was in the clear, at least he thought he was. As he knelt down to patch himself up, he saw that a large group of them followed him to the outskirts of their base. Rook wanted to be the one sending a message this time. Instead of running, he turned to fight. He could take them on. More of the men were pouring in around him though. Maybe he bit off more than he could chew. If his attacks landed, they did massive damage to his targets, but there are so many of them, he had trouble blocking all the incoming attacks. By now, Rook was very familiar with this deadly dance of steel. He would gracefully maneuver between the men, regaining his composure quickly if they struck him with their weapons. He managed to take two of them down with one swing. Good. 
He only needed to do that a few more times and he would be in the clear. He missed his next attack and they all landed hits on him. He really felt that one. To make matters worse, he heard more reinforcements through the trees coming for him. This was too much. He had to retreat. His left leg was pretty banged up and he was slowed down. The men were in hot pursuit trying to chase him down. He couldn't get caught. No, he wouldn't get caught, he told himself as he heard footsteps of a holy sentinel closing in on him. Rook's left leg was wounded to the point where he couldn't outrun the paladins. He heard a man shouting at him from behind as he slowly closed the gap between them. It was only one man, so it seemed like a good opportunity to take him out quickly and continue his escape. He turned, blocked the paladin's swing, and hit him with a strong counterattack. Rook was overwhelming his enemy with powerful blows. He saw another wounded paladin in the corner of his eye approaching the combat too. He could handle these two men easily. Rook wasn't concerned anymore. The next attack was so strong that it severed the paladin's arm. He was in a state of shock until Rook's falling son hit him again and he crumbled to the ground. The other paladin cursed at him and raised his guard. Rook was having trouble getting past his defensive stance to take him out. This is when Rook noticed more reinforcements were heading his way. He wasn't sure if he could take them all on in his current physical state and he couldn't let them capture him. He made the decision to get out of there. As soon as he turned to run, the paladin struck his left leg and wounded Rook to the point where he could barely even walk. He turned, knowing he had to fight them now. There was no way he could outrun them. Rook was beginning to worry a little as they were whittling him down slowly, but he managed to take out another paladin. Another one recovered and continued fighting Rook. They were almost as banged up as Rook and he could see the worry in their faces, just like his. The men alternated fighting with Rook and giving first aid to their wounded men. As the combat continued, Rook was hopeful that he'd be able to hold his ground and take out the remaining Holy Nation guard. That's when he saw another full group of reinforcements coming to support the other men. Rook knew his limits. It was foolish, but he had to try and escape. He stepped back and started to leave. Right as the paladin he was locking blades with began to pursue Rook, the other men called out for him to stand his ground and help with the wounded. The paladin spit in Rook's direction and gave him a devious smile while the other men whispered to the paladin. Rook couldn't hear what they were saying, and at this point, he didn't really care. As he slowly got some distance between the men, he heard the paladin yell out saying he'll pay for what he's done. And just like that, the men left Rook to escape. He wasn't sure why they did that, but he had to find some place safe to rest up. He was finally in the clear and patched up his wounds. He was in no state to explore Holy Nation territory, so he decided to travel back to World's End again and rest up. He made it there safely and immediately found the bar with some available beds on the rooftop. He paid for the rent one laid down. He was quite tired after that whole ordeal. Rook slept the entire day and felt much better as he got up late that evening. Okrin's fist was quite the little fortress, but he wasn't sure what Narco's trap could be. He was going to investigate it next. He ran out of World's End and thanked the barkeep on his way out. It was time to explore hostile territory once again. While traveling to Narco's trap, he discovered an outpost called Okrin's Shield nearby. It was closer to him than his original destination, so he decided he would make a quick detour and see what this place was first. He arrived soon after and saw it was a large base split into two halves. There were lots of men patrolling the area too. Rook felt like this was too big of a risk to explore and if he got caught, he wasn't certain he would make it out safely. For now, he was just gathering intel on the Holy Nation's forces. He planned to sneak around the base and continue his way south and check out Narco's trap. Using darkness as his cover before the sun rose at dawn, he snuck past Okrin's shield without any issue. As he approached Narco's trap, he saw what looked like an ancient lab surrounded by a wall and a small outpost built right beside it. How peculiar, Rook thought to himself. What could they be hiding in there? There were lots of soldiers patrolling the area, but Rook was confident in his ability to sneak by unsuspecting guards. He ran past the men and began working the locked gate. He wanted to see what was inside. The lock came undone on his first try and he opened up the gate slowly to avoid drawing any unwanted attention towards him. As soon as it was opened, he ran through and up the ramp to the building. Another locked gate. Whatever was in here, the Holy Nation wasn't hiding it, they were securing it. It was a basic lock, nothing Rook couldn't handle, so he worked it open and snuck inside. The very first thing he ran into was a security spider patrolling the area. Rook wasn't a fan of them ever since his last encounter and fortunately snuck past it. There were a lot of locked crates and containers here. The Holy Nation seemed to fear this old technology, but Rook was quite a fan of whatever treasures he could get his hands on. He found an ancient science book which they could use to research better tech back at New Raleigh. He continued looting the room while keeping an eye out for any patrolling security spiders. The ancient safe opened and Rook's eyes widened at the contents inside. 11 ancient science books and 2 AI cores. He just hit the jackpot. He stuffed all the research items into his bag and continued looting the other chests. He just had to be careful and not get caught. He patiently waited for the patrolling spider to leave and he continued searching this tower. His bags were completely full of research equipment at this point and since he couldn't care anymore, he thought it was best for him to finally return home. He plotted New Raleigh as his destination on the map and began navigating out of the ancient tower. 
It was always a good feeling to Rook when he successfully escaped unnoticed. Now, of course, as he was basking in the satisfaction of his findings, he ran straight into a patrolling Holy Nation guard that spotted him. He screamed out to the other soldiers and everyone closed in on him. Rook began to run away from their outpost as he felt a sudden impact in his left arm. A harpoon turret hit him and did significant damage. He hugged the wall to make sure they couldn't target him and he ran as fast as he could away from there. Rook was significantly faster than those men, he continued to increase his distance between the enemy. He could hear them cursing Rook behind him. They sure were persistent, but the men eventually gave up their chase and returned back to their post. Rook continued moving south, right into an incoming dust storm. If anyone was still tracking him, they'd most certainly lose him now. Rook caused quite a lot of trouble for the Holy Nation recently. Maybe they'd think twice about sending an attack force to New Raleigh again. Towards the end of the day, Rook finally returned home. Nothing felt more comforting than running through the gates in New Raleigh and seeing his friends that he'd rescued and recruited. It was always a pleasant feeling. He had to take care of a few small errands now that he was back. First of all, he found enough circuit boards at Narco's Trap to finish the construction of their own skeleton repair bed. This was a great addition to their base. He also took all of his science books and AI cores that he found and placed it into their research bench. Rook's findings would allow them to kickstart more advanced research technology. He knew that his men had to become stronger if they were ever going to take on the Holy Nation. Rook wouldn't win this war off his skills alone. His current method of training his men was taking them on expeditions with him, but it was inefficient and slow. Rook thought of an idea on how he could help them build up their skills much faster. He told Mac that they were going on a trip together. Mac really enjoyed traveling outside the safety of New Raleigh with Rook, and ever since Rook got the blueprints to make heavy bolts, he had virtually unlimited ammunition too. He was their best shot with the crossbow after all. Why do I get the little cigarettes? Yeah, boy. The east gate slowly opened as a dust bandit's limp corpse rolled down the ramp from the wall. Just the leftovers of some local riffraff trying to cause some trouble. The gate shut behind them and Rook smiled at Mac and told him how they were going back to the Ashlands for something important, but he needed Mac's help for it. His skill with the crossbow would definitely come in handy. Before they journeyed all the way to the Ashlands, Rook wanted to stop by the scrap house shop in the Black Desert City first to see what inventory they had. They set it as their destination and began sharing stories while they traveled. They arrived with no issue and Mac approached the vendor to browse his wares. Their finest weapons were still too expensive to purchase, but he did find some blueprints for black and chain shirts. That would be a nice protective shirt to wear underneath the crafted crab armor. He also found a recipe for a dark leather shirt in case a chain shirt was too heavy. It wasn't much, but Ryan had more options for fully outfitting the men. They considered it a successful trip and continued towards Spring, which was just outside of the Ashlands. As they made their way southeast, they discovered an old control tower. Well, it looked interesting and it could have some nice treasure in it, so Mac volunteered to investigate. Mac wasn't exactly the stealthy type though, and as soon as he entered, he was greeted by a few hostile skeleton fighters. Though, from the looks of it, there was definitely some potential treasure on the other floors of this tower. Before he even ran into the tower, Rook told Mac to continue his trip towards Spring if he encountered anything bad, so he turned and made sure to get out of there before getting hurt. Rook was much stealthier and he approached the tower, prepared to hide in the shadows as he pilfered whatever goods he could get his hands on. He successfully made it in without drawing any attention to himself. He continued to evade the skeletons and made his way to the top floor where there were locked chests. Most locks he encountered were simple to pick open. He quietly searched through the chest and found some ancient science books and a few maps that might have new locations that he could mark off on his own map. He stuffed them into his pockets as quietly as he could and he took a moment to examine the locations on these maps. Eh, nothing too interesting. At least not when you're in the middle of infiltrating a hostile tower. He put the maps away and began working open the next lock. Inside this chest was a masterwork industrial lifter arm. That might come in handy in the future so he put it in his bag. Last but certainly not least was an ancient safe. Inside, he found another masterwork robotic limb and some AI cores. Another good find. He stuffed everything he could into his bag, and while he was beginning to make his sneaky exit, he noticed a skeleton locked up in the nearby cages. Out of curiosity, he went over to it. His name was Agnew. Agnew looked at Rook and roared. Rook tried to shush Agnew, but he just continued roaring and shaking around in the cage. It seemed like he couldn't properly communicate with Rook. He sensed that Agnew needed help. He was locked up in here, after all. Unfortunately, all the ruckus that Agnew made drew the attention of everyone in the tower. Rook had to get out of there for now. As he left the tower, he heard one of the skeletons speaking. Then he noticed that skeleton had a hefty bounty if it were captured and brought into the Holy Nation cities. Rook had an idea that would only be a slight detour of their original plans and Mac was summoned to come back to the tower where Rook was hiding. Mac reluctantly followed Rook's orders to cause a distraction and lure the skeletons out of the base, so he said a silent prayer to himself while running into the top floor of the tower. 
It looked like they were all aware of his presence, so he maneuvered through the angry robots as he began to make his exit. Somehow, he miraculously made it out with no harm and a huge line of skeletons were chasing him out of the area. While everyone was distracted and confused, Rook snuck back into the tower and immediately began working to free Agnew. He knew there were others close by and he worked as quickly as he could until he heard the lock snap and Agnew's cage opened up. Of course he roared with pleasure as he stepped out of the cage, which got the attention of everyone again. Rook started to escape and he yelled out to Agnew to hide and spring for the time being and he would meet them there later. Just like that, Agnew was part of Rook's crew. Rook turned to fight the skeletons for a moment to buy Agnew time to escape. Once he was in the clear, they both took off. While Agnew couldn't speak, Rook could sense joy coming from him as they ran through the last remaining skeletons and exited the tower. Who knows how long they had him locked up there. Once they were in the clear, Rook stopped Agnew and fixed up the damage he received while they escaped. Once he was fully repaired, Rook told him to meet Mac in Spring and he would join them soon. He had one last task he had to take care of first. He looked at his map and began sneaking back to the tower to collect his bounty. He arrived and it was late at night. That would work to his advantage. It was quite chaotic there. They weren't used to humans sneaking in and out of their tower causing all kinds of mischief like this. Rook found his target and before it noticed him, Rook's fist hit it hard enough in the head to shut it down temporarily. As he was about to pick his bounty up, he noticed it had a Meitu Grade Hold Saber. That was an unexpected bonus treasure for them. He disarmed the skeleton and scooped up its limp body from the ground. Checking his map, Brink was the closest United City's town nearby so he began making his way east. As he began running, the skeletons noticed him again and were baffled by Rook and his audacity to sneak in again and cause more problems. Rook slid past any opponent that got too close and exited down the ramp. Another successful bounty was about to be collected. He entered Brink by morning and all he was looking for was their police station. He wanted to be quick so he could meet back up with Mac and Agnew at spring. Rook located the station and brought his prize inside. He found the police chief and spoke with him. The chief took the skeleton from him and handed him a prize of 20,000 cats. Rook smiled as he examined his bag of money and put it into his pocket. It was time to get back to his original mission. Back in New Raleigh, Ryan was working hard at honing his skills as an armor smith. He completed another full set of crab armor too and decided it was time for him to suit up. There was a sense of great accomplishment as he donned the armor that he crafted with his own hands. It fueled Ryan's motivation to continue mastering his work. Rook arrived at Spring with no issues and met with Mac and Agnew. Agnew was told to wait at the bar until they returned. He roared and nodded his head, showing Rook that he understood his request. For the first time, Rook was taking Mac with him into the Ashlands. Mac still didn't fully understand what they were going to be doing, so Rook finally shared his plans in full. Now that they were able to build their own skeleton repair bed, they would be able to capture a strong skeleton fighter and keep it as a... a guest that they'd be able to spar with, like Rook initially did with a starving bandit long ago. The skeleton repair bed would be able to keep a robotic opponent in a good fighting condition almost constantly since it would be repaired very quickly. Rook was weary to do this alone though and Mac's ranged expertise would be able to help take their chosen target down more easily than Rook could do in solo combat. Unfortunately, Cat Lom was too strong for them to try and bother with. So they'd try and find another suitable skeleton to bring back home. Maybe they'd find some more valuable loot while they were there too. While they continued traveling south, they discovered a few outposts that Rook suspected belonged to the horrifying skin bandits, but then they discovered a particularly creepy outpost that was nearby. Rook had to investigate it, of course. He had Mac hide below the mountainside while Rook crept in to see what exactly this creepy outpost was. As he snuck down into the crater, he saw a collection of skin houses. This must be the center of the skin bandits' operations. The place was crawling with them, too. They patrolled the area with their loose flesh suits. It was a thing of nightmares. Further east, beyond the skin house HQ was a tower by the coast of the sea. It was dark out and Rook was confident he could pass through the skin bandits unnoticed. He moved as quickly as he could without drawing any attention to himself. One day, he thought, he's gonna pay a real visit to these skin bandits. He made it to the other side of the crater quickly enough and continued down towards the coast. He found a lone tower facing out to the sea. He crept up to the door and worked the lock open with ease. He quietly slid the door open and made his way inside. The tower seemed empty, but upon further inspection, there were watchbots stationed on turrets at the top of the tower. Good thing he was sneaking to the tower. Brooke wasn't here looking for a fight, though. He found a locked safe on one of the floors and focused all of his attention on it. This lock was more complicated than most, which made him excited for what might be inside. After he worked the lock open, the door slowly creaked and revealed its contents. There was a Masterworks Eagle Cross that looked like a great weapon. Sadly, Rook realized that this thing wasn't going to fit into his bag. He frowned as he put it back into the safe. However, he was able to take the Old World Bow MK2. 
Better than nothing, Rook thought as he closed up the safe as quietly as he could. Nothing else was of value, so Rook went to meet back up with Mac. He saw a warning that a retribution of God was moving towards New Raleigh. Rook wasn't entirely sure what that was, but he figured their walls would keep any unwanted guests out. He found Mac, who was very relieved to see Rook again, and they marked an unexplored Ashlands dome as their first destination. It was time that Rook returned to the Ashlands once again. Rook could see the look of awe on Mac's face, but he could also sense his fear. There was another Ashlands dome closer to their location, so they decided to check it out first. They could see remnants of a structure over the top of the hill they were about to cross. Inside of those ruins, there was another one of those domes. Rook asked Mac to wait outside while he ventured in. Mac laughed and said he had absolutely no problem with Rook's order. Rook was being stealthy and went inside. This dome seemed to be fully operational. It was filled with skeletons. The bottom floor was too crowded with them. There was no way he'd be able to search for loot down there. Rook was so good at blending in that he was able to sneak right past skeletons as he ran up the stairway to check out the rest of the dome. Well, it worked until it didn't, and they attacked him as soon as they realized there was a human in their midst. He locked blades with two of them, but took significant damage from one of the skeletons. He tried taking them on, but heard reinforcements coming up from the lower floors. Rook decided it would be safer to just make a run for it and try to escape. He dodged past them and spiraled down the staircase with a whole group of angry skeletons chasing after him. Max saw what was going on from afar, and even though he wasn't skilled in the art of stealth like Rook, he still hunkered down and tried not to be seen. Rook was faster than the robotic army, and they stopped chasing after him once he gained enough distance between them. Of course, Rook wasn't going to just stop there. After they all returned to their dome, he snuck back in for plan B. Rook stealthily took down the closest skeleton by the entrance. As it fell to the ground, Rook unplugged the CPU unit from its head, and it killed the robot instantly. For some reason, these ancient skeletons could be defeated by simply pulling these out quickly, shutting down their entire systems. It might be tedious work, but Rook was going to whittle this dome down until no skeleton was left standing. As he knocked another one out, he pulled the plug on it too, but a nearby patrol noticed him. Before he could even react, they knocked him out this time. They just wanted to be left in peace. They carried Rook's unconscious body outside of the dome's entrance and dropped him off there. To its surprise, as soon as it laid Rook on the soft ground, he sprung back up and attacked. Rook held his own just fine against one of these things. His final swing dropped the skeleton and set it to reboot. As soon as it fell on the soft ashen ground, Rook pulled out the CPU, shutting it down permanently. He was about to sneak back in, but noticed that one of these skeletons was the head of agriculture. It was a very powerful fighter too. Rook knew this personally because that was a skeleton that did so much damage to him when he was initially caught in this dome earlier. This was the one. Rook and Mac had to capture the head of agriculture and bring him back to New Raleigh alive. Back home, preparations were being made for Rook and Mac's return. Rook shared his plans with Tao before they left, and it was his responsibility to have a training facility ready by the time they returned. The foundations of a station house were placed and the men began their work. It was built quickly enough and inside there was a lone cage placed by the corner wall. They also planned another skeleton repair bed beside the prison cell. This would make their training room optimal for keeping the robot in fighting condition. Back in the Ashlands, Rook was going to try and simply knock out his victim, even though the chances were low. He was caught before he even got close. The skeleton charged at Rook. It was faster and stronger than Rook. He couldn't even land a hit on this thing. Even worse, any blow that Rook failed to block inflicted heavy damage to him, and it was just a one-handed blade. Rook's attempts to take it out in upfront combat failed. He missed another attack and was knocked out cold from the contact. It scooped Rook up and walked him out of their dome. Little did they know that Mac was patiently waiting outside for this opportunity. As soon as it stepped foot into the open, it sensed something was wrong. A heavy bolt flew through the air and penetrated its leg. It dropped Rook and immediately charged at Mac. Fortunately, he was a good shot and slowed it down with the blow to its leg. Even so, it was still quick and was closing in on Mac. But Mac was faster and kept his distance from the skeleton while shooting it at any chance he had. It continued to limp towards him, even though it suffered critical damage. A final shot from Mac's crossbow took it down. He wiped the sweat from his forehead and looted the skeleton. Mac understood why it did so much damage to Rook now. Its weapon was made too great, and even for such a small blade, it packed a big punch. He took the cleaver for himself and lifted the heavy robot over his shoulders. Their mission was successful. At least the first half of it was. Rook was still knocked out cold, so Mac ran over and tended to his wounds. They brought a camp bed to rest up in, and Rook needed to be well enough for traveling, so Mac laid the head of agriculture to the ground and picked Rook up. Rook was laid down to heal up, and Mac immediately went to pick up their prize before it could reboot. 
After a little bit of time, Rook was almost fully recovered. He gave Mac a pat on the back and told him this was exactly why he needed him to come with him on this mission. Rook was much stronger and could move faster while carrying the skeleton, so they traded and they repaired it so it wouldn't die during their journey back west. They were going to meet back up with Agnew and Spring first and began their travels back. There was an unnerving silence as ash fell all around them. They were both happy to be leaving the Ashlands and returning home so quickly. Even while carrying the head of agriculture, they left the Ashlands and bypassed the Skim Bandits safely. They were just outside of Spring. Agnew was summoned and they all began their travels west, marking Morn as a checkpoint. Agnew wasn't that far behind them, so Rook and Max started without him. The two men made it to Morn in no time. They were very fast on their feet when it came to traveling. They hurried through the entrance and when they got there, Rook turned to Mac and told him to wait here until Agnew arrived. He was going to go on ahead without them. Their top priority was to get the skeleton back to New Raleigh and secure it so they could really begin their training. Mac nodded and said he understood. He bid Rook farewell as he took off. Rook was determined to get there as soon as possible. He had a long night ahead of him. Agnew was a bit slower than the others, but he made it to Morn safely a few hours later. As soon as he turned into the city's gates, Mac greeted him and told him that they were ready to continue west to New Raleigh together. Agnew roared in approval and they began their somewhat slower travels back home. Outside of New Raleigh's walls was the retribution of God that the Holy Nation sent to them. This was a much larger attack force than their previous attempt. It looked like Rook's message was received, but the Holy Lord Phoenix wanted to send him an even bigger message. At least for now, the closed off gates deterred them from entering and wreaking havoc. Rook arrived later that afternoon and he snuck around the Holy Nation forces at the East Gate and entered through the North Gate instead. Rook came in as quickly as he could and took his new friend into the newly constructed training hall to keep him secure for the time being. He placed him into the cage and it looked back at Rook, silent and emotionless. Mac and Agnew ran into problems in the swamp. Swamp ninjas ambushed them and they were inflicting lots of damage to the two men. There were too many of them so they continued running, hoping they could escape in one piece. They made it out of the swamp, but the ninjas didn't let up and left Mac in a critical state. Agnew wouldn't be able to defend himself before making it to the safety of their city. Rook knew that he had to help them or they'd be toast. He told the men to hold tight and he would return shortly and left from the west gate to save Agnew and Mac. The Holy Nation army must have known Rook returned and waited for him to leave again before they took action. As Rook was heading to Agnew's safety, the Retribution of God destroyed their gate and began their assault on New Raleigh. This is why they let Rook escape from Okran's fist. They wanted him to be nearby when they attacked. They were definitely sending a message this time and Rook wasn't there to protect his men. Rook. Hey, Rook. Oh, I'm starving, man. It's been, what, two days since we've eaten. I know. I hear you, hot dog. I feel the same way, brother. But I'm sure we'll find something soon. We always pull through. Hey, what do you think of these guys we've been traveling with lately? Uh, they're all right. We've seen less trouble since we've been traveling in higher numbers. I still remember that day. It feels like an eternity ago now. Hot Dog and I, we traveled together for weeks, maybe even months, barely scraping by after our small town was destroyed. We were the only two that escaped with our lives. We found another group of drifters that were kind enough to let us travel with them, safety numbers and all that. We were only with them for a few days and we just ran out of food again. I say, next stop we make, we gather food, not for ourselves, and travel west. You've heard of the hub, right? Yeah, of course I have. Remember when we traded for those few cubes? The shopkeeper told us about the hub. He said that's where people go when they're looking for opportunities to start anew. Hey, guys, I think we've rested enough. It's time for us to move on. We need to find some food. You know, Rook, I feel like we've been wandering around for too long now. I'm tired of going for days without eating something. We've talked about doing something with our lives for a while now, making a real difference in the world. I think if we could make it to the hub, we could begin there, really make a name for ourselves. Hey, I like that idea. You and me, we could go together. You're like a brother to me, Hot Dog. Wouldn't that be something? Hot Dog and Rook, legends of the land. <laughs> and what about these guys? Do you think they'd want to come with us to the hub? Well, we can cross that bridge once we get some food in our stomachs. But we were ambushed by a much larger group of raiders than we've ever encountered before that converged on us. The only way to escape safely was to split up and scatter. Rook, travel west. Meet me at the hub. We'll shake these guys. Meet back up there. Be careful, hot dog. Lay low and I'll find you. I'll see you again soon. I've escaped worse. I'll lose this guy in no time. Make sure I get to the hub. I'll see you then, brother. Little did I know that this would be the last time that I'd see Hot Dog. He made it to the hub before me and met his fate there. I failed him. 
I'm sorry, hot dog. For a brief moment, Rook was lost in memories from long ago. Suddenly, he snapped back to reality and remembered where he was. The harsh realization set in. His home and all of his friends were being sacked by the Holy Nation while he was out trying to rescue Mac and Agnew. He felt a helpless sense of fear as he realized that there wasn't anything he could do to stop them. Rook was desperate. He was trying to hurry and take out the Swamp Ninjas to protect Agnew, then he could save Mac. Together, they took out the men and finished off their crossbowmen. It was a disaster back in New Raleigh. The gate was breached and most of the men were already beaten down by their troops. Bravatar tried holding them off for as long as he could but was completely overwhelmed. They tried to secure the gate, but once it was opened, they were attacked and left for dead while the Holy Nation burst through, only seeking the destruction of their home. There were just too many of them. They couldn't even hide from their forces. Even in a critical state, Wands not tried fending them off, but he was too weak. He was crushed by the swing of the Paladin's cross and knocked unconscious. Fravatar quietly groaned under his crab armor while trying to crawl to safety while the Holy Nation troops ran through their buildings and pillaged whatever they found. Sparta lost an arm and like many others, he was slowly dying at their gate. Fravatar was still laying low and saw that the main attack finally ended and most of the enemy was leaving. Though, a few men stayed behind, one of these men being the leader of the attack, the High Inquisitor Valtina, the military commander of Oaken Shield, one of the Holy Nation's highest ranking officials. He was extremely strong and stayed at the center of New Raleigh calling out for Rook to face him. He said that the Holy Lord Phoenix personally asked him to lead the attack and not to return without Rook's body. Valtina was arrogant and cocky. Rook's men used this to their advantage. Fravatar was one of the few that could still walk. He helped Rook tend to the wounded. Rook apologized and frantically tried helping as much as he could. It seemed foolish for Valtina to dismiss most of his guard, but Rook knew his intentions. He wanted the glory and praise for their victory all for himself. Rook intended to leverage Valtina's own arrogance against him. Once his men were stabilized, he went on the offensive. It was getting dark, so Rook crept through the shadows to take out as many lingering Holy Nation men as he could. The lone paladin dropped like a rock as Rook clobbered him over the head. When he hit the ground, Rook disarmed him and stripped him of his armor so he wouldn't be a threat. Next, he approached Fravatar and asked him to trade his armor with him. Fravatar was confused, but Rook assured him that he needed to be fully prepared if he was to fight Valtina. He was an extremely powerful warrior after all, and Rook wasn't sure if he'd be able to take him on alone. Before initiating any fights though, Rook helped sneak his men into their inn to recover from the fighting. Valtina was busy yelling out into the darkness, mocking Rook and trying to provoke him. They didn't take the bait though. They worked through the entire night, hiding in the shadows and bringing in their men to the beds to rest up. That was until Rockius took the bait. He was furious at what they did and blinded by rage, he engaged with Valtina and his small remaining guard. With such little effort, Rockius was crushed by the mighty blows from his heavy cross. He spit on Rockius and cursed him. As Valtina was scoffing at the dying skeleton at his feet, he looked up and frowned as he saw a Shek patrol that happened to be passing through New Raleigh. He didn't anticipate the Shek's interference. The Shek hated the Holy Nation almost as much as Rook did. Realizing Valtino was caught off guard in a vulnerable position, they immediately closed in on him. Rook knew that he was too strong to take on alone. Luck was still on his side as the Holy Nation was suddenly outnumbered completely. Now was the time to strike back. Rook fought with half the Shek patrol to take out Valtina's guard. The Paladin was still a strong warrior and put up a good fight. Rook looked at the other Shek group and saw that they were all taken out single-handedly by Valtina. He charged Rook and the other Shek. Valtina's guard fell and Rook heard Agnew roar as he ran in and joined the fray. Even while being completely surrounded by skilled Shek fighters, Rook and Agnew, the High Inquisitor seemed to keep his cool. He screamed as he landed a heavy blow that went through Agnew's guard and caused the skeleton to crumble to the ground. A powerful fighter indeed. Rook was angry, but he could sense Valtina's rage with every strike he parried, and even if they landed a hit on him, he seemed to shrug it off and continue holding his own against Rook and six Shek fighters. Even so, he was just one man and even the High Inquisitor had his limits. The fighting continued for what felt like an eternity. Rook had a handful of allies fighting with him and even he was getting tired. They could see it in Valtina's eyes. Through the hate and determination, there was exhaustion, and more importantly, fear. His swings and reaction times were getting slower. They were whittling him down until he couldn't defend himself any longer. Finally, after fighting for over an hour straight, they brought him down. Rook couldn't believe it. Without the Shek patrolling through their home, they never would have been able to defeat Valtina. He thanked the Shek soldiers for their aid as he stripped the High Inquisitor of his gear. They didn't care for his thanks. All they wanted was to take down the High Commander of the Holy Nation, and they succeeded in that. Regardless, Rook owed the Shek for saving them a second time now. He picked up his limp body and slung him over his shoulder. He applied bandages to his own wounds and decided since the Shek were the main reason Valtina was defeated, he would take him to Squin and leave him as a prisoner. The Shek would be able to decide his fate. Rook's men suffered heavy blows from the attack. 
He wasn't even sure of all the damages they inflicted on New Raleigh, but capturing one of the Holy Nation's highest ranking commanders was a big blow to them too. And Valtina had quite the bounty on his head. That would help with the continued funding and growth of New Raleigh. Squin was the nearest Shek city, so Rook began heading there with Valtina's unconscious body. He wouldn't let the Phoenix get away with this. It would be different next time, Rook thought to himself. Squin wasn't very far away and Rook made it there in good time. He felt a bit of relief as he saw the gates to the city in front of him. The Shek guards scoffed at Rook. They knew that their own men were the biggest cause of Valtina's defeat and looked down upon non-Shek fighters. Rook didn't mind though. Who knows what would have happened if it wasn't for the Shek and their help. He didn't want to think about it. He saw the police station on the other end of Squin and made his way to it. As he walked inside, he found the captain and spoke with him immediately. He looked Rook's prisoner over and smiled. Rook simply nodded and handed the High Inquisitor over and was given a reward of 40,000 cats in return. Valtina was stripped of his clothes and pride and was tied to a prisoner stake where he'd hopefully rot for a long time. He heard him screaming at the Shek while they bandaged his wounds to make sure he didn't die too quickly. Rook's work here was done. It was time for damage control back home. Even though the worst of the attack was over, things were moving so fast that he didn't have a chance to really check on the well-being of his men. In the aftermath of the battle, Sparta and Awinger both lost an arm and a leg. Fortunately, that was the worst of it. The rest of the men were just beaten to a pulp and would heal in time. Agnew brought Awinger a spare robotic leg that they had in storage. It was a good thing Rook was so keen on looting these things while he traveled. Agnew laid him on the rooftop and continued working. Awinger looked at the leg and attached it to where his was missing. The robotic limb did the rest of the work as it linked itself to his nerves and began functioning like his missing limb did. He was still missing an arm and they didn't have any spare left limbs for him to use, but at least he'd be able to get around for now. Sparta was a little less lucky and they could only find a replacement arm, but they didn't have a right leg replacement. He attached the arm and winced in pain as it made the connections to his body. He still wasn't going to be able to get around very easily until he had a replacement leg to install. He laid there, frustrated at his situation, but there wasn't much else he could do at the moment. When Rook returned, he cleaned up the remaining Holy Nation men that were left lingering at their base. Once he took care of the last of the mess that was left behind from everything, they shut the gates to lock themselves in New Raleigh and laid low for a bit. Rook realized that they definitely would have the attention of the Holy Lord Phoenix once he realized that Valtina was taken as a prisoner. They had to be prepared for any future retaliation. He also planned for another building to be constructed. They laid the plans out for a new longhouse that would be used for another one of Rook's plans, but more on that later. He found Sparta and picked him up. He apologized him for what happened. Rook felt personally responsible for the attack on their home since he provoked the Holy Nation at Okran's fist and Narco's trap. He was going to take Sparta to the Hiver's camp and get him a replacement leg that would at least allow him to get around. Meanwhile, they haven't forgotten about their robotic guest and Alwinger stopped by to deliver a poorly crafted katana to its cell. It was going to need it. It held the crude weapon in its hands and responded with a simple, okay, like it understood what would come next. Fravatar entered the training hall and Ryan joined him shortly after. The new men were split into a new group of trainees, and to begin, Ryan and Fravatar would spar with their new skeleton friend. The door slowly closed behind them and they made sure it was locked. They weren't entirely sure of how this whole thing would turn out. Furnished with their most protective armor and weakest katanas, they were prepared to start duking it out for as long as they could stand. Ryan unlocked the cage and it got out. It just stood there for a moment until Ryan moved ever so slightly and it reacted so quickly that both of the men were caught off guard. It was fast and strong. It was a good thing they were equipped with crab armor because it would evade their blocks and land most of its attacks while shrugging off most of their swings with its crude weapon. Even with such a weak blade, the head of agriculture inflicted a decent amount of damage to the men with each hit it landed. It got to the point where Wansnot was caught in to moderate the fighting while Fravatar split off and healed up. After he finished, Ryan backed off to recover while Fravatar continued their engagement with it. Its strength and technique was far greater than theirs. This was exactly the kind of training that they needed if they wanted to become stronger. While they continued sparring, Rook arrived at the robotic shop at the nearby hive. He found the shopkeeper who was glad to see Rook again. He commented on how they brought their hive a lot of business in the past. Rook frowned by the hivers words of encouragement and proceeded to buy a low-grade leg so Sparta could walk again. After they fashioned the leg to him, Rook made sure to purchase an arm replacement for Awinger too. They'd be faster if Rook just carried Sparta back to New Raleigh and even against his protests, Rook took off towards their home with Sparta yelling at him to be put down. Back home, Wan's not switched gear with Ryan and joined the fighting since things were starting to get a little out of hand and Ryan was knocked out cold. Fravatar was slowly beaten to a pulp. Even while fully covered in crab armor, he finally passed out from the beatdown that the head of agriculture gave him. Wansnot was even using his good weapon but was still struggling to take on the skeleton. Mac had to come in for extra damage control to help shoot it down while Wansnot took the brunt of the fighting. 
Finally, after almost taking down a third man with a dull katana, the head of agriculture was knocked into a reboot state and collapsed. This training was a little more intense than they initially anticipated. Wansnot scooped the limp robot up and limped back over to his holding cell while the rest of the men healed up. Mac went over to the skeleton and used his repair kit to fix up the damage inflicted to it. He finished tending to it and the others continued to bandage themselves up. The head of agriculture was still rebooting, so the men used this opportunity to rest up in their beds too. They took quite the beating after all. Wansnot was added to the list of trainees and after healing up from the first fight, they gathered together in the training hall again to continue honing their fighting skills. The door was closed behind them and locked. Wansnot ran over and opened the cage. The skeleton stepped out and just stood there looking at Wansnot. It could speak, but it remained silent. As soon as Wansnot made even the slightest movement, the skeleton lit into him. It seemed to understand what was going on and was complacent with the situation it was in. The head of agriculture was clearly skilled in the art of combat as it quickly danced between the three men, shrugging off most of their attacks even with its poorly crafted weapon and landing 10 hits before they could even touch it. This was good for the men though. Not only were they quickly improving their own skills, they were becoming tougher from the beating they were receiving and they were learning better fighting techniques. They were really hurt, but this time, they were able to take down the skeleton before any of them were knocked out. They were already making some progress. Wansnot scooped up the skeleton and placed it back into its cell and began repairing it. While Wansnot took care of that, Fravatar reapplied bandages to everyone. Things would be much easier if they could finish building the skeleton repair bed in the training hall, but they were lacking electrical components. The men were resting up from another beating with the skeleton captive. Rook returned with Sparta and they delivered the replacement arm for Awinger to use. He attached it and even though it was a little shoddy, he had two functioning arms again and he was very pleased. While the trainees rested, Rook traded his good weapons with Ryan's low grade katana. He could also hone his fighting skills with the head of agriculture. He went inside the training hall and got it out of its cell. They began sparring immediately. Even at Rook's skill level, he was struggling to keep up with the skeleton's attacks. He was holding his own better than the others, but he was still taking way more hits than he was landing. The rest of the trainees were covered enough to join the fighting. As they came in and surrounded the skeleton, Rook backed off to heal up. He really got bruised up himself. The other men kept it busy enough and once Rook finished tending to his wounds, he joined back in until it was knocked out into a reboot. Rook placed it back into the cell once again and the men went through healing their wounds from the fight. Wansnot took some time to repair their captive again, but they only had limited repair kits. They needed to finish their repair bed, which would be a much more efficient means to mend wounds that were inflicted during their sparring sessions. Since electrical components were hard to come by, they decided it would make more sense to craft the materials in-house. They planned out an electrical workbench and finished its construction by the following morning. Mac worked on the parts that they needed, and one more day later, they finished building the training hall's skeleton repair bed. Since they now had access to all the necessary components for building these beds, they let out two more and added Rockius and Agnew to the group of trainees. They released the skeleton again and continued honing their combat skills against it. It was getting to the point where they could collectively group up and take it out with relative ease. It took a while, but they made it work. Once it was knocked out, Agnew picked it up and placed it into the repair bed. As it was rebooting, the bed would come to life and work on any damaged parts until it fully rebooted and climbed out of the bed, ready to fight once more. While they were sparring, Sparta snuck in and finished working on another one of the beds. This way, Rockius and Agnew could repair their own damage while the other men took on the head of agriculture. Every time it collapsed from the fighting, the men would take the time to tend to their wounds and make sure that they were in good fighting condition for when the skeleton rebooted so they could constantly hone their skills. That night, after it was knocked out yet again, Rook decided it was time to equip it with some of Ryan's finest crab armor that he's made. This would make it much more durable and the men would be able to fight with the skeleton much longer before they'd be able to knock it out. Rook didn't care for running around in his underwear with a crab helmet on, so he ran to their armory and grabbed another set to put on. As Rook continued to spar with the head of agriculture, his skills were quickly growing. The men were focusing on using katanas since not only did this help their melee skills, it also increased their dexterity. They were becoming more skilled and nimble while training with this blade. Their defensive skills and toughness were rapidly increasing too as they were getting beaten to a pulp most of the time. Of course during every sparring session Rook had, he felt pity for his captive. It was being held here against its will, but he knew he had to dirty their hands if they wanted to become expert fighters. A few more days passed and they added regular beds for the other men to rest between fights. They refined their process down to a very efficient method. One of the men would engage with the skeleton in solo combat. While they dueled, the rest of the men rested and healed their wounds. Once the current fighter was beaten down too much, he would flee to an open skeleton repair bed to heal all their wounds while the next trainee and Q would continue fighting their captive. Even the humans could use the repair beds. This worked much faster than regular bandages and they weren't wasting their supplies either. 
Once all their wounds were tended to, they would rest in a regular bed to fully recover from their round of fighting. Many more days passed. Their combat skills, toughness, and dexterity were all becoming much more refined, but they weren't getting proper strength training. Rook's solution? He had them fill huge backpacks full of iron and had them travel to the hub and back. They could barely walk while hauling this massive weight on their backs, but it built up their strength very quickly. The other men were still alternating between fighting so that there was never a moment of downtime unless the head of agriculture was rebooting. And while they were becoming much better fighters, they were still getting a severe beatdown against their captive. This was good because that meant that there was less time where the skeleton was knocked out and more time where Rook's men were fighting and mastering their technique. Rook decided it was time for him to take a break from the combat and focus on training his strength. He loaded another backpack full of raw iron ore and began the same hike to the hub that Rockius was doing. The next phase of their plan was to utilize their recently constructed longhouse to build hemp processors. Rook didn't like the idea of manufacturing drugs, but this trade could be extremely profitable and they could sneak into the Holy Nation cities, sell the drugs there, and drain their funds while poisoning their population with drug addictions from within. He knew it was a dirty tactic, but Rook wanted to use every means possible to weaken the Holy Nation. Their time of reckoning was coming soon. Everything was in place and the men that weren't trainees focused on using their hemp crops for hashish production. If they could find the right city with a demand, they would be able to earn a lot of money doing this to help fund New Raleigh. At this point, Rook, Fravitar, Ryan, Wansnot, Rockius, and Agnew were much stronger than they were before they began their training. And while their combat skills were massively improved, it was time they collectively built up their strength. They mined enough ore so that everyone had bags full of raw iron to haul around. Once everyone was prepared, they began their rounds to the hub and back. They continued their non-stop training for an entire month. Every single one of them was much stronger than before, including Rook. This was their only gap and it was time they fully committed to that. On their way to the hub, a group of dust bandits tried to ambush their training group. Most of them still had their low-grade training weapons on hand, but they engaged regardless. It was a massacre. The armor Ryan crafted for them was superb and they shrugged off most, if not all, the damage inflicted on them. Not only that, but even with shoddy weapons, their combat skills greatly outmatched the meager dust bandits. The men dropped like flies as Rook's group slowly moved in on them and destroyed their whole attack force. They made it up to the hub and back without any other problems. They marched in a single line as they were crossing the swamp back to New Raleigh. Everyone was bragging about how they were on Rook's level now. Rook chuckled and asked if any of them wanted to test that claim and they all fell silent for a few seconds until they all burst out laughing together. Confidence was high as they marched together, slowly building up their strength. They marched back and forth from New Raleigh to the hub for almost two weeks straight. At this point, Rook was tired of wearing his clunky crab armor. He finally took his armor off and slid his dust coat back on. He felt like a new man as he changed back into his regular outfit. The rest of the men equipped their regular weapons and they went into the north gate where a group of Kral's chosen were harassing Rook's men. It was time to test their skills with real weapons this time. Rook could hardly believe his eyes. The Shek were powerful warriors, yet they were melting like butter against Rook's men. Their training was definitely paying off. Before they even knew it, the group of Kral's chosen were defeated. This time, instead of going to the hub, they made their way to the nearby way station. They still moved slowly while hauling their loads of iron, but the days of aching backs and sore legs paid off as well. They arrived late into the night and entered the shop. It was time to get rid of their iron and build up New Raleigh's funds even further. Rook sold every last iron ore in his bag and he felt a hundred times lighter. The other men followed after Rook. They sold as much as they could until they completely ran out of cats and couldn't buy any more from them. Later that day, Rook returned and got together with Mac again. He had another mission for the two of them. While the trainees were honing their skills, the rest of the men built a huge stockpile of hashish. Rook and Mac filled their backpacks with the drugs and left for the East Gate. It was time to infiltrate the Holy Nation territory. Mac wasn't a fan of selling hashish, but he agreed with Rook that it would be a good way to hurt their economy while growing theirs. They reviewed their maps and began traveling north towards Stack and Blister Hill. Their first destination would be Stack. As they approached the gates of the city, something seemed different. They got closer and saw that it was a Shek guard protecting the gate. The city of Stack was mostly in ruins. They went into the HQ and spoke to a Shek warrior and asked what happened. He explained that once Rook brought the High Inquisitor Valtina, there was a window of opportunity where the Holy Nation was vulnerable. While they didn't want to launch an all-out war, they took advantage of the situation and brought down the Phoenix's other High Commander, Seda, and claimed the ruins of Stack as Shek territory. They advised Rook and Mac not to approach Blister Hill though. The Holy Lord Phoenix was on high alert and they would most certainly get caught if they attempted to enter their capital. Rook spoke with Mac briefly about their plans. 
Tensions were high with the Shek and Holy Nation. They needed to get rid of their hashish and report back to New Raleigh to adjust their plans. Rook told Mac to head east of the United Cities and try and find a place to sell their goods. Rook was going to check out World's End to see what he could do there. In the meantime, the men back home were building a weaponsmith so they could forge their own weapons and fully supply their own men. Rook made it to World's End in no time. He wasn't sure the best place to do this, so he found a traveler's shop and he spoke to the vendor. The shopkeeper smiled when he saw what Rook was offering to sell. This was a side business that he happened to run and their supplies were running low. For 122 cats a pop, Rook thought it seemed like a good deal and decided to sell the hashish to the man. It wasn't going to impact the Holy Nation like he initially planned, but he wanted to be rid of it for now so he could get back to New Raleigh. He sold him every last bit of his stash and began his hasty return home. During all this, Mac was heading east to Flats Lagoon of the United Cities territory. He arrived a little later and found a nearby bar that was still open. Mac approached the barkeeper and awkwardly proposed selling him his bulk supply of hashish. He wasn't sure how to approach this kind of conversation. The United Cities were a foul bunch. Slavery and drugs ran rampant in their cities, and neither Rook or Mac minded selling drugs to them. Especially when they were buying it for 760 cats apiece? It looked like Rook sold his supplies at the wrong city. Mac gladly sold as much as the barkeeper could afford, but he still had a lot of his stash left over after the barkeep ran out of cats. As he was about to leave to look for other shops, he overheard two men speaking by the bar. They were talking about the Holy Nation. Mac stopped and listened for a moment. They mentioned how the Sheik had both High Inquisitors, Veltina and Seda, in their captivity. Word travels fast and from the sounds of it, the Holy Nation was feeling the loss of their two highest commanders under the Holy Lord Phoenix. Mac was glad that the Holy Nation was slowly crumbling after their attack on New Raleigh. He went to another nearby shop and sold the remaining hashish there for a great profit. While Mac was finishing up at Flats Lagoon, Rook decided to make one last visit to the scrap house at the Black Desert City. He was looking for something very specific there. He arrived quickly. Time was of the essence while the Holy Nation was getting hit by the Shek army. He went up to the scrap house and found the skeleton vendor there. He began to browse its wares, sifting past the weapons in stock. He found it. Blueprints for exotic weapons, namely the Falling Sun. This was the very last thing Rook needed before they'd be ready. Ryan had already become a master armor smith and made the finest crab armor they could ever wish for. Now it was time to equip them with equally powerful weapons. Rook thanked the skeleton for his time and he learned the tech for his men. He went back home and gave the plans to Ryan. He began working on learning the technique for weapon crafting immediately. Rook had only one last trip to make. He grabbed the remaining supply of hashish at their base and made his way to Flats Lagoon. When he got there, he spoke to a shopkeeper and sold the last of their supply. Rook knew that the United Cities were just as bad as the Holy Nation. Taking their money and flooding their cities with these drugs was a subtle way for them to hit them while they prepared to wage war in the Holy Nation. After selling the rest of their drugs to Flats Lagoon, Rook prepared to travel back home. Ryan worked at weaponsmithing non-stop for almost two weeks straight while the others continued training. His hard work and determination paid off though. He learned how to master the technique of forging expertly crafted blades. The recipe for the Falling Sun was perfect. After working countless days straight, he finally finished it. It was an edge type 1 grade Falling Sun, even better than Rook's own weapon. Ryan was almost finished. He finally mastered the art of crafting the finest quality weapons and just needed to make enough supply for the rest of the men. Eight days later, it was done. Rook and his men have been preparing for this moment for a long time. Each of them were furnished with an Edge Type 1 Falling Sun and Katana. 74 days after New Raleigh was sacked by the Holy Nation, they were finally ready to take the fight to them while they were weak. Rook called for a meeting later that evening to discuss what their plans were moving forward. The time to wage war in the Holy Nation was just around the corner. They were the seven that planned to take them on. Will the Holy Lord Phoenix be ready for them? Fravatar, Rockius, Mac, Wansnot, Agnew. Thanks for meeting with me. Where's Ryan? Of course, boss. Ryan's finishing up some work in the weapon shop, so he couldn't make it. We'll fill him in later, though. Good, good. Well, I'm sure you all know why I've called for this meeting. For months we've been training, planning for this moment, and the time has finally come. After the Holy Nation attacked us, Voltina was captured, and that sent off a chain reaction of events leading the Shek army to begin an assault on the Holy Nation. We've been biding our time and preparing for the perfect moment to bring them down and, well, our patience is finally paying off. I want to discuss our plan of attack and make sure everyone's in agreement. We're all in this together and that means we have to all be okay with whatever happens next. Rook, uh, I know we've been preparing to attack the Holy Nation for a long time now, but do you think we'll really be able to take them on with just the seven of us? 
Juan's not. We've been with Rook since the very beginning. He's always had a plan and has always looked after us. If he thinks we're ready, then we're ready. I wouldn't be worried if I were you, you bearded bastard. Hmm, that is a good point, Fravatar. I trust you, Rook. It's just that the Holy Nation is a powerful force to be reckoned with. While that's true, word travels fast, and people are talking about how the Sheik have inflicted a lot of damage to them already. I even heard it being discussed as far east as Flats Lagoon. If the rumors are true, their forces have been weakened, and this is probably the best time for us to make a move. Correct. The Phoenix is in a vulnerable position after Seta and Valentina were imprisoned by the Sheik. Some of their strongholds have already fallen. Their troops will be spread thin. Even so, their forces still greatly outnumber ours, even if you account for the Sheik army. What do you think, Rook? These are all good points and you're right. If the seven of us try to take the Phoenix head on, there's no way we could beat them. We have to be smart about this and take them on slowly and strategically. We'll hit their mines and strongholds south of Blister Hill, cutting off all reinforcements to their capital and after that, we'll sever off the Holy Nation's head directly by going after the Holy Lord Phoenix himself. Ultimately, if we take him out, the Holy Nation falls apart from within. So what do you guys think? It could certainly work. We just have to be careful. It's a good plan. I'm looking forward to taking some of those wretched paladins down. Fravatar is right. We trust you, Rook. We'll be with you every step of the way. That's what I'm talking about. Let's do this, you bastards. <laughs> uh, what's Agnew going on about? Hmm. I think he is wondering why a Kraus Chosen is knocked out and curled up in a ball under Whatnot's bench. Oh, uh, d don't worry about that. It's settled then. We leave at dawn to begin our attack on the Holy Nation. Everyone will have a first aid kit, Mac will hold onto our food supplies and relay messages back home if necessary. We travel north to the closest holy mines. We'll destroy anything that gets in our path and free any slaves they have there. This time, it's the Phoenix who experienced the fear of losing what's his. We've invested so much for this moment, you've all become stronger than I ever could have hoped. We'll finish what the Sheik started. We're the seven that will defeat the Holy Nation. I hope you're ready, Holy Lord Phoenix, because we're coming for you. Rook met with his men and finished discussing their plan of attack. The time to engage in war against the Holy Nation was now. They were traveling north towards the closest holy mines first. While they moved, a group of dust bandits made the mistake of ambushing the men, trying to rob them of their belongings. Rook yelled out and the men broke formation to strike back. This was just an example of the potential these seven men had. This large group of bandits were eviscerated on the spot. Before their training, Rook was the only one that could dance around his enemies, taking them out with his falling son. But now all of them were expert fighters and they were definitely a force to be reckoned with. It was thanks to the head of agriculture, who was released from New Raleigh right before the Seven left. Its part to play was over and they didn't want to keep it captive any longer. As quickly as the fighting started, the last bandit already crumbled to the ground and they were defeated. They did a quick check to make sure everyone was okay and the damage received was minimal. They were just getting started. The men finally arrived at the Holy Mines at midnight. They slowly approached the outskirts of the wall, just far away enough where the enemy patrols couldn't spot them. They were anxious and nervous as they got closer. This was their first time doing anything like this after all. Rook stopped and turned to speak with them. He said that they needed to be smart about this and asked them to wait here while he snuck in. Rook was gonna try and knock out and disarm as many men as possible and hopefully they could take over these mines without drawing any attention to them. If anything went wrong, he would stand his ground until the rest of the men joined him. It was a small outpost with only a few gate guards. It'd be easy enough to pass through undetected. Rook snuck inside and went into the living quarters first. He found a corner to hide in as he scanned the building. Most of the soldiers were asleep. Only two were awake at a table having a quiet conversation with themselves. The other building was where they kept their slaves locked up. Not for much longer though. The two guards stopped talking for a moment and Rook moved in to strike. He snuck up and knocked the first one out as quietly as he could. Time for the other one. Well, that didn't work out quite how he was hoping. The second guard detected Rook and yelled out in a panic, which alerted the rest of the men. They sprung out of bed and ran to their mounted turrets atop of their quarters, ready for an attack. Rook's men heard the commotion and charged in to help. Rook was keeping the majority of their troops occupied on the roof. He didn't want his men to be gunned down by the turrets. The few troops that stayed downstairs were locked in combat with Rook's reinforcements. Rook was taking a bit of a beating, but he was dishing out more damage than the paladins could take. Wansnot and the others cleared their way to the top of the building to help Rook clean up the remaining men left standing. 
The Holy Nation men were backed into the corner as Rook's men converged all around them. The wounded tried crawling away, crying out for help, but were quickly silenced by their falling sons. The men took a moment to heal up while Max stood guard at the harpoon turret. Rook used this opportunity to sneak into the slave building. It looked like the guards here didn't notice the commotion outside. Before they could spot him, Rook knocked out the closest guard and immediately moved to his next target. As he turned to see what was going on, his face met Rook's fist and he was taken out. Another guard was asleep in the corner. Rook took him out with a dull thud and it looked like the coast was clear now. He took this opportunity to disarm the guards. If they woke up, they wouldn't pose much of a threat anymore. He heard a bolt fire from the turret. They must have missed a small patrol that spotted the other men on the roof and engaged them. Rook ran back to assist, but as a whole, the rest of the seven were very strong now. They were certainly able to hold their own without Rook babysitting them, but that didn't stop him from charging in anyways, taking out the last one of the remaining men with a crushing blow. So far, everyone was okay and things were going relatively smoothly. Rook snuck back over to where the slaves were kept and began picking their locks. As he unlocked the first slave's shackles and cage, she cheered as quietly as she could but was bursting with excitement. The rest of them stared at Rook anxiously while he continued freeing the others. Some of them were so broken that they were too afraid to leave their cell. Even after Rook assured them that there were no more guards to hurt them and that he had a place where they could call home. As soon as Rook opened his cell, the poor slave closed the door to his cage and curled up, crying. They were so broken by the Holy Nation that they refused to leave. Rook had to focus on freeing the rest of the slaves though. While some of them chose not to go with Rook, the others were ready for the opportunity to be rid of this hard life that they were forced into. As Rook went back downstairs, he noticed that the guards he knocked out regained consciousness and armed themselves again. As he was halfway down the steps, they spotted him and charged at Rook with rage. They forced him back to the roof to defend the escaped slaves. The guards were trying to cripple them so they wouldn't be able to escape with Rook's men. The rest of the seven came in from behind and trapped the guards at the stairway. They easily dispatched the remaining paladins. Once the last of the threat was taken down, the slaves scoured their unconscious bodies for any gear that they could steal from them. While they were taking the weapons from the enemy for their own use, Rook continued freeing the remaining slaves left in their cells. Even after the caged men saw what the seven men did to the Holy Nation forces, some of them were too afraid to leave with them. Rook wasn't going to force them, but he encouraged them to leave before more men arrived and gave instructions on how to get to New Raleigh. The other newly freed men anxiously followed Rook as they were all released from their cages. There was nothing left in the mines and it was time to go. Only one guard remained at the front gate. Rook knocked him out immediately and disarmed him. The first strike was successful as they completely liberated the mines and as they were heading out, a group of trading nomads were passing through. Rook told them to be careful in the coming days. War was being waged in this land. Only one of the freed slaves stayed with the seven. The rest of them took their chances on their own. They told her that she was free to go or she could join them and be protected at their home. For now, they were going to progress to the next objective, bad teeth. After a few minutes of following the Seven and contemplating her options, she made the decision to join Rook's cause. They were happy to hear her choice, but it was too dangerous for her to be in the enemy's territory. They told her to go to the hub and stay there for the time being. They'd come back for her later. She bid them farewell and left for the hub to lay low. The Seven arrived outside of Bad Teeth and they hid out of sight while scouting the base. Mac noticed that the gate was being guarded by the Shek forces. In fact, they were using the ruins of the station as a base of operations. They already took it over. Well, that's one less fight that they had to worry about. The men gathered around the map and they saw a holy military base outside of the Foglands, just north of Stack. The way things were going, they probably were using that base to supply reinforcements to Blister Hill. If they could take that out, that would really help weaken their capital. It took them a half day's travel to get there and when Max scouted the base, he could see that it was crawling with Holy Nation men. This location was much more formidable than the mines they sacked, but they knew it had to be done. The men snuck over to a large rock that hid them from the enemy's view and laid low while they prepared the plans of their attack. This would be their biggest challenge yet. Fortunately, the Shek were raiding this base from the opposite end too. Not only were they weakening their forces here, it was a big distraction for the Holy Nation while they sent their men back and forth to the fighting. Rook planned on leveraging this situation to their advantage. It was getting late and a lot of their men were drawn outside of the base to deal with the Shek. The men laid low until nightfall and Rook told them to wait while he infiltrated the base first and silently knocked out as many men as he could. Then they could charge in afterwards to secure the base. They snuck closer to another rock where they could hide and wished Rook luck. Using the darkness as his cover, he snuck past the gate guards. He found his first victim and went him for the strike. He was immediately spotted and they cried out in anger as they attacked Rook. More men poured out to surround him. The rest of the seven heard the commotion and charged into his aid. Rook really messed up his plans, but he improvised and violently fought the paladins and inquisitors that swarmed him. There were sounds of steel clashing everywhere. 
Men were shouting out in confusion as they scrambled out of their barracks into the darkness trying to defend their base. Max stayed outside and used the open field to his advantage as he cleaned up the gate guards. He was fast and could easily dodge the wounded paladins and shoot them down with his powerful crossbow. Inside, the men were spread out, surrounded by the enemy. Their fighting skills and gear were far superior than the common paladin, but there were so many men and they kept pouring out of buildings to fight. Mac tried to keep his distance and help the others from afar. Rockius was the first to be taken down. The paladin's weapons specialized in damaging skeletons after all. The rest of the seven stood their ground and managed to take out the wave of soldiers. They used this brief window of opportunity to heal up and tend to their wounds. Well, that brief window closed quickly though as more men charged in at Mac. He fell back so he could continue using his crossbow while the rest of the Seven converged on the new attack force. The fighting went on and the Seven were getting tired. Rook let his guard down for a moment and the swing of a paladin connected and it knocked him out. He collapsed to the ground. The other paladins were getting up and joining back in the combat. The Seven tried to stay strong though and kept fighting. But one of the paladins snuck into the fray and scooped Rook off the ground and ran into their tower with his limp body over his shoulders. Ryan yelled out and followed the paladin into the prison tower where they secured Rook to a pole to deal with later. Brian was right behind him and engaged with the guard. Rook regained his consciousness and immediately started picking the locks that were binding him. Agnew and Fravatar joined the fighting in the tower too to make sure that the coast was clear for Rook. The lock came undone and Ryan was there to help lift him off the prison pole. He thanked Ryan and told the men that they needed to keep fighting, but they disarmed Rook when they captured him. Fortunately, the High Paladin was still holding onto his katana. Rook went ahead and picked it off his limp body and sheathed it. His giant falling sun was left laying outside. Rook ran out where the rest of the men were still locked in combat with more paladins and grabbed it off the ground. He was back in action now. In fact, he saw there was an open moment where he could focus on bandaging himself up before heading back into combat and began tending to his wounds. While more soldiers were still pouring back into the base from their fighting with the Shek, it seemed like they were slowly being whittled down. As the men trickled in or got up from the ground, the Seven focused them down together. They grouped back up and overwhelmed the remaining men that engaged with them. The last paladin fell and it was done. They were victorious. But this victory came at a cost. Blood and corpses were everywhere. It stunk of death and dirt. They huddled together and began tending to their wounds. It wasn't quite over yet though. Rook went back into the prisoner tower where multiple Shek soldiers were being held captive from the fighting outside of the walls. He unlocked each of the cells and the warriors thanked him as they charged back out to reunite with their forces. One of their barracks had another Shek prisoner. Rook went in to free him but noticed there were a couple of paladins that somehow slept through all the action. As the Shek prisoner was freed, he yelled out thanking Rook and woke up the sleeping guards. They got up and screamed at him to stop and pursued the Shek prisoner. As the second guard passed by Rook, he smacked him across the head and knocked him out. When he collapsed to the ground, he quickly disarmed him so he wouldn't be a threat. Rook ran back outside to meet with the rest of the men. They were hurt, sure, but the military base was secured and they came out victorious. The men took a moment to revel in their successful attack and gathered around Rook's map. South of Blister Hill was another holy military base and holy mines. They were too weakened right now to try and take on another military base, but the nearby holy mines would be a viable target and they wanted to keep up their momentum before word got back to the Phoenix at Blister Hill. It was decided. They left the liberated military base for the Shek forces. They could claim it as their own while the men pressed onward to the mines. The Seven were determined to continue their attack on the Holy Nation. The freed Shek prisoner was inspired by Rook's men and asked to join their cause. Rook gladly welcomed him to New Raleigh, but he was wounded and not properly equipped. They tasked him to leave for the hub and await further instructions there. The Seven didn't stop moving until they arrived at the Holy Mines. It was midday and they couldn't use the element of surprise, so they charged straight to the gate and Rook began swiftly unlocking their entrance. There were no guards here to stop them. The lock came undone and the door slowly opened. Their forces must have been pulled back to Blister Hill because as soon as the Seven entered the small mines, they saw the slaves break through their cages and retreat from what little guard remained. A slaver ran out to confront the men but was quickly overwhelmed. Rook charged inside and there was just one paladin waiting to greet him with his blade. They crushed the enemy and they saw that one more paladin was on the roof, panicking while he tried to defend himself. They didn't stand a chance against Rook's men. The fighting was over before it even started. Rook went to the few remaining slaves that weren't able to escape and freed them from their shackles and got them out of their cages. They thanked Rook after he worked their locks and granted them their freedom. These mines were virtually abandoned. It was no effort for the Seven to liberate this location from the Holy Nation's grasp. The freed slaves chose to go their own separate way and left. Rook's men were still wounded and tired. Their first strike was very successful, liberating three Holy Nation areas, but they needed to take some time to recover. They plotted their way back to the hub where they'd be able to take some time to rest and work out their next plan of attack. But the men were ambushed on their way back by a Holy Nation patrol. 
They successfully escaped and took out most of their men, but when they arrived at the hub, they were really banged up. The men used the spare beds at the hub so they could heal their wounds and be ready to strike again. They ran out of skeleton repair kits and Rockius was hurting badly. Rook personally ran him back to New Raleigh so they could take advantage of their skeleton repair beds. Before he left, he told his men to take the rest of the morning to recover. After that, they were ordered to split up and travel to neighboring way stations where mercenaries for hire hung out. For what they were planning to do next, they'd require a lot more men. Rook arrived at New Raleigh and laid Rockius down on the repair bed and it immediately started to work on his damaged parts. He'd be as good as new in no time. Rook laid down to patch up his own arm as well. The escaped slave and Sheck warrior traveled from the hub to New Raleigh, but they took some time to go to the northern way station to visit the plastic surgeon. The Sheck warrior was given the name Yellow Horse, and he was eager to fight under Rook's command. The female slave was given her old name before she was taken into captivity, Aaron. Now that they've changed their names, the two of them felt like they could begin anew at New Raleigh. Rockius was still recovering, but Rook was ready to move on to the next phase of their plans and began traveling north. A few minutes later, he arrived at the northern way station near their home, looking for men to hire for their biggest challenge yet. On the 223rd day, it was finally here. The fateful recruitment day that was foreshadowed long ago began. Their next target would require a lot more than just the seven of them. Rook entered the bar, anxious to find men for hire. It took some convincing and a lot of cats, but he was able to hire a group of mercenaries and tech hunters. They were weary to follow Rook after he explained his intentions, but were greedy and hungry for glory. After all, Blister Hill would be crawling with paladins, but what they planned to do next would be talked about for years to come. As they left the way station, the hired men were quiet. They knew the risks of challenging a force like the Holy Nation were high. Meanwhile, Ryan recovered and made his way to the way station just east of the hub. It didn't take him long to get there, and as he entered the bar, he spotted more men for hire and spoke with them. All mercenaries were the same. They initially scoffed at Ryan when he told him that their target would be Blister Hill, but his cats were very influential. In a matter of minutes, Ryan had half the men in the bar leaving with him to rendezvous back at the hub. He didn't spare a moment and they left immediately. Time was of the essence. Fravatar finally recovered from their first raid and traveled north to World's End. They knew soldiers for hire frequented the bars there. It would be a longer trip, but he planned to meet up with the rest of the men outside of Blister Hill. The next day, Rook arrived at the hub and he met up with the rest of the men. Everyone was ready and the time to strike was now. Their four set stack as their first checkpoint left through the gates of the hub. Alone, the seven were powerful warriors. Now that they had a small army of recruited mercenaries with them, they truly were a force to be reckoned with. As they arrived at Stack, they could see the shocked look on the Shex guards' faces when they saw Rook's men with an army of soldiers at their side. For the first time, they didn't taunt Rook as he passed through the gate. Rook entered Stack's HQ and found a Shek commander who called him over to talk. He told the commander that their next target was the Phoenix himself and that their force would make their move at nightfall. The commander bid Rook farewell and wished him luck. As Rook was leaving, the Shek commander told him that they wouldn't be alone in their fight against the Holy Lord Phoenix. The men began moving out to a holy farm near Blister Hill as their next waypoint. Rook smiled, knowing that they'd be coordinating attack with the Shek's forces. They'd need all the help they could get. They arrived at the holy farm and told the men that they weren't there to fight. They only wanted to take what supplies they could use and move on. The farmers complied, but as soon as Ryan stepped inside their building, he was jumped by one of the guards. The rest of the farmers turned on them with a violent rage, cursing them as enemies of Okran as they charged in. Rook's men didn't want to shed any blood here, but they forced their hand. The farmers didn't stand a chance and were massacred. Rook was disgusted. He didn't want to target the farmers and peasants, but at this point it couldn't be avoided. They took what food they found and continued towards their final destination, the outskirts of Blister Hill. As they left the Holy Farm, Fravatar stopped into the bar at World's End. He found a group of tech hunters that were looking for work and hired them on the spot. That was it. They hired as many fighters as they could find and the Holy Nation's forces were weakened. Fravatar left with his recruited men to meet with Rook outside of Blister Hill. That night, everyone arrived outside of the Holy Nation's capital. Everything that Rook's done has been leading up to this moment. Now was the time that they would fight the Holy Lord Phoenix and bring the Holy Nation to the ground. Would they be able to succeed in their attack, or would the Holy Lord Phoenix be able to stop Rook and his army? Men, it's all come down to this. We're here tonight to make history and change the world. We're going to take out the Holy Lord Phoenix and bring down the Holy Nation. They're weakened and distracted by the Shek army who are fighting at their gates as we speak. Even so, Blister Hill is still packed with Holy Nation soldiers and hitting them head on would surely lead to our defeat. We're not here to fight every last soldier to the death. No, our goal is to sever the Holy Nation's head and as a result, they will crumble. I'll lead a strike force and sneak through the North Gate while the guards are distracted by the Shek army. 
I've been to Blister Hill before and I know where the Holy Lord Phoenix resides. We'll ambush him in his own quarters where they'll least suspect it. Again, our objective is the Phoenix. If we take him, we leave. If things go south, Fravatar will lead the charge and the rest of you will join me. We cannot fail. If we do, all is lost. If we succeed, we'll do what damage we can and get out of there with the Phoenix. Does everyone understand? <laughs> I don't know what you just said, Agnew, but I definitely agree with you. It's time for us to go. I hope luck's on our side tonight. We'll need it. After his speech, Rook immediately turned to Mac and handed him his falling son and told him to hold on to it for him. Mac was confused and asked what he was doing. Rook simply assured him that he'd be fine without his trusty weapon. With what he planned to do, he wouldn't need it. It was time to go. The men moved swiftly around the perimeter of Blister Hill using the darkness to hide from any Holy Nation guards. The Shek army was locked in combat at the back entrance which caused a perfect distraction for Rook to sneak through undetected. The rest of the men remained hidden outside while Rook dodged past any patrolling guards inside the wall. He managed to sneak in just fine. His small group of mercenaries were sneaking in too but they were lagging behind. Rook surveyed the throne room and found the phoenix. To his surprise, he and all of his men were laying in bed, sleeping while the rest of his forces were outside dying to protect him. Rook scoffed in disgust. The phoenix was being careless and his guard was down. This was Rook's chance to put an end to him. He snuck up to the bed beside the phoenix. One of his guards got up and walked right past Rook. He froze as the soldier yawned and was so groggy from his sleep that he continued on his way without even realizing he was there. Rook inspected the phoenix's gear and held his breath as he removed his weapon as quietly as he could and disarmed him. Next, he unstrapped his chestplate as he slept soundly. Rook caught it as it slipped off him and placed it in his bag. The mighty Holy Lord Phoenix wouldn't be much of a threat without a weapon or armor. Next, Rook tried to take out as many men as he could silently. The first paladin was knocked out cold and as his body collapsed to the floor, the men noticed him and sprung into action. Rook threw the paladin's weapon on the ground and raised his guard. The Holy Lord Phoenix screamed and charged at Rook, not even realizing his weapon and armor were missing. It was too late though. He already engaged with Rook and it only took three blows with his katana and the phoenix collapsed. This was almost too perfect, Rook thought to himself as he scooped up the phoenix's limp body. Of course, at this point, every soldier in the throne room was closing in on them. Rook and the mercenaries were locked fiercely in combat, doing what they could to stand their ground. Sounds of clashing steel filled the hall as the men locked blades. As soon as they heard the commotion, the rest of Rook's men charged through the gate, past the soldiers outside, and into the throne room. It was complete chaos. The paladins were caught off guard and it showed while they fought Rook's army. They were sloppy. Blister Hill was a disaster. Their men were focused on the Shek's forces fighting at the gates and weren't expecting an attack from within. There was mass confusion as the Seven and their mercenaries were cleaning up the Phoenix's personal guard. Rook's men were focused. In one fell swoop, the Phoenix was taken out, which was the best case scenario, and now they were able to inflict a massive blow to a large portion of their forces while they were there. They stuck together and fought in front of the empty throne, which was fitting due to their current circumstances. Rook and the others danced back and forth with the paladins who challenged them. Their time dedicated to training paid off as they were able to stand their ground. Having mercenaries there to buffer their force certainly helped too. Rook remained vigilant while he held onto the phoenix. He had to be careful not to lose him amidst the fighting. He somehow managed to get through all this combat while taking minimal damage, so he wasn't concerned at the moment. At this point, most of the paladins inside the throne room were taken out and a few others standing were getting overwhelmed. As the others fell, Rook's men converged on the last man standing who held his ground firmly, even while being completely surrounded. He was the protector of the flame, a very strong fighter, but he failed at his duties. You could see the panic in his eyes as he frantically tried to fend off Rook's men and rescue the phoenix, but there wasn't anything he could do now. Their guard was down and Rook capitalized on it. The protector of the flame couldn't save the phoenix now. He was, however, too strong for them to take out. The sun continued to rise and more Holy Nation men were alert and storming into the throne room. At this point, the seven were heavily wounded and they knew they overstayed their visit. Rook called out for the retreat and the men withdrew from the throne room. As Rook was leaving past the gate with the phoenix, he felt a jolt of pain in his leg as a harpoon bolt struck him. It wasn't enough to incapacitate him or cause him to drop his hostage, but he couldn't move quickly now either. As they rounded the corner of the wall outside of the mounted turret's views, they turned to fight off the paladins that were trying to stop them from escaping. Their enemies fell, but they realized that not everyone made it out safely. They quickly turned and ran back into Blister Hill. Rockus ran over and scooped up Mac while the rest of the seven fought at the gate causing a distraction until they could all escape together. They made enough of a clearing by the gate and the men took this opportunity to escape together. Ravatar was the last one out and he was taking a beating until they got back outside and around the corner where they were in the clear. They were so close to escaping but another group of paladins chased after the men. 
Rook fled while the rest of the seven held the line, making sure he'd be able to successfully escape with the Phoenix. The other seven were wounded and tired. Mac and Wansnot were both unconscious, but this didn't stop them. This was the final stretch of their surprise attack. They couldn't fail now. As more reinforcements from Blister Hill arrived, they knew it was time to retreat. Rook got enough distance between Blister Hill and himself with the Phoenix. The rest of the men finally caught up with Rook who was safely hidden away from the chaos. There were still a few paladins that chased them this far. The seven used what strength that they had left to surround the paladins. Rook gave them credit. They were persistent, but it wasn't enough for the men to bring the seven down. They teamed up and overwhelmed the paladins. They could see the defeat in the eyes of the last man standing. He was overwhelmed and collapsed like the others. It was done. They did it. They captured the Holy Lord Phoenix. But there was no time to waste. They immediately tended to their wounds and took one last moment to bask in their victory. Blister Hill was still being attacked by the Shek and any remaining mercenaries that didn't escape, but their part to play here was finished. They lift Blister Hill towards the hub. Rook was thankful that all seven of them were able to make it out in one piece. He also knew that they wouldn't have been able to escape successfully if it weren't for their hired mercenaries. Their sacrifice wouldn't be in vain. As they were traveling south, they ran through a Shek patrol fighting off a group of Kral's Chosen. They saw Rook passing with his men in the Phoenix and a handful of them broke off and chased after them. The Seven heard them berate Rook, calling him a flat skin and a coward. They continued moving until one of them called out Rook, challenging him to prove his worth. Rook ordered the men to stop. Most days he would ignore such a petty challenge, but not today. He told the men to stand their ground. Rook turned and charged into a group of Kral's Chosen. He blocked their first attack and swung the Metu Grade Cross in a wide arc that severely wounded all four of the Shek. While they were recovering from the first blow, Rook continued to press hard on them. He could see the regret in their faces as the second fighter dropped. One of them landed a blow on Rook while his back was turned and he quickly retaliated. He got hit one last time before dropping the last of the Kral's Chosen. He took them on with one hand while carrying the Phoenix and they were only able to land two hits on him. Maybe they'll think twice before challenging him again, he thought to himself. Rook grouped back up and ordered the men to continue moving. They made it back to the hub in no time and passed through the gate into the city. They were out of Holy Nation territory now. Their mission was a great success and now the men could rest and recover. Rook turned to them and told them to focus on healing their wounds and then return home. He was going to deal with the Phoenix and meet them back at New Raleigh. He bid them farewell and began traveling towards Admag, the capital of the Shek. They were a critical ally in this war and Rook's men wouldn't have been able to do it without their help. It only seemed right that he would deliver the Phoenix to them and let the Shek decide his fate. He arrived that night. He was stopped at the front gate. The guards were in awe of Rook's hostage. He was told to meet with the Stone Golem in their headquarters. The way they spoke to him completely changed. There was a new level of respect in their voices. Rook thanked them and walked into the city. He felt a sense of accomplishment that he'd never felt before, but he was also very tired. It would all be over soon now, he thought to himself. As he walked into the headquarters, someone told Rook to come over and speak with him. His name was Bayan, and he looked over Rook's captive in disbelief. Rook explained that this accomplishment could have been done without their aid and he handed the phoenix over to him. Bayan tossed the phoenix into the cage and he thanked Rook. He told him to speak with Asada about this and the Shek officially became allies with Rook. Holy Lord Phoenix just sat in his cell, silently, while glaring at Rook. Rook just smiled and walked away. He'd deal with him later. He found Asada at the other side of the building and spoke with her. She repeated Bayan's words of gratitude and thanks. She granted him the title of the Battleborn and all the Shek cheered for their victory. Rook smiled. He was still in a state of disbelief himself. And while this was a massive blow to the Holy Nation and the battle at Blister Hill was won, the war wasn't over yet. Asada was so shocked by having the Phoenix captive, she felt faint and had to lay down for a moment. When she got back up, she presented her daughter to Rook, Sato. She asked that he would take her in and train her as his own soldier. Rook graciously accepted her offer and Sato approached Rook. Her weapon was a poorly crafted plank. For now, Rook gave her the Phoenix's Mato Grade Cross to equip. Rook welcomed her to the team and told her that they had to return to New Raleigh where the rest of the men were waiting. They arrived and for now, Seto was asked to stay and help defend New Raleigh. As for the Seven, they recruited Yellow Horse to join the fight and Rook explained that even though the Holy Nation's strongest fortification had been destroyed, they still had other strongholds that they needed to liberate. They left the gates of New Raleigh again, prepared to finish what they started and clean up the remains of the Holy Nation, starting with Rebirth. Now that the Phoenix was taken out, Blister Hill would fall and they could focus on the destruction of what remained of the Holy Nation until they had nothing left standing. With Yellow Horse as part of their group, they were no longer the Seven. They were now referring to themselves as the Liberators, with the goal of freeing those who have been oppressed by the Holy Nation. They arrived outside of Rebirth in no time, and they stopped to take a moment and scout the area. 
To Rook's surprise, the gate wasn't guarded by Holy Nation men, but the floatsome ninjas. Word travels fast and they must have heard about the Phoenix falling and they attacked while they were at their weakest. Rook had the men wait while he approached Rebirth to see what happened for himself. He stopped at the gate and the men let him through. Rook ran over the bridge and took in the view. It was so long ago when Rook last stepped foot in Rebirth and at the time, it was full of slaves in despair. Now it was in ruins and no Holy Nation man could be found. The slaves were offered freedom or they could join the floatsome ninjas. Rook was glad to see Rebirth in ruins and he didn't even have to help. When he returned to the others, he was given bad news. Mac got word that their home was being invaded by a Shek challenge. The large group of Kral's Chosen demanded that Rook face them or they would lay waste to their home. The Liberators immediately left and returned back to New Raleigh. When they arrived, Rook saw the large Shek force that was waiting for him. Angry by their threat to his people, Rook charged headfirst into their group and initiated the fighting. He danced around them, dealing massive damage with every swing and doing his best to block their attacks. Some of the Sheks split off to the rest of the Liberators who engaged with them after Rook began fighting. They greatly outnumbered the Liberators, but Rook's men greatly outmatched the Shek fighters. Rook had the attention of a large group while the rest of the men teamed up and cleaned up the others. The Krall's Chosen were being massacred. Rook's men didn't let up. There was blood and corpses all over their town, but they didn't stop until every last one of them were taken out. Even the others were eager to help defend New Raleigh. They didn't have the training and skills as the Liberators, but they did their best to take out any stragglers. They worked together and slowly beat down two of the Shek enemies themselves. It wasn't much, but they wanted to do their part and help however they could. Shortly after the fighting began, they were wiped out and the few Shek that survived fled New Raleigh while Rook's men were barely hurt. They rested up that evening and the Liberators left for their next target, Narco's Trap. The only major fortifications that remained were Narco's Trap, Okran's Shield, and Okran's Fist. If they were to destroy those final strongholds, the Holy Nation would be no more. Later that day, they arrived outside of Narco's Trap. It looked like they were still holed up here and their defenses were solid. They moved close to a large boulder that would provide them enough cover while they devised a plan of attack. Well, that was until another pesky crawl's chosen charged in on the men and attacked them. And these Shek fanatics were being a pain in the butt. It was brought down immediately, but it caused enough of a ruckus to draw the attention of the Holy Nation men on them. They alerted the guards and two paladins pursued them. This also drew in the rest of the Kral's Chosen patrol that joined in on the fighting. It was an all-out brawl at this point, more Holy Nation soldiers were charging in to catch the Liberators off guard. Rook's men were too strong though. They were able to take on the Shek patrol and the Holy Nation soldiers at the same time, even while they sent more reinforcements. They finished the fighting outside of Narco's trap, and Rook knew that they had to take out the mounted harpoon turrets as quickly as possible if they were to take out the stronghold. Rook was caught outside of the wall by a few men and he got disoriented. He regained his bearings as Wands not charged past him, straight towards the mounted soldiers. Rook followed after him and they focused on the men mounting the turrets while the rest of the Liberators poured in to help. The fighting converged on the wall where the Holy Nation desperately tried to hold their position with the turrets while the Liberators fought to take them out. The Paladins couldn't hold against their attack though. As they were cleaning up the men, Mac made his way towards one of the turrets to use against them. The last paladin fell on the wall and Rook ordered the men to spread out and search the buildings. Mac would stand guard with the turret while they cleared up whatever was left here. There was just one soldier inside one of the barracks. He charged at Rook and they locked blades. Unfortunately for him, the rest of the Liberators showed up and swarmed him. Not that Rook necessarily needed the help. They heard Mac fire a harpoon shot outside and immediately rushed to his aid. Before they got back to him, a soldier knocked him unconscious. More wounded men were returning to defend their base. There were simply no match for the Liberators though, and after some time, all but one man was killed off. They chased him down and he dropped like a fly. Rain began pouring over them, cooling the men off from the battle they just won. They looked over Narco's trap and found it to be completely rid of any Holy Nation presence. One down, two more to go. They immediately moved towards their next target, Okran's shield. They traveled through the mountainous terrain, and as they got close, they realized this fortress was already overthrown by the Shek army as well. Many of the structures were in shambles, but there were still some buildings that were being used by the Shek. Rook led the men into a nearby barracks where they could rest from the fighting at Narco's trap. With Okran's shield already being liberated from the hands of the enemy, the final target would be Okran's fist. This was the last remaining stronghold that the Holy Nation held, and Rook was about to send his men there and finally defeat the Holy Nation in its entirety once and for all. The men slowly approached Okran's fist from the hills above, and they saw that it was already in ruins. Something didn't seem right though. They didn't see floatsome ninjas or Shek guards occupying it. Instead, they had a cruel realization that everyone was taking advantage of the fall of the Holy Nation, including the cannibals. The Holy Nation must have helped keep them at bay, but now they were flowing out of the cannibal plains into the mainland. Rook knew they had to stop this. 
He led the charge into the ruins of Okran's Fist and attacked a large group of cannibals that surrounded him. There were so many of them that Rook had trouble blocking all of their attacks. It didn't matter though, they were weak and he shrugged off the hits that landed on him. Every swing of his falling sun took down two or more of them at a time. Once he broke free from their swarm, he really started laying into them. The rest of the Liberators were trying to come help Rook, but they were caught fighting off more cannibals outside of the fallen city's gates. Rook kept his cool though and was quickly mowing through the unarmored men like butter. The rest of the men eventually cleared the threat outside of the gate and came in to help Rook. They couldn't withstand the might of Rook's men and their armor was too powerful to really hurt them either. The only strength the cannibals had was their vast number of men being able to swarm their victims. Unfortunately for them, they weren't able to swarm Rook's men. After the main group of the enemy was killed off, Rook ordered them to find any remaining cannibals and clean them up. There were still lots of men left, but they were dropping like flies all around the Liberators. It was a massacre. Rook was amazed that they were able to take over Okran's fist to begin with, but he knew the Holy Nation was so weakened at this point that they couldn't even defend themselves from the cannibals. After they cleared the cannibal threat around them, Rook realized that the last Holy Nation fortress was destroyed. This meant that the Holy Nation fell. They were no more. But there wasn't any time to celebrate. A new threat was in front of them and they had to stop it before it was too big of a problem. Rook was going to take the men to the cannibal plains and kill off any threat to the newly freed land. They set their way towards a marked cannibal village first. Rook was familiar with this land and he scouted ahead of the other men. He could hold his own at this point and wasn't worried to be left alone in the cannibal plains. He ran as fast as he could and he made it to the first village in no time. As he got closer, he realized that there were no cannibals in sight. There were lots of wounded men trapped in cages though, waiting to be served as dinner. Rook used this opportunity to free anyone that was still alive and able to escape on their own. It took some time, but once he freed as many men as he could, he saw his first cannibal patrol wandering near the village. In fact, a second group was there too. Rook thought he would brush up on his assassination skills and snuck behind the first patrol. It was knocking them out left and right and they had no idea. It was almost too easy. In fact, Rook grew tired of taking them down one by one like that and finally stood up and drew his sword. The remainder of the group that wasn't already taken down turned and closed in on Rook. He flew into his first victim and he dropped as the mighty falling sun landed on him. Rook quickly moved to the others and they collapsed to the ground when his falling sun crushed them. After spending so much time fighting Holy Nation paladins, it almost didn't seem fair to go against the primitive cannibals. He was finishing off the first group when the second patrol spotted Rook and attacked him too. They were scrawny, tiny little things that were more of a nuisance than a threat to Rook, but he had to make sure he didn't get careless and let his guard down. As he fought, he reflected on the past few days. Once they fought back the cannibal threat from spreading outside of their planes, his mission he set out to accomplish so long ago would finally be realized. A part of him felt very satisfied that the evil phoenix and his holy nation were destroyed and he had a major part to play in this destruction, but at the same time, he felt sad. There were things that Rook did that he wasn't proud of. He killed countless enemies, even murdering some. He peddled massive supplies of drugs into neighboring cities to fund his cause, and most of the mercenaries that joined the Seven to capture the Phoenix never returned. He kept telling himself that he did all this for the greater good, but now there's a threat of a cannibal outbreak into their land. He snapped back into the moment and realized that they wouldn't let the cannibals spread beyond their homelands. He would make sure of it. But Rook knew that he got his hands dirty and he had to do it in order to take out a force as powerful as the Holy Nation. For now, he focused on finishing this one last mission and then he could return home with the others and help keep the peace in the land and make up for what he's done in the past. It wouldn't be in vain. More cannibal patrols found Rook and charged at him. He fought them with ease until his backup finally arrived. With the others at his side, things would be even easier. They helped clean up the few remaining cannibals, but they were mostly just met with Rook and a bloody pile of corpses at his feet. The last cannibal fell and before they had a moment to breathe, a shrieking bandit approached Rockius and started to… well, he started screeching at him. Rockius wasn't really sure how to respond, so he just screeched back. He seemed to be offended by this and the group of bandits attacked the men even though they stood no chance against them. The liberators didn't want to fight them but they wouldn't let up so they continued to defend themselves. What remained after the fighting was a bloodied mess of cannibals and bandits. As rain began falling on them again, Rook couldn't help but to remember when an amazing warrior by the name of Jinsei saved him while killing off handfuls of cannibals, which ultimately led to Rook being able to capture the cannibal Grand Wizard, claim a huge bounty from the Holy Nation, and learn about Hot Dog's fate. That's what initially planted the seed of hate against the Holy Nation. It wasn't until they attacked him because of his rescued slave Tao that things became violent with them though. In a funny way, if it wasn't for that fateful night at the cannibal capital so long ago, and if Jin Se hadn't have been there, the war against the Holy Nation might not have ever happened. Rook came back into the moment with his men. He had to stop reminiscing and lead the Liberators. And speaking of the cannibal capital, that was their next target. 
Rook told them to get there as quickly as they could, but he was going to scout ahead. He arrived in no time and found another group of cannibals. He didn't want to waste any time and charged in at them. These guys were a little more competent than the patrols he was fighting earlier. He had to keep his guard up until the others arrived. Of course, right then, Rook turned and he saw the rest of his men running into the fight. Together, they mowed through the cannibals like they were nothing. Rook saw another prisoner tied to a pole. He went to free him and realized that the threat of the cannibals was stopped, at least for now. He would have to speak with the floatsome ninjas about doing a better job with securing the borders moving forward. He told the men that it was finished. They were going to finally return home. It was a quiet, somber journey back to New Raleigh. When they got back home, Rook told the others to prepare one of their buildings for a gathering. They would celebrate their victory together that evening. But first, Rook had one last thing he wanted to do before he could consider his work finished and he would return to New Raleigh once his task was completed. He immediately left towards Admag. Rook wanted to personally deliver a message to the Holy Lord Phoenix himself. As he traveled there, he thought of his best friend that he lost so long ago and what things might have been like if the Holy Nation didn't take his life before he arrived at the hub. It didn't matter though, they did take his life and the Holy Nation paid for what they've done. It wasn't just about vengeance though, it never was. It was about justice, and the death of Hot Dog only helped Rook to see them for what they truly were, hateful tyrants that used their fanatic religion and power as a basis to oppress the weak. It was a long and tiring journey, but with the help of the Shek and the Floatsome Ninjas, the Holy Nation was no more. Holy Lord Phoenix lost. You? Have you come here to mock me, Dark One? You think these monsters can keep me in this cage? My men will come and get me. Okran will smite you. Shut up. Nobody's coming to rescue you. You know, I never thought I'd find us in this situation, talking one-on-one -on -one like this. I came here because I wanted to be the one to tell you. I wanted to see the look on your face when you found out that the Holy Nation's gone. Every single one of your fortresses have fallen. Any paladin left in the aftermath of what we've done will either turn away from you or be hunted down like dogs. Everything that you've built has been eradicated. A lot of people wanted me to put you in a peeler and let you suffer, but that wouldn't do enough justice, would it? Instead, I decided to hand you over to the people that you hate where you'll live out the rest of your miserable life rotting in the cells surrounded by your enemy. The Holy Nation's finished, Lord Phoenix. Your legacy is over. How dare you, you monster! Don't walk away from me! You think they can keep me locked up in here? Oakland will free me and I'll deliver his wrath to you! Do you hear me, Dark One? Mark my words! This isn't over! Rook thought he would feel satisfied delivering this final blow, but all he felt in the moment was pity. But that feeling slowly lifted as he walked away back towards his home at New Raleigh. After all, this was the beginning of a new world that he helped pave the way for. One where they would fight with their newly founded allies for justice and protection for all. While he took his time walking home, Rook thought about his journey that led him to this point. Did he do the right thing? The Holy Nation was cruel and abused their power. They were oppressive and needed to be stopped. But at what cost? Rook dirtied his hands and the hands of his men in the promise of creating a better world by bringing the Holy Nation down. Countless men, both innocent and guilty, died by Rook's falling son. A long time ago, he told Hot Dog that he wanted to make a name for himself and make a difference in this world. He continued walking as he wrestled with his thoughts until he realized that he would continue growing New Raleigh and offer food and refuge to anyone who sought it. Rook was going to lead them to help protect the weak and try his best to make the world a better place. But first things first, they were going to feast that night and celebrate their victory together and hope for better days to come. This concludes the story of how Rook started with nothing and with the help from his newfounded friends and a lot of luck, he rose to power and brought down the Holy Lord Phoenix and the Holy Nation. Guys, I hope you enjoyed this series as much as I enjoyed sharing it with you. It was a long journey, but it sure was fun too, wasn't it? If you liked this series, please consider subscribing to the channel because I'll continue doing narrative videos and series like this in the future. Ah, there he is! Cheers, Rock! <laughs> thank you. Thank you, everyone. I just wanted to spend this night celebrating our victory together. We've all earned a night off. Rook, I just wanted to thank you for taking us all in. I think I speak for everyone here when I say that you've made this world a better place. And I, for one, am damn proud to have fought with you during all this. What do you plan on doing now, Rook? The Holy Nation was a scourge to many. Now that they're gone, we can live more peacefully. It's finally over. 
They weren't just a scourge, they were a symptom. A symptom? What do you mean? The Holy Nation, they were merely a symptom of a much bigger problem. You know, I was thinking a lot about this on my way back here. Where do you think they got most of their slaves? How do you think my best friend became a slave? They didn't capture them, they bought them from the slavers in the East. The Holy Nation oppressed people in this region, I know this, but slavery is still running rampant in the United Cities. I told my best friend once that I wanted to make this world a better place, and I still intend on doing that. But the Holy Nation was merely just a symptom of that problem. The Bugmaster's still out there, amassing an army of skin spiders and planning to eventually march them across the entire continent to the Mad Cat Lawn. Out in the east, Reavers are still murdering and pillaging anything in their path. The Skin Bandits are capturing and torturing any humans they can get their hands on. And most importantly, the mighty Emperor Tengu and all the United Cities are still flourishing from their slave trade while the nobles abuse their systems and get away with anything they want. I now know that as long as the United Cities stand, I cannot put my sword down. <sighs> what I'm trying to say is, it isn't over, Tal. This is just the beginning. 